Hello and good morning. Uh, delighted to welcome you all uh, to the April 9th Urban Planning Committee meeting. It's great to see our chambers full and appreciate everyone coming out today. I wanted to start by taking a moment to acknowledge the lands on which we gather. This is Treaty 6 territory. From time immemorial, diverse Indigenous nations have stewarded these lands, including the Nehiwak, Nehe Winiwak, Nakota Iska, Dene Salina, and Nititsapi. Many more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples have gathered, traded, and celebrated on this land for generations. This place also forms part of the Métis homeland and it was in, within Métis Nation of Alberta. The signing of Treaty No. 6 in 1886-87 created a foundation of good relations, welcoming peoples to this area from around the world. Today, Edmonton carries on this tradition of welcoming peoples from many nations as we continue to live into the intent and spirit of treaty. I'll start with a roll call of my committee colleagues, Councillor Tang. Good morning. Mayor Sohi. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. And Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. We're also joined in chambers uh, by Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Good morning. And online, we have Councillor Knack. Good morning. Um, Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning, and that's everyone. Uh, Councillor Tang, would you move the adoption of the agenda, please? Sure, I move that um, the April 9, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. Uh, replacement attachment 6.2, bus network service plan update uh, attachment 3. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Councillor Tang, would you move the approval of the minutes? Yeah, uh, I'll move uh, approving of the minutes from March 19th, Urban Planning Committee meeting. Thank you. Any errors or omissions? Not seeing any, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. I'm not aware of any protocol items. So we'll move then into selecting items for debate. If my colleagues would like to sign in. Thank you. Mayor Slogan? Uh, 7.4, we have speakers. Yep, that's for me. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I would like to select uh, 6.2, 6, or 6.3, and 7.1. Sorry, and also a 7.2. Yeah. I was going to get that, so that <laughs> works out very well. Yeah. Great. So I have that we've selected 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 7.1, 72, and 7.4. For the last call. Excellent. So we'll now vote on the reports not selected for debate. Councillor Tang, would you like to move that? Sure. So moved. Thank you. 7.3 and 7.5. Thank you. Uh, please vote. We're just missing one vote. Councillor Rutherford, did it come up for you? It did not. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you. Go to request to speak. Yeah, uh, I'd like to move that Urban Planning Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate for 7.4 Bylaw 20765 Omnibus Amendment to Business License Bylaw 20002 Amendment Number 3. Uh, John McDougall, Edmonton Police Commission, uh, Matt Barker, uh, sorry, remote, Matt Barker, Police Commission, answer questions only, remote, Kevin Burge, um, Edmonton Police Service in person, uh, Brent, 
Dowsett, uh, Edmonton Pol Police Service, in person. Kelly Morgan, uh, Edmonton Police Service, answer questions only, in person. Sandy Pond, Chinatown Transformation Collaborative Society, Chinatown Safety Council. Questions only, uh, in person. Christy Morin, Ars on the Ave, Edmonton Society, in person. Eric Estrada, at Alberta Ave Business Association, BIA, in person. Nunu Desane, to answer questions only, in person. Randy Shuttleworth, Queen Mary Park Community League, in person. Alan Bolstadt, Alberta Ave Community League, in person. Christy Kasur, Transitional Council for the College of Massage Therapists of Alberta, in person. Brian LaFleche, Gordon Russell's Crystal Kids Youth Center, in person. Thank you. Please vote to hear from these speakers. <laughs> We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Count, Councillor Wright, I believe you're unmuted at the moment. It, there we go, thank you. And that's carried, excellent. Um, we don't have any new requests for time specific on the ed agenda, but just recognizing we have a number of guests with us this morning. We are gonna be uh, discussing our first item, item 6.1, which is the exhibition lands planning framework and outdoor festival space. And then your item will be next on the agenda. So we will get to you as second order of business. Uh, but for now, uh, not seeing any other requests for time specific, we will go to our first item, item 6.1, if administration would like to come down. Administration and our delegation, thank you. Did you have a presentation for we us? We do, yes, thank you. Please go ahead, thank you. Okay. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and members of Executive Committee. My name is Bartos Chiraki, I'm the branch manager of the real estate team. Today I'm joined by Levy Grewal, our project lead for the exhibition lands, uh, Edmonton Exhibition Lands Development, as well as Nicole, Nicole Poirier from Civic Events and Festivals, and we're also joined today by our, our Lindo Gomes from Explore Edmonton. We are here to respond to the following motion that was passed at the November budget meeting, which was asking that administration provide a report to committee outlining the following. Compatibility of the exhibition lands planning framework with the ongoing operational needs of the Expo Center and consideration of ongoing need for an outdoor festival space to accommodate K-Days and other festivals. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As a quick background, the redevelopment of the exhibition lands is guided by both the exhibition lands planning framework and impl implementation strategy documents, which began the process of public and stakeholder engagement centered around the redevelopment of the neighborhood in late 2017 and were approved by council and committee in spring of 2021. These guiding documents set the roadmap for how exhibition lands will be redeveloped, as well as the guiding principles and vision for the future of the neighborhood. The plan aims to align with the city with the city plan, focusing on key pillars of energy transition, sustainable development, and diversity in housing options, while celebrating the history of the site as a cultural and celebratory meeting place for Edmontonians for over a century. Next slide, please. The redevelopment strategy for the exhibition lands takes a deliberate and phased approach, uh, ensuring that neighborhood infrastructure and site preparation are completed at a market-driven pace to meet the needs of our private industry development partners. The first 20 acres of developable land were approved for sale by executive committee uh, in January of this year with the expectation that the purchaser will be, will be able to begin on-site construction in the spring of 2025 following the city's neighborhood level upgrades later this year. Administration's prefer, preferred path of, phased, of phasing extends east from phase one along Borden Park Road and continuing with ground-oriented residential development in the central portions of the site, while also extending Borden Park north along the, central, the current central parking lot area. While construction and development continues south of the Expo Center, the council approved demolition of the Coliseum north of 118th Avenue is expected to begin next year with the abatement of the building, followed by the physical demolition expected in 2026. Once demolished, the Coliseum lands are not expected to be redeveloped into a mixed-use transit village for roughly a decade. Next slide, please. 
the relocation and reallocation of buildings and spaces currently being used by Explore Edmonton in the phase one development lands, which are highlighted in red in the presentation, is a priority for 2024. These areas and structures include a 20,000 square foot storage facility, maintenance shop, lay down area, and urban farm. Administration has been actively making plans for the relocation of the urban farm uh, with discussions happening more recently with uh, Explore Edmonton on that front. Ongoing discussions are continuing between administration and Explore to both understand the operational impacts and to advance a plan to relocate and reallocate the current storage and lay down areas. Following these phase one operational adjustments, the phase two development in the Borden Park expansion, which is highlighted in green, presents significant challenges to explore Edmonton and the city in hosting K-Days and other outdoor festivals, uh, outdoor events and festivals uh, due to the loss of lands currently programmed for such events. The current demolition schedule for the Coliseum provides an opportunity for the Coliseum lands, uh, land site to act as an interim outdoor event and storage location while redevelopment continues south of Expo Center. With the lands north of 118 not expected for redevelopment for a decade or more, Explore Edmonton and the city have the ability to use the Coliseum site and parking lots for outdoor programming at the exhibition lands for an extended period. The size, location, and current zoning of the Coliseum lands are favorable to hosting K-Days or other similar outdoor festivals with no amendments required to the planning framework. Next slide, please. Administration will coordinate and advance an analysis to determine Explore's future land needs and impacts to operations of the Expo Center based on current and forecasted operations. Clarity on Explore's long-term mandate would benefit this analysis so that, lands, uh, so that land needs can be appropriately determined. Administration plans to create a scope of work and to fund the land needs assessment through existing funding, which will lead to a determination of what changes may or may not be required to the planning framework and the associated impacts to the land development projects uh, pro forma. Additionally, a further review of site preparation costs post Coliseum de demolition, such as backfilling, grading, drainage, and utility co connections will need to be completed. All of this assessment and study work uh, will be led by administration with the necessary input and involvement from Explore Edmonton. By providing access to this additional land north of 118th Avenue, there is an opportunity to regularly review the frequency of use and economic benefits that are created through ongoing festival planning, which can then lead to a, a longer term decision on how those lands could be redeveloped in the future. Next slide. We're happy to take any questions that uh, the committee may have. Thank you very much. Um, we do have members of Explore Edmonton on the delegation. Did you have any comments prepared? No? Okay, but you're here for questions. Wonderful. Uh, I'll go then to Councillor Kermel. I thought Mayor Sohi exempted this. No? Okay. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, uh, that quick overview and presentation. And uh, maybe I'll direct some questions to Mr. Gomes. I've, I've got a number. Um, so I guess first of all, uh, it's my general understanding that uh, the master plan as it's crafted today does not, is not completely compatible with all of the operations uh, of the Expo Centre directly. We've heard some commentary about uh, K-Days and we'll, I'll circle back to that in a sec, but uh, is, that, is that fair to say? Is, uh, there's some overlap, some gaps, yeah? Yeah, as you've heard, I think the, the overall plan is in conflict with uh, the ongoing and future sustainable operations of the Expo Centre both as an event site and festival site. And is, I mean, just very briefly on how we got here, it is, it's my recollection that, uh, you know, the, this building was, was built and in the care of Northlands, and during the time that, the, that this framework was being constructed, Northlands was a, an independent entity separate from the city of Edmonton, and there may have been some communication gaps in terms of just what the operational needs were. Um, Northlands was going through its own, you know, final final, uh, I don't know, actions. It's, it's uh, death throes, perhaps, for to be less than complimentary about it. That is that a reasonable uh, characterization, do you think? Yeah, that's correct. So maybe we can dive into a little bit of, of um, just where some of those incompatibilities are. Uh, and I maybe let's start with uh, K-Days and festivals generally. Uh, now we've heard that there's a potential solution set there where uh, that activity can move over to the Coliseum site once the Coliseum is demolished. Is, 
you know, does Expo agree with that? I guess I'm presuming that there's been some conversation. Does, I'm sorry, does Explore agree with that? I think as an interim step, it's uh, a viable solution for us. I think uh, ultimately the plan itself um, still, at the end of the day, will be in conflict with uh, that future uh, support for festival and events. But in the interim, that, uh, that solution would be viable. So where would where would, is the conflict now, you know, specifically on the K days and the festival stuff, and and what conflict remains should this become the uh, at least the moderate term solution? I think the overall space requirements of uh, major events like K days, Heritage Days, as you know, was also recently uh, held or hosted at the Expo Center uh, and on the festival site. Um, other events support space for logistics, uh, lay down yards, storage spaces, all of those elements uh, currently would need to be factored into future planning. So is the, is the, what's being considered today, is that adequate for the actual event space? Maybe not necessarily for the support space or the load in or the load out, but, but the actual event space, is, is, do, you, do you think there'll be enough space on that site for, to um, host festivals and, and create the needs or is it, st is it too small? It may still be challenging from an ancillary perspective, so support space for logistics, uh, storage, uh, support, parking, um, those elements would still be uh, challenging in the long term. So maybe let's talk a little bit about the storage space. Right now, uh, a lot of the material um, uh, displays, stands, signage, uh, other things like that, that stuff is all contained in a building and in a lot that is one of the parcels that has been sold for development. Yes, that's uh, correct. Correct. And so uh, um, all that has to be located. There's a need for a cold storage building somewhere else, whether that's you know on the current Coliseum site or somewhere in and around Expo. Has a, has a location been determined for where that building might be, that new building? We've been discussing options with administration. There are some potential sites that we've uh, discussed that uh, could be viable just directly south of the Expo Center. And has there been a conversation around budget? Like who would be responsible for costs and those things? I, you know, in the, in the before time, Northlands would have taken on all of that cost itself. The Northlands event, Northlands buildings, Northlands to solve, but Northlands no longer exists. So has there been a, a conversation around budget and dollars to make those changes? From a budget perspective, that would be a gap that we haven't addressed yet. Um, and not to be too provocative about it, but when Explore Edmonton has a budget concern, um, they come back to City Council to address those concerns. Fair? Yes. Typically. Uh, I'm going to stop here. I've got a few more questions, but I'll uh, listen to those of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmill. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you so much for joining us uh, and the presentation. So the cost of demolition is, is funded, right? But is the site preparation after the demolition to make it ready for festivals, is that part of the demolition cost as well, or is that extra? That would be something we would still have to review and factor in. So initially when the demolition costs were put together, I believe they were put in a way to bring the building down and kind of just level things off, but not necessarily bringing in other servicing that would be needed right away to support ongoing or interim festival uses. So we're, we're going to have to look into that and make sure okay. that we have a good sense of the, the full scope of that work. Okay, so they'll be after 2026 then, right? Because that's, that's, that's the demolition completion by 2026. That's right. And in the, in, sorry, yeah, in the interim, um, from the phasing of the actual development, we're, we're trying to make sure that we don't interject too much into the space that Explore Edmonton is currently using for different festivals. And so we're trying to phase on the outskirts and moving in uh, just to ensure that there's a little bit more latitude there while we're working towards this other interim option, which would be north of 118th Avenue. So does Exhibition Lands plan envision a permanent place for festivals? Other than the Expo Center, there w the planning framework doesn't identify okay. uh, an ongoing plan for outdoor festival space. There is, however, opportunities though within an expanded board and park. We've also had conversation yeah. with, with Explore about that. Um, should funding be approved? How can that be developed in a way where you can also encourage festivals within that area? Okay. But if well. K days continues, right? Reimagining is happening and all that, right? And But temporary, that can be accommodated in that uh, 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 the, 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 the uh, Coliseum, the building site, but long-term it cannot be. 
long term, there's a discussion to be had around K days and, and location as well. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, but temporarily, say with 10 years, that's what, that, that's what he said, that it would be, take about 10 years for that area to be developed? Yeah, generally speaking, by the time we would start moving ahead with development in that area, it would likely be in the later stages. And so, high level estimates at this time would be about 10 years that uh, could be made available, but potentially longer too, depending on how things are progressing and if uh, that space is being utilized for festivals in, in a way that's really activated the area and is uh, beneficial and supported by council as well. Okay. And the and the demolition is on schedule, right? There are no issues around, you're not flagging any early concerns or delays or anything? I have not had anything flagged my way, so as far as I'm aware, everything is still moving ahead. We're doing yeah. a lot of the preliminary work right now associated okay. with that. Well, that, that's good, because I, I think it uh, opens up opportunities for us to have conversation with the uh, with the provincial government because they are paying or they will pay for the demolition of uh, Calgary's arena, right? And, but they would not, they are not paying for the demolition of Edmonton's arena, old arena. So taxpayers are paying for it here, property tax owners. Uh, so I think that conversation, I think there's ability for us to have that conversation with the province on, uh, on equ equitable treatment for the for the city, so maybe that's a f side conversation that we would have to have as part of our intergovernmental conversations. Okay, on the, uh, uh, there's a broader question on uh, exhibition lands. Uh, you know, there has been quite a bit, um, and maybe let me ask it this way. You guys pay, pay close attention to Blatchford as well, right? What are the lessons to be learned uh, uh, from that? And how are we applying those lessons to exhibition lands? So I think one of the main ways we've been applying the lessons there is um, number one, how we're moving ahead with development. So unlike Blatchford, we, Blatchford is servicing down to the lot line to create individual parcels that are being sold. We're doing things a little bit differently where we're encouraging the, the sale of parcels at, a larger scale that then allow a developer to step in and do some of their own servicing work okay. and further subdivision based on the the market and what their needs would be. So we hope that that process is going to help to accelerate movement here and, and work better for industry. We've seen some, some success in terms of the initial offering, obviously, of the 20 acres. Um, mm -hmm. And we hope that, you know, we're, we're we're anticipating more information coming to the public in that sense around what that development will look like in the very okay. near future. Um, other lessons learned though. Well, I'll come back for sure. the second round on that, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Yeah. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you so much. A um, number of my questions have been answered. So I guess just from here, I understand that um, administration is doing the analysis around projected demand, uh, land needs assessment, programming, et cetera. So, uh, what can we expect in terms of next steps? So you're going to go away, do that analysis. Um, is that going to be coming back in front of council? What does that look like from here? It's a great, <coughs> great question. Uh, first and foremost, so foremost, it's around creating an appropriate scope of work with uh, Explore Edmonton at the table. So when we're determining exactly what we're going to be reviewing, we want to do so in a way that gets Explore's input into that. Uh, so that we can efficiently, from a cost perspective and from a timeline perspective, get an analysis back of what lands are actually uh, required based off of future programming needs, et cetera. Um, in terms of coming back to council, uh, being honest, had not thought about taking that next step to bring that back, but if that's something that council wishes or desires to see, uh, we can provide, uh, at the very least, a memo of the outcome of that. Okay, that's great. Um, that's something I'd be interested in, in seeing, whether that's a memo or a conversation around the council table. Um, would that also include, <clears throat> and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, just like financial implications for exhibition lands as a whole, if we are gonna be contemplating changes? That is the intent. And so if there is something major that was flagged, I think that's where we would more than likely bring something back up to council and just outline, here's here's what we've seen, here are the implications on all sides. Right. Uh, and then looking to uh, either make a recommendation at that stage or seek council's input so that we can make sure we're all aligned. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. I have a question about the Borden Park expansion. So when I, <laughs> 
when I envision a park expansion, I think about softscaping and, you know, green landscaping. Um, has contemplation been given to hardscaping that can support year-round activation as well as festival space? I'll start, but I may pass it to Levy. I think there, I know that there have been conversations around that, but Levy might have a more detailed update. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, what I can say is neither planning nor design budget has been approved um, for the Borden Park expansion at this time. So um, no, no definite plans on what the softscaping, hardscaping implications might look like or what that mix might look like. That being said, discussions have been had within the administration with uh, Explore at the Table as well um, to look at that potential expansion site in, uh, in an ability to program it in ways that such, such as you're suggesting, Councillor, with hardscaping, with some softscaping, uh, and where Explore might be able to play a role in how it operates as well um, more frequently. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, I recognize that we're not, we're not there yet, but happy to hear your thinking in those terms and that Explore is part of those conversations. Um, and yeah, just operational needs in terms of space, and maybe this is to, um, to, to Speaker Gomez, uh, in terms of hectares, like what, ha has that analysis been done or is that exactly what you are gonna be undertaking um, with city administration? I think at a high level, we've advanced some of that work and uh, certainly we can provide more detail as we work through with administration on the next steps um, and so that it's clear on what the needs are. And I think, you know, to be clear, we are very supportive of the exhibition lands redevelopment, I think is an exciting opportunity for the neighborhood. Um, and I think we're just looking for ways to ensure that both uh, um, both the, that project is advanced in a way that complements uh, and supports the Expo Center's future uh, sustainability as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I had questions around the demolition schedule, but sounds like that's on track, which is great. Uh, also, just and this was sort of answered, but the immediate storage needs around uh, the laydown area. Um, feeling confident that, that we've reached a good place, at least in the interim. I just need to make sure that's clear from both sides. <laughs> I, I can start there. I think the the main, main obstacle would be around um, like the funding associated with that, where that would come from. So we're continuing to have some conversations knowing full well that funding for this would be coming from city council, and or not city council, but from uh, the municipal end, uh, but we will continue to work through that and just try to find the most cost-effective way to re relocate and find a new storage facility that can still uh, support the operations and allow development to move ahead in a timely fashion. Great. Thank you so much. I'll uh, yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, I just had one quick question um, that I couldn't couldn't quite make out from the maps and information that we were provided. What's happening with the city's the the jockey dorms building? Councillor, are you referring to the one that's currently transitional housing? Mm -hmm. um, so I believe the lease on the transitional housing uh, at the jockey dorms expires uh, in October of 2025. Um, okay. Excuse me if I have that incorrect. Um, the plans for that uh, post lease expiration is um, similar to the fate of the um, barns that surrounded it, um, will ultimately be demolished and prepared for redevelopment. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I think one, one question I, okay. And so that is part of phase one, so we are looking at development in that area in the next five to 10 years, so it is quite imminent. Has there been, I know that there is um, an expectation in exhibition lands around achieving the 16% affordable housing. Is that a consideration in terms of providing replacement for that that facility in some form? Yeah, the, the one thing I was going to add is we're absolutely having conversations with our housing team around a transition plan associated mm -hmm. with that. Um, and then when, to your comment about the 16%, uh, that's top of mind for us. Uh, we've been working with housing to establish certain sites that could be developed. Uh, we've also received some additional land back from Edmonton Community Development Company, which we think that there may be an opportunity to uh, utilize those lands for affordable housing as well. Um, still early stages, so I'm, I'm saying that as just a little nugget, I guess, of information, but we were absolutely focused on that. Great. Great. Yeah, just pleased to hear it's on the radar and really appreciate that update. Thank you. I will go to Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. So uh, I've put a motion in the chat. I'll put that on the floor at this point. That's all right. 
please, please do so. Uh, so, uh, I will move that administration provide a report on all current and future Explore Edmonton needs as it relates to the exhibition land site and provide a clearer and more comprehensive engagement approach that accurately reflects their important standing as an essential stakeholder in the execution of the exhibition lands ARP and any future activity. Thank you. Would you like to take a few moments to introduce that? Well, I, so... I, I still have a number of questions that I want to ask. So, uh, you know, just very briefly introducing it, I, I sort of alluded to this earlier that uh, it's um, my view that I think is uh, shared fairly by a number of others that uh, there is a, a miss that uh, when the when these spaces and these buildings were in the care of Northlands that there was not fulsome communication about what the needs of that site are going forward. And uh, that there's, I think we need to consider I'm not moving this today, but I think we need to consider some uh, revisions to the ARP and some uh, revisions to what is planned in that space to fully accommodate the operations of the Expo Centre specifically uh, and think about a festival space perhaps on a more permanent basis. Um, so uh, that's where I'm at now. I'd like to see the work that would come from this motion first before moving any specific changes to the framework or to the ARP. Uh, but I think there's more work to do here to fully determine just all of the computing needs at that site or, or, or the computing uh, perspectives. Um, so can I move to questions now or? Yeah, absolutely. Just wanted to clarify. So this would be a report returning to committee? Uh, I would say uh, returning to committee. Uh, and I would like to think that fairly soon, sometime in the calendar year. Yeah. Do we have some advice from administration on a, on a due date? Uh, well, my one thought would be this could be the report where we come back with uh, an outcome of that land needs assessment as well. And so just thinking around timing, I, I don't know if we have a good sense of how long that may take, just in terms of getting all the necessary stakeholder input. Um, but if you're looking for maybe this year, then maybe by the tail end of the year. And, and, and if we can address it sooner and come back, we would take every step to do that. And if you need more time, then more time. So let's just... like. 2024 Q4. Q4 sounds yeah. great great thank yeah. you but yeah please please go to questions you've got five minutes great thank you so I you know I mean just perhaps building on Mayor Sohi's comments a little bit perhaps one of the lessons uh, that we can take on Blatchford and one that has been that I've been reminded of a few times is that uh, development takes a lot longer than we often think uh, it's my recollection that uh, um, that I've been told that we're 10 years into Blatchford and while I have concerns about the pace of development there, that, that uh, you know, the advice has been offered that the pace of development is not all that unusual. I guess we'll get to dive into that at the audit committee meeting next week. But uh, so I guess all of that to say is 10 years uh, at all realistic to think that anything's going to be contemplated north of 118th Avenue. I, I, I'm not sure if that's what I heard, but... I would suggest that it's very likely it'll be longer than 10 years for yeah. the and a development to advance as per the current planning framework. And so thereby that would make that space um, available as an interim festival use for potentially yeah. even longer. Uh, I hear you. I, I think that is something that we, we always try to strive to do things at, as quickly as we can, but r development absolutely does take long and there are different phases and timelines associated with that. And you wanna work with all the different partners that you've established at the beginning uh, to build those relationships, to grow upon those as you move through your phases too. Well, and I, and I, I, I believe that part of the, a bit of the overlay at Exhibition Lands is the idea that we're gonna have you know, some, uh, some transit-oriented development at theoretically two stations. But we have not seen a lot of absorption of transit-oriented development opportunities uh, elsewhere in the city, and specifically at Belvedere Station, which is just a mile up the road, up the railroad. So, you know, I, all of that to say, I don't know that we need to anticipate development imminently north of 118th Avenue. Fair, yeah. And I don't think the framework has any sort of a phasing, like a phasing sequence with dates or even not the framework but more so within the implementation plan there's a, a bit more a of bit a of phasing it. and then we've okay. uh, since worked through that as well um but to your comment yeah i think over time we would we'd be able to see where the market is at too so although in the past we've not seen certain tod areas actually move ahead 
depending on how growth continues within the city, you might see more of that. And so there might be a push in that direction, but it should be market driven as opposed to just trying to force that into specific areas would be my recommendation. But yeah, fair enough. Um, we anticipate all kinds of growth, lots of people coming to the city. So, um, but maybe then switching back to a bit of the compatibility, compatibility question then, uh, and back to operations at Expo, I, you know, I, I want to confirm that uh, we have currently a capital upgrade project in that building that's roughly a hundred million dollars. Uh, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we're going to have uh, you know a trade and exposition space with some banquet space in it that we've just invested a hundred million dollars in. That not too long ago we invested a hundred and fifty million two thousand and eight dollars in. So we need to make sure that building can operate. Um, you know, so part of that would be parking, Mr. Gomes? Yes, that just basically to support all the activities that happen around that venue. Yeah, load in, load out uh, of the facility. Um, and we don't necessarily want to compromise that if we're making those kinds of investments in that building. Um, so my understanding is that the framework calls for some sort of um, east-west uh, road, arterial road perhaps, I'm not sure what the classification would be, but one that ties into Wayne Gretzky Drive. And perhaps you can confirm this, um, that that the intersection, if, if we're going to have one, cannot be a lot farther south than the current intersection because it compromises the operation of the, of the uh, or does it? Compromises the uh, interchange operation at 112th Avenue, yes? I'll pass this one over to Levy to see if he can comment, but there, number one, there would be, um, if there's a change in the intersection, that would be a new cost that wasn't contemplated as part of the initial pro forma, so that would be something we'd come back with to help explain, uh, but they may also compromise other items. Yeah, yeah Councillor, that's something that has been discussed. Um, currently, the collector road that you referenced would go uh, from 115 at the west edge, uh, bisecting the site and then to the 116 uh, intersection. Um, we've had preliminary discussions with transportation on what the impact might look like of moving that intersection to the south and um, very preliminary. And yeah, the discussions sort of centered around compromising we, the, the exit sorry. ramp onto 112 off of the freeway. Yeah, have we contemplated not having an intersection at Gretzky and just having, having the road swing from 115th you know, eastbound to southbound at 93rd Street or something like that. Um, Councillor? Well, 73rd. Over here. Yeah. Um, we're currently doing a TIA and we've done traffic impact assessments and, and mobility studies. Um, so that'll get sussed out with uh, the completion of that report. But um, everything we've done to date has suggested that that location is fine. When we get to the design stage, um, obviously the um, training bays and everything will be taken into account when we're separating the distance from the existing intersections. Great. Uh, I've got to come back. Yep. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Councillor Carmel. Councillor Jans for first round. Uh, no, no, I'll, uh, I'll hold off right now. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, I'll come back to the, uh, sorry, less lessons learned, but some flags are being raised in my mind about the disjointedness of uh, some of the what I'm hearing. You know, we have hundred million dollars that we're going to put into uh, exhibition lands. Then we have calcium demolition. The planning is going on, right? And we don't know the pace of the development. How whether I mean there are always uncertainty around it. So I'm really look forward to uh, the outcome of the motion that Council Cartmel has put on the. On, on the floor, I think that will provide us more of a holistic, uh, comprehensive view of, of that. Maybe I'm just flagging this, recognizing our financial situation that we are in. Maybe we should, maybe we should hold off on some of the uh, uh, $100 million that we're putting into, uh, into the building, recognizing, you know, where, where are we going to land? I don't know, right? We are putting solar panels on and we are doing other re rehabilitation. Maybe we should pause until this report comes, and then we say, okay, where is this going to go, right? And uh, then have a more of a comprehensive conversation. I may want to just build on that. We're towards the, uh, the tail end of that project. It's almost completed. Oh, so the $100 million, that was, it's, when it, was that approved? It's uh, in the last, uh, sorry, I don't have the specific date, but it's through previous approvals. So it's, it's actually advanced through 
uh, a good portion of that work. Okay, so um, all those majority of those investments have been already oh, made, right. right? So then I, th I think that is, is another question. Then if we have already put $100 million into it, then we need to make sure that building is viable, right, uh, to, be, uh, to be used into a foreseeable future, I yeah, think. And I think that's really been at the center of the conversations that we've had with Explore Edmonton. Uh, we're still looking at this from the city perspective in terms of how to align this with the planning framework that council also approved. And so we have a set plan that was put in place. So we wanna make sure that there is consistency for industry to understand when a plan is approved, this is what they could see and expect in terms of what administration will be implementing. But in no way does that mean we can't listen into the impacts on Explorer's end. Okay. And we, this is part of this work. So we, we really wanna understand the full impacts of the building okay. at a nice detailed way so that if there are changes that need to be made to the planning framework, we can revisit those. We would bring those back to council for consideration. We'd also outline the actual cost implications associated with any of those changes, whether it's a reduction in revenue from the development yeah. or a reduction in expenses if we don't have to invest in certain portions of the site, okay. but also other increased costs if they uh, arise. Okay, because I understand ex like Explore Edmonton wants both convention center and the and the expo to, I mean, you want to make them as cost recovery as possible on the event site, so as I think, so look forward to that conversation. On, um, so once the dem demolition takes place, if there's money to, uh, uh, you know, create program pro programmable space, CAD is the only event, right? Are there opportunities for other activations on that side? Would there be other opportunities? Uh, there would be. I think the yeah. portion of that site was previously used for Cirque du Soleil, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so there could be any number of opportunities, whether led by Explore Edmonton or in combination with our civic events and festivals okay. team. And that's what we've been chatting with as well. So how do we Got make it. this a place where you both achieve the redevelopment in alignment with the planning framework that council approved, but providing maybe more input from Explore Edmonton around their impacts and what else we could do that's a little bit different to make this a really viable yeah. community. Yeah. You know, there are folks here from Alberta Avenue listening to this conversation, right? I'm pretty sure they're interested in uh, this site pretty pretty much, pretty uh, keenly because of uh, close proximity and also the number of festivals that Alberta Avenue holds on. So that'll be an opportunity. So in my 48 seconds, lessons learned, you were gonna say something, uh, 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 build on that. Yeah, so the, bear with me as I recollect my thoughts. So in addition to what I've already stated, yeah. the other part is um, how we're advancing some of the performance metrics that we have associated with this project and as across the portfolio on our land development side within real estate. Uh, and we try to communicate this with our Blatchford uh, team as well. So we really wanna have specific targets of what we're trying to achieve and make sure that we achieve those. Uh, when we see issues that are arising around performance, raising those up sooner so that we can have clearer conversations and communicate more regularly with both the external community, the neighborhood and others so that there are clear expectations of what can actually be achieved within the site. Um. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to follow up on one of the questions around um, parking demand. I think there, there was mention of a transition from surface to structured parking. And I'm just curious, like, would that be, where, where does that come into play? Is that on the city side um, as we transition from surface lots to uh, more structured parking to accommodate some of those parking demands? Something we'll have to look at, uh, to be fair. Um, again, not something that from the initial review we've factored into our pro forma. Uh, a lot of our costs have been getting the site ready and dealing with the demolition of the barns and whatnot that are located on there. And those are major upfront costs that are actually supporting development. We heard from industry that that's, that's what they wanted the city to do. So remove some of those barriers and allow industry to step in and actually redevelop the sites when they're in a, in a better state. Um, so building a parking lot or an uh, above ground structure, whatever that might be, that's not factored in. We'd have to review that in a long winded answer. No, all good, all good, that's helpful. Um, and just while, while we've got you, um, 
speaking about some of that, you know, underground utility work, the site prep that uh, we need to get going on in order for industry to come in and, and get moving. Um, where are we at when it comes to the two parcels on the southwest portion of the site? I'll start and Levy can jump in if he's any further updates. So the way we position that agreement is we had approval from council. Uh, the intent was always to work through and finalize the actual terms and then sign the agreement with the proponent. Uh, we've gone back and forth a couple times. There are no major material changes. As I understand, the agreement is with the proponent at this stage, and so we're just awaiting the finalization of that. Uh, I think they've already started to do some of their development conceptual work. Uh, they've had some of that previously, but a little bit more refined at this stage. Uh, we've also advanced rezoning and subdivision on our end uh, to make sure that the site will be ready and available. The developer will then take a, a step later on in the year to further subdivide it into the necessary final state that they're looking for. Uh, so all of those things are moving ahead. Uh, we hope to provide more announcements to community and others as soon as we possibly can once agreements are finally uh, put in place and signed. Great, looking forward to that, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. So, not to belabor this much longer, but uh, Mr. Gomes, uh, just in a number of quick hitting, these are the things we need to solve. We've got a building that we're putting $100 million in upgrades in. Right now, today, it has demands for parking. Uh, if we cut the site in half between south and north, that makes it difficult to maintain parking, right? So we may have a, is that fair to say? You need to answer so for people that are listening. So yes, um, <laughs> I think the, the cutting the, the site in half, I think it's just logistically problematic around how do we leverage uh, the space to the south in the future if we have a major roadway in, the, in between the Expo Center and the south, which would be the uh, Borden Park extension. So I think we're just looking for ways to really optimize the Expo Center, leverage it as a, a wonderful city asset that it is. I mean, we, are in a, uh, you know, we compete nationally, regionally, provincially for events. Uh, in May, we have National Volleyball, which will be in Edmonton. It's a $28, $28 million economic impact event to our city with 40,000 visitors uh, that activate the Expo Center with 55 volleyball courts. This is the only place in Canada where you can host that event under one roof. And I, I, I think I just want to mention that this is a wonderful asset for our city. And our interest is ensuring that we can leverage it to the benefit of the city as a whole, because I, we truly believe at Explore Edmonton that What's in the best interest of this exhibition lands, the festival and event site, and the Expo Center is truly in the best interest uh, long term of the city of Edmonton. But to make sure it continues to be that, we need to contemplate the road network so that we contemplate Correct. operations and not just, you know, mobility from, a, from a, an administrative perspective. Correct. We need to contemplate loading in and loading out those events into and out of that building. Yes. We need to contemplate in the near term parking demands. We need yes. to contemplate an outdoor festival spot that that uh, is being consumed slowly but surely as as development migrates north. Uh, and what am I missing? And we need to contemplate um, the cost of a cold storage building and laydown area that is being lost that supports one of our major festivals. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. So. These are the things we need to contemplate, and these are the things that I think we're hoping will be conversed and reported back to by virtue of this motion. Anything to add on that score? No, I think that's fairly holistic. Okay. Perspective. I have one more question about the Coliseum demolition. Completely in, uh, out of the blue, out of left field, using a sports analogy. Are we going to do, have we contemplated some way to mark that for 40 years that Coliseum was there? And, uh, well, I spent a lot of time in that building. A lot of you know life journey type of experiences and you know, lessons learned, if you want to put it that way. Are we going to uh, have we thought about something? Can we mark the perimeter? Do we put a dot at center ice? Do we save the columns? Have we thought about how we can do something to remember that it lived there? Based on what I'm aware of at this time, only preliminary conversations around that. Um, if portions of the building are saved if you're going to proceed with the demolition as is and you have to work around that that will that would likely drive up the costs as it we would. would expect Absolutely. but there may be other value in in trying to um, showcase that land and what was there previously this yeah. is part of the idea of how we could maybe use this site as an interim festival space for now but then also into the future so as we're working through that, like uh, one thing I can commit is we will continue to have those conversations because there is an opportunity to see how do we make this site recognized and 
kind of validate that history of what was there through future planning work? Well, like Maple Leaf Gardens ex lives on. You know, it's part of Ryerson University, right? Right. You know, um, um, I think the Forum in Montreal lives on, right? You know, not, not all these buildings were raised in favor of their replacements. So, uh, and it might be more economical to knock it flat and, you know, create a flat surface, but then put something back that says, you know, this was the edge or maybe that's the plaza. I don't know. I'm not, I'm absolutely not the urban planner. I draw with a ruler. But it's, I, I think we miss the mark if we don't remember all of the things that happened uh, in that space. Yeah? Okay. Fair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, for being here, for answering all my questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Carmel. I'll maybe just briefly interject. I believe that the, the building itself is being documented as a provincial historic resource. I, I don't want to use the wrong nomenclature on this, but yeah, it there, um, the province has, um, they've looked at it as a, clearly a, a, a historical resource and they'll be documenting um, sort of the activities inside and going through that uh, building as well. Great, so yeah, great opportunity because I think that, that that urban design element of, of bringing it into the landscape is, a, is an exciting uh, oppor opportunity. Sorry, Councillor Tang, uh, over to you. That's okay. Uh, that was that was relevant. Um, thank you very much for this uh, report and the discussion. Um, I just have a few uh, follow-ups on the things I've heard. Um, I guess start with the jockey dorm. How many people are in there right now? Roughly, maybe around thirty. Okay. Do you have any like a transition plan for those thirty folks uh, as the f the lease expires and the building gets demolished? I don't have it with me right now. I know that that's something we've been talking about with our, our housing partners. So similar to other buildings that we've had within the city that are running into some issues, we're trying to work with different stakeholders. I'll, for instance, I'll raise like the OSIS building. We've been working with them on the background to help them with regards to finding a new site uh, and necessary information to lead them through that process. This is going to be a different level altogether because we have individuals that are actually housed in this location from a transition housing perspective. So we, we need to factor that in. Uh, and we'll work through the lease as, as well in that regard. I don't, but I don't unfortunately have a specific answer for you right now on that. Can I request perhaps a memo or something for sure. to follow up as we kind of move along this Absolutely. timeline? Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at one point we also received land back from ECDC. Is that recent? That is recent, um, and this would be land that was is within the planning framework boundary. It is on the west side of the, uh, the rail tracks that are that are located there. Um, I forget the the avenue, I think it's north of okay. 115th Ave, maybe. No, it's, uh, uh, James Kidney, it's adjacent to James Kidney Park, I believe, so it's about 119th Avenue, okay. um, just to the so west. So this is this year? That it was transferred back, yes. Okay, thank you, um, and then, um, I'm curious about the urban farm. We've gotten some memo about it. You touched on it that there has been some recent conversation. Uh, I guess how recent? Um, what you No, know, is the certainty that we're providing to the farmers just that it will be relocated? Just currently, we don't know where. Um, so, administration has met with uh, Explore Edmonton uh, as a facilitator of the urban farm. Uh, we've highlighted and proposed the new location uh, with. Uh, Explore Edmonton already to get um, some feedback and their thoughts. Um, the new location proposed is within the exhibition lands as well. Um, and uh, I can speak for myself at least. Administration's intent is to also meet with um, the urban, with the farmers. Uh, I believe the date is later on this April uh, for a gathering where we'll be okay. formally presenting uh, the new location and also um, asking for feedback. But I guess like through that process of getting to this, this is a new location, the farmers weren't involved in that conversation. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um, we held meetings uh, with Explore Edmonton um, to ask for their feedback on what um, sort of like for like needs and requirements they would need as part of the move. Uh, and we relied on um, those discussions to okay. speak for the farmers. But yeah, no, we didn't have Okay. Yeah, one to one. Okay, uh, thank you. And I just have a question for the mover. The mover, Councillor Carmel, just a question. Um, 
in reading this motion, um, I'm also reading a bit of a, in, like a, in, that is a bit implying that currently Explore Edmonton in this exhibition land conversation isn't treated as an essential stakeholder. I guess if you want, can you just clarify that? Well, I think it's, I think we have to, I think it's been missed the, that, um, and not, uh, I think it's been missed in the context that this facility is a vital facility. I mean, we even heard earlier today that there is, you know, perhaps not 100% awareness of a $100 million capital project that's being invested in this building. Like this is, this is key. This is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when Mr. Gomes talked about, you know, just one event that's coming to this facility. Uh, this, when, when I was involved in it, this was the largest roof in Canada and the only roof larger west of the Mississippi was in California, was in Orange County. Like this is a great big deal. And, you know, part of, part of this is, yeah, it's, it's to, af to raise that awareness and to affirm that, that this is a vital okay. needed facility. Okay, and, yeah. and, and I'm also hearing from administration that kind of moving forward, you are trying to take a more partnered approach with Explore Edmonton, um, moving this, so it will, you know, your, I think the approach you're taking, your sounds like you're intending to fulfill the, this, like it doesn't add anything, to, or does it add anything, I guess? No, I, that's always been our intent, and so sometimes we may have missed the mark in that regard, but really we've been trying to communicate with Explore Edmonton over the last number of years to really get an understanding through some detailed analysis of what the impacts are, and we will absolutely continue to do that. I know I'm over time, but I just also really want to hear from Mr. Gomez on that. So certainly there's been a, a lot of conversation and engagement. I think uh, at the core, when the original plan was adopted, it didn't necessarily include a festival and event site. And so I think that's the, the, the conversation we've been having is how do we accommodate for that and how do we move forward? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'm not seeing anyone else to speak. Um, I maybe just have a quick question for the mover. Um, we heard earlier that uh, there could be an opportunity to align this request for information with the other, the, the needs assessment, oh, sorry, it's not the needs assessment, but, but the, it, uh, do you want A review to, of the, the land needs, essentially, yes. The land needs. Do you want to make that explicit in this motion that as part of the land's needs assessment, um, that administration provider information, value, no value? I don't think we need it explicitly written okay. in there. Well, we've we've heard it loud and clear that that's something that council would want to see back, and so we'll just provide that back. Perfect, perfect. Just not wanting to create two reports. Okay, but I think if we move it like this, all in favor be... of efficiency, Councillor Stevenson, okay. whatever you think is best. Yeah. So maybe just look to clerks to ensure that this motion doesn't result in generating a second report to the report that administration is already planning to bring forward. We can update the wording to say that administration as part of the review of land needs assessment. Um, bring forward information? Bring, yeah, bring forward information. We can we can clean that up. Okay, I'll assume that that's friendly to yes, the Yes, that's body. fine with me. Okay, Thank great. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get that loaded up, um, but I would ask anyone wishing to speak to the motion that they, they click in to do so at this point. Mayor Sohi. Yeah. yeah, very quickly, a uh, few points I want to reiterate. Uh, first of all, you know, city has made significant investments into, uh, into the Expo Center, including uh, taking on, uh, on the debt, ob debt obligations or paying off the debt obligations of Northlands, uh, as well as $100 million invested in renovation and repairs. So it's very important that uh, this building uh, remains sustainable for long term for the operations uh, uh, because it's a very important uh, you know facility for for the city so i think that's very important for us to keep in mind uh, uh, and explore we are pushing explore admin to be more of uh, you know self-funding some of the activities including uh, Convention center activities as expo center, so it's the more activity there allows them to be more self-sustaining, to pay for the operations instead of relying on property taxes. So that's very important. Second, I look forward to the demolition and uh, what can be done after that on the on the Coliseum and how that place can be 
activated, keeping in mind that may be longer than 10 years, that uh, that site might be available uh, before development takes place. Uh, I will be very disappointed if we are here when jockey dorms, if there's no transition plan in place to accommodate those 30 people, because uh, those are the most vulnerable Edmontonians. And that's why coordination is so important. I'm pretty sure that you will do that coordination, but we need to, we would have to figure out a way not letting people off on the, on the, on the street uh, uh, just because the lease expires, right? So we need to figure out a way to uh, work with housing and others and, and, and our provincial partners on, uh, on that. And also, you know, we will continue our advocacy. Again, it is very important for us to reiterate that when it comes to Edmonton, we don't get equitable treatment from this provincial government. And not having money allocated for the demolition of the Coliseum when uh, uh, province is funding the demolition of the Calgary's uh, old arena once the new arena is built is one of those areas that really clearly highlights the inequitable treatment that we get from this government. And we will continue to do that. Uh, and I think that we have an obligation uh, to, uh, to do so, because otherwise Edmonton property tax owners would have to pay for it. And uh, we have allocated money to pay, uh, pay for it, but it's not fair. It is not fair to them that income taxes are being used to demol uh, demolish or will be used to demolish arena in the Calgary, but in Edmonton, property tax are being used, right? It's not, and then we pay double. We pay prop, uh, income tax to province, then we also pay property taxes to do the work of the the province that's being, well, the work that is being supported in other cities, right? So I think we need to continue to highlight those things. So, yeah, good thing. But that, thank you so much for uh, uh, for that, and look, look forward to uh, uh, to the report coming to us, yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really glad that we're having this conversation. You know, Exhibition Lands is a site that is incredibly unique uh, and it has a variety of competing needs, as we've heard today. Um, because of the history of this site and the Northlands transition, it's become pretty clear that the needs of Explore Edmonton were not sufficiently factored into that initial vision for the site. Um, Exhibition Lands, again, is a really fantastic opportunity to deliver housing and commercial activity directly adjacent to transit, park space, excellent amenities, as well as the River Valley. Um, and just speaking of TOD development, we're seeing some great examples just south of the site, uh, actually, um, near uh, Stadium Yards. Um, so as we continue to see rapid growth as a city, I anticipate the pace of development may be a bit faster uh, over this decade compared to, to last. Um, really pleased to see this motion uh, and pleased that administration is going to be undertaking this work to help us gain greater clarity on the points of tension that we have discussed today and that were raised today. I think one of the benefits of Exhibition Lands being a long-term transformative project is that we, we do have time to ensure that we're optimizing the site and to ensure that we're uh, supporting the future viability of Explore Edmonton's operations as they continue to deliver uh, high quality events and continue to deliver incredibly important economic uh, value for our city and our region. Uh, now saying we have time and space to ensure we do this right, uh, we don't have that much time though. So I, I'm pleased we're having this conversation now. I wouldn't wanna push it off too far. Uh, so really looking forward to this report coming back so we can get clarity on a good path forward. Uh, very confident that our administration in collaboration with Explore will be able to strike that balance uh, that continues to uh, move forward on the overall vision for the site while making, um, uh, well, giving appropriate consideration to, to plan changes that might need to come forward to support this major facility that uh, we have all made significant investments in. Um, in the meantime, I believe using Coliseum lands post demolition is quite a compelling uh, opportunity and I think further highlights the utility that we can achieve uh, both in the short term and the long term through demolishing the Coliseum. Uh, as the mayor said, I hope to see the province offer some fairness and some support for the demolition of our old arena like they're supporting the Saddle Dome in Calgary. Um, and I, I share those concerns about receiving equitable treatment and that's a, an advocacy point that we can continue pushing on. So um, again, thank you so much for the conversation. Appreciate the motion and look forward to this work coming back. Thank you, Councilor, Sal Councilor Salvador. Uh, Councilor Cartmel to close. Thank you, and I, uh, I appreciate we've got people waiting to take their turns, so uh, I appreciate your patience, but, uh, but this is your neighborhood too. 
and uh, and I think this is important. And you know, my colleagues have touched on a lot of important things. What what happens with those that are currently in the jockey dorms? What happens uh, to this site as we redevelop it? Um, um, are we presenting uh, a solid business plan and development plan that will capture the attention of the province and allow them to find a way to invest in that and support us in that? Uh, I think that's part of it. Um, and, I, and we're making a, a pretty big investment in a venue here that I don't want to see us uh, lose the opportunity to enhance to its greatest potential because we haven't had the opportunity to talk to each other. I touched on this earlier and I think there was a, a time when, when the, this site and the buildings and the structures on it were in the care of an organization that was not operating like a partner uh, and was not necessarily coming to the city as a partner and having those conversations. Um, Explore Edmonton is our partner. Those that operate Expo Center are our partners and we need to really be collaborative on this and we need to make sure that we haven't missed any of these things before we go down the road of development. Uh, and I want to say, uh, I'm going to wax poetic just a little bit here, that we talk about the opportunity at Blatchford and at Expo and in other places about the opportunity to densify and to infill and to welcome all those people that are coming to our city. And that is absolutely important. But the opportunity for a community to gather and to get together and to celebrate and have festivals is just as important. Uh, when I was a young kid, my dad was a teacher and he worked at K-Days. He would work those 10 days because he was on summer break, obviously. And he would take me down the night before to watch the Royal American shows, trains come in and unload their carts. And Wednesday night, it was a parking lot. Thursday morning, it was a midway. And when you're eight years old or six years old, this was Disneyland. You know, you didn't get to those places anymore. This was the festival. This was the only festival. And it was in Northeast Edmonton, and that place was alive. There was flags marking the avenues to come to this place. It was where the community gathered. It's where our biggest events have happened. It's where Stanley Cups have been won. It's where I went to my very first concert. That's where I went to my very last Tragically Hip concert. Like, these are the events that shape our lives, that, that form our memories, that give us attachment to place. It's, the, it's what my kids are going through when they go and watch their favorite players, where they go see their favorite shows, where they go to their, see those things. You don't get attached to an apartment building. You don't get attached to, uh, you know, a parking lot. But you do get attached to those events that shape your youth and give you, give you attachment to your community, give you pride of place, give you, give you that thing that says, this is your home. And to, we got to be pretty careful about just blowing that off and saying, you know what, we don't need that anymore. We're going to put in a lot of housing and a lot of LRT and everyone's going to come and want to live in an apartment building next to a train station. Maybe, maybe not. And I think we better, we better just take a beat here and think about just how far and how hard we push on density and infill and development over every other consideration because these events matter. These things matter. There's kids coming to that volleyball tournament that Arlinda was talking about where that's going to be the biggest thing that's happened to them in their lives up to that point. They're going to remember that that happened in Edmonton and they're going to come back to Edmonton because they came here for that event. We can't lose that. We've got to remember that. And you can't measure that in dollars or planning or, or mobility studies, or TIDs, or any of that. Those are experiential. And, uh, and if we're, if we're going to get back to that place where people take pride in living in Edmonton, we need to think about those experiences. So it might just look like a building on the outside, but it's, it's a hell of a lot more than that on the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you. That concludes our first item of the morning. We'll now be moving to item 7.4. Uh, I'm mindful that we have um, about an hour and 15 minutes before our lunch break. Um, so I, I hope that we can get through our speakers and, and hopefully some questions of speakers uh, before then. Um, 
I will just start. Uh, I know some of you have been here before. For some of you, this is, is new. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the process. So our public speakers, you'll be invited. We'll, sorry, we'll hear first from our administration. Uh, then we'll be inviting our public speakers down to talk. Uh, clerks will help you get seated in the correct s spot for those that are joining us in person. Each speaker will have five minutes to present. Uh, there's a timer light in chambers that is green for the first four minutes, yellow for the last minute, and then red at five minutes. If you're participating virtually, uh, there is also an, an on-screen version of that, and you may wish to use your own timer. Uh, once everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of committee will have a chance to ask you questions, so please don't go anywhere. Um, and you are welcome to, to stay at the end of the meeting after we've asked questions of you. If you're persistent Participating virtually, please just remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can reach out to city clerks as well. Uh, I also just wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the expectations of conduct that we have uh, in these meetings. So as chair, um, you know, facilitating the opportunity for public to share your perspectives with council is incredibly important. We're very grateful for everyone coming. Uh, but with that, we need to ensure that everyone is upholding our expectations in terms of uh, decorum and, and kindness. Uh, what that looks like is um, not making comments or clapping or noise when others are speaking or when they've finished to either show your approval or disapproval. We want to create a safe space where people can share their voices without any, any sort of heckling or, or feedback from others. Um, if I do see that type of behavior, it will be my role uh, to, to ask our, our staff to remove you from the meeting um, and you won't have an opportunity to rejoin, although you can still watch online. Uh, so I really appreciate everyone uh, supporting our efforts to create a safe space where everyone can share and, uh, and look forward to hearing from you all. So that will go to our administration for presentation. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Travis Pollock, the Acting Branch Manager of Development Services, and with me today I am joined by Lila Peter, Director of Development Approvals Inspections, whose team oversees the administration of the Business License Bylaw. The intent of the Business License Bylaw is to establish rules and regulations for granting licenses to businesses that meet the City's criteria for doing business within Edmonton. Presented to you today are bylaw amendments which propose a series of continuous improvements as identified by administration and stakeholders, and the proposed amendments are ready for three readings if this is advanced from this committee to Council. I'll now pass it to Lila to provide a brief overview of the amendments in front of you today. Thank you, Travis. Uh, next slide, please. Most of the proposed amendments are minor administrative. Um, so the bylaw proposes to streamline operations for cannabis retailers by removing the city's restrictions on operating hours and deferring to existing Alberta gaming, liquor, and cannabis requirements. Another proposed amendment seeks to require that businesses with imposed conditions on their licenses, on their license, keeps a copy of the conditions on the premise to aid in our compliance inspections. And further proposals include establishing clarity and consistency in how timelines in the bylaw are interpreted and to remove a schedule that is no longer relevant as it was used to facilitate the transition from the old to the new business license bylaw. Next slide, please. So administration is also proposing amendments to three business license categories, exotic entertainer, exotic entertainment venue, and exotic entertainment agency. These proposed amendments reflect feedback received from workers with lived experience in the industry that this use of the word exotic has racist undertones. In a letter provided by the Advocacy Normalizing Sex Work Through Education and Resources, or the Answer Society, they state that the context of exotic dancer traces back to the Victorian era rural fairs featuring women dancers from distant countries evolving into a subtype of burlesque by the 1930s. Recent insights from community members highlight its problematic origins, as dances initially performed by black or Middle Eastern dancers were later imported into Europe and North America, with white dancers replacing them. Replacing the words exotic with erotic will help to advance the city's anti-racism strategy by ensuring that policies do not stigmatize people of color. And the word erotic is also more aligned with the intent and purpose of this business license category. Next slide, please. The final amendment before you is related to information sharing with massage therapy associations. 
Between March 22nd and November 23rd, administration has, been en has engaged with the massage therapy associations to develop criteria that associations must meet to ensure that there are minimum consistent standards for licensing. This includes membership, education, professional standards, and disciplinary measures and complaint resolution. Under the new approval criteria, if an association investigates a complaint or serious incident involving one of their members that results in their suspension or cancellation from membership, that association would be required to inform the city. This ensures that the city can suspend the member's business license, as the bylaw requires a license to be automatically suspended if the licensee no longer holds a membership from a recognized massage therapy association. Before the city is authorized to collect member information from massage associations, legislative authority under the bylaw is required in order to satisfy FOIP requirements for third party collection of information. So only minimal and factual information would be shared, specifically the member's name and the status of their membership. We would not require details about specific criminal charges or complaints. These situations are very rare, but the intent is to ensure public safety um, and therefore we need this mechanism to share the information. And most of the associations, along with the Transitional Council for the College of Massage, Massage Therapists of Alberta supported this change, although they do have um, some concerns about the city's jurisdiction to collect membership information. A legal analysis was completed and an, admis an administration has concluded this amendment will establish the necessary authority to collect the information, as a membership status is directly relevant to the member's eligibility for a business license. Next slide, please. And thank you. We would be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for the presentation. We'll now go to our public speakers. Um, I will read your names out and uh, Clerk Norton will help you uh, to your space, if you, your spot if you're here in person. Uh, John McDougall with Edmonton Police Commission. John, are you with us this morning? No worries. Uh, and our second speaker, uh, Matt Barker from the Edmonton Police Commission, please come on down. Um, Kevin Burge, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, Brent, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this wrong as well. Delside, all right. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Morgan, good morning. Um, Christy Morin, come on down. Uh, Randy Shuttleworth, good morning. Welcome. Uh, Nunu, welcome. Uh, sorry, Nunu uh, Desalne, come on down. Uh, Eric Estrada, hello. Uh, Sandy Pond, hello, good morning. Uh, Brian Laflesh, hello. Alan Bullsad, good morning. Uh, and Chrissy Kassour, hello. I see others in the room. Did you also wish to speak or you're here just to listen? Okay, great. Thanks for joining us. Um, maybe just in the interest of time as we uh, get some of our other speakers settled, I'll go um, first to Mr. Barker, or Speaker Barker. You're registered for questions only. Did you have any comments you wish to make? No? Okay. Uh, uh, then Speaker Burge, over to you. Hi, good morning, everybody, uh, councillors and everybody in attendance. My name is Inspector Kevin Burge. I'm with um, Northwest Branch with Empton Police Service, overseeing the geographical area of 118 Ave, um, essentially Alberta Ave. And today, I was asked to bring forward some statistics regarding that geographical area in the spirit of assisting you with a presentation that uh, Mrs. Morin and, and uh, Alan Bolstead will be bringing forward. Um, if there's any other questions, I do have some stats that I can bring forward at the end. Uh, you can ask me specifically, but um, I'm going to refer to several categories today and in those categories are going to be definitions of violence, violent crime. Starting with um, just quickly um, a simple assault 
assault causing bodily harm, assault with a weapon, an aggravated assault, assault against a police officer, robbery, commercial robbery, homicides, and firearms. These are all things that I've um, had my my uh, subject matter experts bring into a fold and I'll speak to from 2023 to 2024. I'm going to start with my um, first statistic which is for Q1 uh, of 2024 and I'm happy to report that violent crime as opposed to what I just defined is down 13% from 2023. However, within that statistic, the use of weapons and crime severity is up uh, from 2023. Uh, and it is up substantially from 2022. Um, from, from the statistics, we can draw a conclusion that weapons are utilized in various forms quite often um, to increase the crime severity over the basic assault where there's uh, fight, fighting and such, um, what am I trying to say, like nuisance fights with hands on, like hands on hands. So weapons are being used uh, within these occurrences. So um, that's what I'd like to bring forward to you today. Uh, that's what I have for 118 Ave or Alberta Ave. Great. To Great, thank you so much for, th for that and for making yourself available for, for further questions if needed. Um, uh, next speaker, Delside. Uh, good morning, councillors, uh, those in attendance. Uh, my name is Inspector Brent Dalside. I'm the uh, inspector in charge of our downtown branch, uh, in charge of uh, patrol resources and our beat members. Uh, I'll bring a little bit of a different perspective here in relation to what uh, Kevin had just prepared. Uh, mine specifically speaks to downtown itself, uh, inside our downtown branch borders, uh, where over the last several years we have observed uh, a, a significant rise in what we would call disorder across the branch. Uh, along with that rise, uh, we have seen a, a rise in a level of violence. Uh, including attacks on strangers as well as uh, attacks where offenders and the complainant were known to one another. Uh, one area of concern in that overall increase is an increase in weapons complaints and offenses, uh, specifically bear spray and knives. Uh, in anticipation of uh, speaking this morning, I also had some stats pulled that are specific to downtown. Uh, these numbers are for 2022, 23, and then January, February of 2024. And uh, they show the number of events our members responded to across the downtown branch uh, where a knife or bear spray was involved. Uh, so looking at uh, knife related events, uh, in 2022 for our downtown branch, we had 236 total knife related events. In 2023, uh, 255 knife related events were recorded which was an increase of 7.5% uh, year over year. Uh, and for 2024, we only have the January and February uh, stats to refer to at this time. And uh, for those two months, we have 41 knife related events uh, year to date for January, February. Uh, that uh, for the two years plus January, February, that's uh, 532 total events uh, where a knife was involved. Uh, uh, then I had them also pull uh, events, uh, stats related to bear spray or caustic spray, where those were uh, involved in a related event. In 2022, uh, we had 241 total incidents where uh, spray was involved. In 2023, uh, 264 uh, total events, uh, which was an increase of 8.7% uh, over 2022. And uh, for January, February of 2024, we have now seen 32 events uh, where a bear spray or caustic spray was involved in the event. Uh, that's a total of 537 total events for the two years plus January and February. Uh, recently, or not so recently, but over, over the last little while, we've been hearing from our community partners within downtown uh, branch, particularly the community leagues, such as Chinatown, uh, Central McDougall and Macaulay, 
uh, as well as the business associations that are uh, uh, tied into these communities, that their stakeholders had concerns about uh, these observed rise in violence and the weapons uh, that are being seen on the street. Uh, these concerns appeared consistent with what uh, my members were seeing on the street in their regular patrols, in the incidents that they were responding to, as well as the proactive events that they were engaged in where a weapon was uh, in the possession of somebody they were dealing with or being seized. Uh, as recently as uh, November of 2023, uh, the Downtown Beat program uh, took uh, on a project uh, that was on the 107th Avenue Central McDougall community and uh, really turned their attention towards uh, the number of weapons that were being seen in that community on the street as well as the concerns that were uh, being raised at several uh, stores or stakeholders within the community were selling these, uh, what we would perceive to be weapons uh, from the stores into the community. Um, as a result of a four month investigation, uh, the BEAT program uh, brought their uh, investigation to conclusion just last week. And there was a media release, I believe that was released yesterday outlining uh, what we would call a really big success in that investigation. Uh, just to summarize, some of what was seized uh, from last week, uh, 30 prohibited butterfly style knives, uh, 10 sword uh, canes, uh, more than 100 large canisters of bear spray or caustic spray, uh, more than 20 smaller canisters of bear or coyote spray, uh, five baton style uh, taser devices, as well as uh, uh, 20 polymer style brass knuckles. Great. And I recognize my time is up, I apologize. No, that's just fine. Thank you very much for that. We'll go next to Speaker Morgan. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Superintendent Kelly Morgan. I oversee both Northwest Brown. Can you lean in a bit closer? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Superintendent Kelly Morgan. I oversee West Branch and Northwest Branch uh, within the EPS. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak here this morning. Um, so I do work directly with Inspector Kevin Berg. So, you know, I can uh, echo the information that he's already provided. And just to uh, summarize, uh, violent crime was up overall in 2023. And the total number of ice knife incidents was also up um, within that same time period. So overall incidence of victims injured or kill, killed by knife violence was down slightly in 2023. Overall, there was actually a 30% uh, increase in violence and weapons events in 2023 in comparison to 2022. I know that Inspector Berg had mentioned that um, between the period of January and April of this year, 2024, um, there has been a 13% decrease in violent crime and weapons events. Um, however, in this same time period, uh, we have seen an increase in assault with weapon assault causing bodily harm and weapon possession occurrences um, compared to the same time period, January and uh, April of 2023. I do wanna stress that in the areas uh, that uh, Inspector Berg and I oversee and our beat teams do, so we have approximately uh, 14 uh, sworn members uh, inclusive of two sergeants overseeing our beat teams and we, we, can, we like to describe their work in thirds. So those thirds are uh, strategic, deliberate, intelligence-led, proactive enforcement within their beat uh, zones, as well as project work and that response to the key stakeholders and partners, whether it be residential or business community members within their beat zones. So I do know, and I can speak for Northwest Beats as West Beat members, a lot of their work in responding to stakeholders and our key partners, um, are they're directly contacted. So these partners are, they, they have built those and established those trust, trust-filled relationships where they can contact our Beat members um, directly via their, uh, their work cells, et cetera. So, a lot of it is the project work where, you know, intel intelligence led through the crime stats through our field intelligence officers, our criminal analysts and our uh, intel clerks, you know, determining who 
who the prolific or very active um, offenders are currently. Um, also trying to anticipate and do predictive analysis on that as well and looking at target locations or crime trends. So that's what our beat teams are very much actively pursuing on a daily and, and nightly basis. So I do want to stress that our beat teams are very much um, focused on the enforcement piece, but also looking to be there um, for any of the needs that our, our business and com community partners require as well. So one other thing I'd like to add is, you know, as we move forward, hearing um, many of the concerns with the knife violence that is a reality um, within a lot of these uh, hotspot locations within our city, particularly 118 Ave, 107 Ave, that as, uh, as a service, as leadership within uh, overseeing our patrol or frontline members as well as our beat teams, we're very much uh, willing and uh, very happy to be uh, active participants and moving forward to determine next steps on um, establishing together in a collaborative approach uh, a framework um, and a, a bylaw response to uh, the needs that many of our community members are bringing forward and our members are seeing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Speaker Morin. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Thank you so much for hearing us at this time. We know it's a sort of an unusual uh, walk-on piece, but we are very, very concerned as community. So I want to start, first of all, by acknowledging the team that we have and community that are here with us. It's just a small fragment of the amount of people that are really concerned about this actual issue. So this story is not a north side story. This story is a city of Edmonton story. The people that you're gonna be hearing today, uh, letters that you're gonna be receiving are across the whole entire city. So we are as, gr as grassroots as it comes. We gather together because we are all concerned with the amount of blades and knives and dangerous weapons in convenience and corner stores. And this has been an ongoing issue for 20 years maybe even longer. So the folks that we have are Alberta Ave District, Central McDougal, Queen Mary Park, Mill Woods, Jasper Place, Chinatown, parents from schools, all in these areas. Uh, we have Bent Arrow that was part of our communications and part, uh, as well as Dan Daniels, as well as the businesses, 124th Street and Jasper Avenue. So we're coming to you pleading to get some teeth into getting these knives and blades out of our corner stores. These corner stores um, are carrying these types of knives every day. The other day I went in to try and purchase one to see what the clerk would say, and honestly, he said nothing. I bought Skittles, I bought Easter eggs, and I bought two incredibly dangerous knives. There was no question, there was no response. It was just like as if I was buying candy. When speaking to community, they have said that they witnessed at several stores on 118th, as well as our colleagues across the city have said the same thing. These youth are coming into the stores, they're 14, 13, 12 years old, and one, one clerk out of everyone we spoke to said, how old are you? He said, I'm 21. He said, great, here's your knives. So it's unbelievable how this has been allowed and permitted to be part of our actual culture. We are on a race to the bottom of violence. We are concerned, we run, Arts on the Ave runs a shop on 118 Avenue. We are very concerned when speaking to our beats who are incredibly great, you know, and saying how many, like, is there a time that, you know, when you're looking at knives in a back, or looking at backpacks, you know, for, for weapons and stuff, is it, do you find knives as well as guns? And they said, it's not one knife, Christy, it's multiple knives. When we were asking people from Jasper Place High School, where did your students get these knives from that now they're being, expul you know, expulsion, they said, the dollar store in Jasper Place. So this is something that's prolific and is exponential. When we started 10 years ago with We Believe in 118, it was a softer approach. It was going door to door to these businesses saying, would you like to be a good business owner and carry good product for us all to carry and all community could come in? And we had a couple that said, yes, we would do it. And then within a few months, they went back to selling these knives because there was nothing to hold them back from selling them. They want to make a profit. They are there as business people and they want to make money. This, the knives that I purchased were $27. Next slide. 
you can see they're extremely dangerous. And what we are hoping is today that you will come up uh, with administration to create some type of guidance, strong guidance that will be active. Next slide. So back in March of 2020, um, Mayor Iveson actually signed, uh, it was a United Nations piece. So when I had a couple people folks, this is new business, Christy, what do we do with this? Well, this goes back to 2020 when we are coming to council. And this is an action that the city of Edmonton signed saying that they would be actively pledging their commitment to accelerating action to reduce violence and build peace, to reduce all forms of violence and related death rates. So we're coming to you as our leadership and asking you again, because this is not the first time we've come to council, I know you've seen us, we're asking again to get some teeth to remove these knives from corner and convenience stores. They are normalizing this to our youth. They are destroying our community. We are living in fear. So that is what we're coming today and we know that you understand that knives need to be respected. They are not an object that youth or people who have intentions to harm each other should be carrying. So we're asking for restraint. We're asking for a way to protect us as Edmonton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll go to Randy Shuttleworth. Please go ahead. Good morning. I have a presentation. Can you put it up there? There we go. All right. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite sayings. It says, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have is opinions, let's go with mine. Um, and you're going to hear stories and things today and I guess people's opinions on this, but I really appreciate EPS and the stats they were talking about today because that's, that's, that's hard data. It's very hard to argue with this. And so I've got some data that I'd like to share with you as well this morning. So I'll get, get my next slide up there, please. So this data was incredibly easy to find. It was, uh, Christy asked me if I could, you know, do some research. And I, you know, quick Google search and I found data from all over the, um, you know, the, the Western sort of world. Anywhere that there's strong gun control, uh, this data pops up. And uh, so this was from Stats Canada, so we can talk about what happens here in Canada. So this first slide shows about, you know, victims of violence, uh, violent crimes and the, the weapons that they're using. So that top line is nice. So everybody's talked about gun control, gun control, gun control, gun control, and we have very strong gun control. So then obviously if I can't get a gun, well, what's my next, me next weapon of choice would be to go out and get a knife. So let's go to that next slide here. This is a real concern. This is not a Toronto problem. This is not an East Coast problem. This is not a Vancouver problem. Look at this, Edmonton, number three in Canada. Number three in Canada. That's on you folks. That's on you folks to try and bring this down so we're no longer number three. Maybe we could get down to sort of the bottom there where some of the smaller um, cities and smaller places that we can get to because if this is awful. This is just terrible. Get my next slide, please. When I saw this one, this one really, really concerned me because what this one shows is that in a homicide, you're more likely or just as likely to be killed with a knife as a gun. And when I kind of read the background to this, I cut. this is interesting. So you can see the trend line kind of going down. It was because in the 70s, it was easier to get a handgun. So yeah, obviously somebody who's going to do something nefarious, they're probably going to use a gun. But as gun control came in and got stronger and stronger, people couldn't get handguns or access to handguns was more difficult then they'd go to the next weapon which is a knife this one is really really scary it also speaks to uh, kind of the way weapons are used so even if you have a handgun uh, most people are not very good marksmen so if somebody is going to attack you with a gun they're not going to attack you close probably from here to where you are and their marksmanship is probably not going to be that good so more than likely you're going to be injured and, and more than likely you're probably going to survive in a knife attack, it's up close and it's personal. And more likely they're gonna hit one of your vital organs or they're gonna hit an artery and quite likely you're gonna bleed out before help can, can arise. This one just scared the heck out of me. The next slide scares me even more. The next slide, this is violent crimes in terms of age groups. So look at that left hand one, 12 to 17 years old. Right now in the news, there's a story about those students that attacked that kid at that high school. That was that age group, 12 to 17 years old. And then as it goes to the right, that drops down. So if you look at the far right, that's me. I'm not a threat to anybody. 
I do have one of these knives, by the way, but it's in my garage. It's in my tool shed. It's used for the purpose that it's intended to be used. It's very strong. It's a very sharp blade. If I need to use it as a tool, it's perfectly okay. But it should not be, be walking around in my pocket to be used as a weapon. One of the things that Christy forgot to mention when she asked the store owner, what would be the purpose of one of these knives? And one of them said, well, for defense, of course. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, you know, and I could tell you sort of a personal story if you want later on in questions where we're sort of involved, not particularly close, but it really shook me up later where somebody had a, 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 a knife. Um, so th the ask today is not to get rid of knives. See, these knives have a purpose. They're perfectly fine, but they should be used uh, for the purpose intended. So be sold in sporting goods stores like Cabela's, Canadian Tire, um, Princess Auto. If you go to Princess Auto and you want to buy an air rifle, They'll only sell it to you if you're 18 years old and can pr produce identification. You can't even buy the ammunition for an air rifle at Princess Auto unless you're over 18 years old. So I think that's the ask today, is not to get rid of these knives completely, but put them into a controlled environment where 12 to 18 year olds are not walking into a corner store and just handing over 20 bucks or whatever and walking away with a weapon that they might use later on either for defense or perhaps to get even with somebody later on. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Um, next, Nunu, I see you were to answer questions only. Did you have any comments you wished to, to make? Please, then it's uh, over to you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, I'm here today to speak a little bit about uh, the same issue. I am a business owner, a stakeholder on 107 Ave, also <clears throat> a very active community member, as well as a mother of three. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to share my personal experience and my personal story when it comes to these weapons. Um, as it is, the 107 area is completely difficult uh, for a legit business owner, for um, a female business owner and mother to, to, to be around and run business. And uh, we really do, I personally really do appreciate um, uh, what our beat officer have done for us and the protection that they provided us, um, as well as Councillor Ann Stevenson for showing up for all those uh, hard discussions and uh, keeping the conversation going on. We're really um, grateful for that. However, um, my what I have done in the past five, six years was showing up with my beautiful, colorful paints and flowers and uh, kind of trying to vibrant the community. So we push out these bad businesses. However, that did not work out for me. Sadly, uh, we had to cancel our Africa Day uh, event that uh, brought up over 2,000 people to um, bring community, create community, build community. And I wanted to acknowledge and appreciate uh, Mayor Sohi for sending that proclamation. However, we are getting pushed away. Sadly, I might be closing my doors in the next six months because of these bad businesses. Um, I am an immigrant woman. <clears throat> that puts me on, you know, minority. And also, I am a female business owner with uh, female business staff. That puts me on a minority of our community uh, this area is mainly dominated by male business owners, also from my heritage community, that are willing to sell these kind of weapons and make a living out of these weapons. And I am standing on my grounds saying no to these kind of bad business. Yes, I will be making money, but not good money, not in a way that I wanted to teach my kids. I don't want to teach my 14-year-old, my 12-year-old girl, and my 8-year-old girl you know, this is a way to make a living. No. For saying no, I am losing business because I, I, I can see left and right, people are making a hundred thousands of dollars and I am selling groceries, fresh bread, fresh meat, but I can't survive the way we're, um, the area, the way it's promoting business is by selling weapons and, you know, selling all those illegal stuff. Why we're not saying no? <clears throat> to those and where is the support for people like me for my kids 
and I, from the previous uh, presentation, um, how important it was, like about what, it might, what I took away from that previous presentation was um, preserving all this, you know, long history of uh, the park spaces and things like that, but we're losing what we're trying to build here. And it's very shameful because of, you know, we're chased away by weapons and knives. So that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your, your experiences. Go next to Speaker Estrada. You just need your mic on. Thank, thank you. Oh, much better. Look at me. Um, thank, thank you for uh, taking us today. I, I want to thank everybody that uh, was part of this conversation already, too. Um, and I'm very pleased to hear that, you know, uh, 118 Avenue is improving a lot faster than other parts of the city. And, and it's very sad that downtown is uh, getting a lot worse. That speaks to, to the problem that this is not uh, one area challenge. This is across the entire city. And um, the Alberta Avenue Business Association board is very committed to uh, work towards improvement and work towards uh, a higher level of um, control for these kind of products. Um, after hearing from the community these many concerns, we visited 21 out of the 42, 32 small retail stores that we identified within our area. And during our visit, we identified that all of them, every single one of them is owned by visible minorities. Eight of them are owned and operated by women. And 11 of the stores that we visit out of the 21 do carry these kind of weapons. Uh, out of those 11, we managed to work with them to get them removed. Uh, I don't know if you can show my video there. Getting them removed out of the, uh, do you have it? I'll share a video uh, of convenience store owners getting their knives removed out of their shelves. And, and as Christy mentioned, this happened again. Uh, this happened before my time. This happened a few times, uh, a few years ago on our community, but they went right back in when there was no action from city to prevent these weapons to be across the city. And now you're seeing our community effort had an impact in our area, our, our, our crime rates went a little bit down, uh, but it went worse in other parts of the city. I think uh, what we're asking here is a solution that fix the problem across the entire city because our community efforts are now being met by city at this point. Um, our campaign resulted on an estimated of 431 knives being removed immediately out of these stores, but there's a lot more to go and we need you to step in and take actions for the entire city. Some of our community members cited uh, comments about the unfairness of some of the um, legislation actions taken that only impact small businesses and don't give them any additional supports. You can tell businesses are going out of business. Those businesses that are feeding our families in the neighborhoods that are walking distance are closing their doors because there is this lack of action and unfairness on competitive advantage. Um, that's all I want to add. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, next speaker, Pon. Thank you. As we fast track for recovery and self-sustainability in Chinatown with tourism, housing, and vibrancy initiative, we see an uptick of business opening. However, we question the nature of items and services offered in these convenience stores and pharmacies. There are a large number of weapons such as knives, swords, brass knuckles, bear sprays, fire gel cans, and other drug paraphernalia sold in these businesses. As you know, Chinatown has the largest marginalized population with mental illness and drug addiction in Edmonton. Our social agencies are doing their best to combat the issues and they don't need more problems. The residents are, are subject to violent crimes and living in fear. 
and we don't want our resident to purchase these weapons for self-defense either. The two-year anniversary of the two victims that were murdered by Just Justin Stone is coming up. So on behalf of the CTC, the Chinatown Safety Council, and the people of Chinatown, we're asking the city and council to take in consideration of amending the business license and permitted use in convenience stores and pharmacies. We need to stop the predatory practices. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'll go next to Speaker LaFleche. Hello. Good morning. My name is Brian LaFleche. I'm the president of Crystal Kids Youth Center, and I've been working there for the last 12 years. So I'm somewhat familiar with the youth and that that are on 118th Avenue and in the Alberta Avenue Community League in that. Uh, I want to first tell you that the prevalence of, of knives, brass knuckles, bear spray and that among the kids on the avenue and some of those attending Crystal Kids is, out, is astronomical at this point. At Crystal Kids, obviously all of those items are on our contraband list. And we average three or four of those weapons being removed from children coming into the center every single week. And that. Um, and that. The, the, and I want to speak a little bit about what, what the kids' perception is, why, the, why they carry those type of, of things and that. And to the, to the child, when we ask them, why are you carrying a knife? Why do you have bear spray? The answer every single time is it's for protection because they don't feel safe traveling out in the community and that. Our great fear with that is when an 11-year-old child pulls a, a six-inch knife out of his knapsack and says, I need this for protection, we spend hours trying to convince them that that knife affords them absolutely no protection. No 11-year-old child knows how to participate in a knife fight. So the chances are very good that if they decide that that's what they need to resort to out on the street, that's what's going to injure them severely and that. Um, and I, I wanted to try and, and give you guys a little bit of idea of the perception of violence among the youth in, in that general area and how it varies dramatically from what our perception of what violence in the community is. Um, and so I, I think the best way to do that is um, if you could imagine that you're an eight-year-old child and, and you have been coming to Crystal Kids for the last two years, during that time, you would have witnessed at Crystal Kids seven different police dramatic takedowns where they were out there in force with their automatic weapons and that trying to arrest an individual or put an end to something was going on in a house. And what that means is in the eight years that you have lived as a child, 25% of that time, you witnessed every quarter of the year a different violent arrest, right? Those violent arrests occur because the adults involved have weapons, right? So it becomes somewhat normalized for those children to have weapons because that's what goes on in their neighborhood. That's what goes on in their life. Of those seven violent arrests, twice the big battering ram on, on the front of the truck was involved, and twice there were, the police used flashbangs, which actually rattled the walls at Crystal Kids. So they have an entirely different perception of what violence is and how to be safe than what other people do. And that, and a big part of that is the readily available knives at convenience stores and that. It's very easy for them to just go get one or to have an older brother or a cousin supply them with one. So that's where we're saying that making knives so con like convenience store convenient is just not a good idea. And that now, and the other thing I wanted to point out is here at City Hall recently, you guys had a little taste of that with the, with the incident that happened here, with the, with the gun and that kind of stuff. As a result of that, um, 
now there's security at the, at the front door. And just because I wasn't thinking, the first time I came into City Hall this morning, I had a little pocket knife in my pocket that I carry all the time. It's got the little scissors and a nail file. It's quite a handy little thing to have. I wasn't allowed to bring it in here today, right? So you have recognized the need here in City Hall to make sure there's no knives. I think we're just asking to recognize that you can also do for the communities the same thing by making those type of weapons less available. Great, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, next speaker, Bolstad. Well, good morning, everybody. It's always nice to come back to the heart of democracy in, in the city of Edmonton. It's a real treat to see you all here again and, and to take part in this discussion today. I just, I have a bit of a slide presentation too, if you can find it there somewhere, to explain why I got involved in this. Uh, having recently moved into Alberta Avenue last summer, um, I eventually went, wound up wandering into this particular store, that's in November actually, where this Galaxy convenience store a couple blocks from me, and I was just uh, dumbfounded by what I saw. When I walked into the store, here's this display right on the counter of these really dangerous weapons that they're obviously being sold, you know, to to anybody and everybody, and I thought, this can't be happening. This can't be real. Seriously, you're, you're doing this? So naturally, I wanted to speak to the store owner, which I did, and I asked, what are you doing? I mean, obviously, this is going to be hurting and probably killing people. And the answer, as you've already heard, was, well, they were for self-defense. And I said, well, you can't be serious. You're not going to get in a fight with somebody with this? Are you going to stab somebody with one of these or have somebody stab you, etc.? And when he realized that argument wasn't going to wash, well, he said, well, they're legal. They're legal. The police know we've got them. They're not doing anything about this. And so all I could say in the end was that, well, I don't want to shop here if, uh, you know, if you're going to carry these kinds of things. And that's when the store owner said, well, that's your choice, you know, don't uh, you know, make your own decision about that. So that's as far as that went, and it was really disheartening. But about a month later, and over Christmas period, I'm sure you'll remember the story where a couple of people were stabbed on 112th Avenue, about three blocks from this store. One was coming home from the fireworks at City Hall um, with his son at the Kingsway LRT station, another person was a few blocks down at the, by Tony's Pizza. So about two days after that incident, I thought, well, I better go back to this store, see if he's still got these knives, and um, talk to this person And uh, in light of what had just happened. So I brought that up and said, look what's, what's going on, just blocks from here, etc." He pretended he didn't hear anything about the incident, etc., and, and again, just gave the same response, wouldn't, wouldn't budge on the whole issue. So I thought, well, this is hopeless. You know, we need to have some tools to do something about this, obviously. So then my next step, if I can just move the slides along, was to go and look a little further to see if there's any of other knives in the area, etc. So I went to this store a couple blocks away uh, on 112th Avenue. Sure enough, it's the same knives. Went through the same store discussion with the store owner to discover that they've kind of got a scripted response in terms of what they're going to say as to why they're doing it. And I got nowhere with, nowhere with that person. So then I went around the corner to this uh, this uh, grocery store on 95th Street in the corner of 112th uh, Avenue, and I spotted the knives in their display uh, um, shelves. And so I was just about to start to talk to that person, and I was looking at these knives, and he started scowling at me. And that's when I realized, this is the same guy that I just talked to over at this, this previous store a couple of weeks before. So there's obviously some connections in terms of the ownership of these stores, as well as... Um, who's supplying these materials and, and whatnot. And, and, and so this is a bigger issue than just talking to an individual store owner here about all this. So then we uh, started to raise this issue and obviously struck a nerve with the community about all of this, that um, it's, it's been an ongoing issue, it's causing a lot of problems. As we worked our way through, I went to this next store where we bought a couple of knives because we were getting interviewed by the media and we thought we better show, and I'll show you those pictures in a second. On my travels, I happened to go into a couple of other places. This is completely unscientific, but I just stopped at the White Mart on White Avenue, and yes, they're being sold there. I stopped at this convenience store on 124th Street, yes, they're being sold there. So here now we're up to the picture of uh, a couple of the knives that we purchased from uh, that one particular store on 18th Avenue. And it's when you hold these knives, when you actually have them in your hand, you realize how lethal that they are, and that uh, they're designed for one thing, and that's for hurting someone badly or killing someone. They, they have grips on the handles. There's a hook on the end to hold your baby fingers so you can really grab onto these things. And the bar blades are sharpened on both sides, so when you're grappling with someone, you can slash them across the neck, across the arm, whatever, 
whichever way you are able to do it when you're fighting with someone. That's what they're designed for, nothing else. These aren't for buttering toast. They're not, they're not for doing any other da daily activities. They're, they're for trying to kill someone is what it's all about. These are more pictures of the knives in these stores that I just finished describing to you that I, I took at those different stores that, uh, that I showed a moment ago. And as you can see, and as was Christy was saying earlier, they're really lethal, they're really dangerous, and that's obviously why some people are dying in these instances when, when they're being attacked with these particular knives. So what to do? And I might need a little more time here. <laughs> I'm just about out of time, so I might ask someone to ask me a question or two a little bit about our proposal here in a second. So maybe I'll just leave it at that. Uh, if someone could ask me a question, then I'll, I'll get into our proposal and take a minute or, or two about, about what that's all about. That's I'll, great. I'll, I'll cut it short at that point. <laughs> great. Thank you very much for being mindful of time. Uh, we'll go now to our last speaker, uh, Speaker Kassour. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christy Causer, and I've been a practicing massage therapist for 26 years. I've been qualified as an expert witness in the Alberta Provincial Courts, as a subject matter expert on the massage profession in Alberta. I'm also the president of Transitional Council for the College of Massage Therapists of Alberta, whose mandate is to pursue regulation of massage therapy. As president, I am the spokesperson for the massage profession pertaining to regulation. I'm here today to advise Council that the proposed amendment is a one-way information sharing agreement between city and massage associations and applies to individual members to be found operating outside the city's licensing limits or conditions of an approved licensing category. The massage profession supports an information sharing agreement. <clears throat> However, the concern is the city's licensing limits do not uphold the massage professional standards and violates the federal law which the massage profession cannot agree to. Additionally, the current information sharing agreement offered voluntarily to massage associations presents an unreasonable administrative burden and shares very limited information at the expense of public safety. It requires associations to have their membership sign an information sharing agreement, not the association itself, which discourages association participation. If the city believes that FOIP laws allow them to request information from massage associations about practitioners, then FOIP laws will also allow for associations to request information from the city about practitioners that they license and regulate. Is the city willing to find a way to work together with massage associations? Is there a way to do a mass consent with each association by amending their bylaws? What wording can the massage associations use in their bylaws that would meet the terms of FOIP with the city? I'm respectfully requesting a motion for a second amendment be added to 31.2 to bylaw 20002 to include a mechanism that requires the city to share information with the massage associations who voluntarily sign a revised information agreement, the identity of any individual of their membership operating outside the massage association's professional standards. I'm also requesting a motion for a third amendment to existing bylaws and policies asking the city to voluntarily protect massage therapy professional standards until regulation under the Health Profession Act is established. Once the college is established, the city will be compelled by law to uphold the requirements that the college sets. I urge the city to make amendments now that will bring existing bylaws and policies into alignment with the massage professional standards before regulation is established by introducing an amendment prohibiting inv individuals from holding both a health enhancement practitioner or health enhancement center license and body rub practitioner or body rub center license at the same time. Also require individuals who are applying for either license to make them declare that they will not seek or hold both licenses at the same time and to declare which license they intend to apply for. Both of these amendments would significantly, significantly reduce the need for massage associations to request information from the city. Our rationale for requesting prohibiting individuals to hold both licenses is due to our legal concerns. The licensing of body rub centers and body rub practitioners or any business that exchanges sexual services for consideration or payment is not only a breach of massage association standards, but also contravenes the criminal statute PSEPA, Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, which came into force December 6, 2014. Many mistakenly believe that prostitution is legal. The PSEPA legislation provides immunity from prosecution for those who sell their sexual services and treat sellers as victims. However, prostitution still remains illegal and purchasing sexual services is a criminal offense. This should not be confused by seeing it as a legal activity. 
The city's body rub licensing category contravenes the federal law and breaches massage professional standards, thereby by creating legal loopholes. Legal loopholes are easily exploited and increases criminal activities like human trafficking, money laundering, licensing brothels as body rub centers, insurance fraud, illicit massage businesses, and shields those who are violating legitimate massage therapy standards. It is complex and some of these issues begin upstream provincially, but the city's current role is quite integral in man maintaining the operations of several illegal activities, which does not take responsibility for by citing that criminal activities falls outside of its jurisdiction. A pillar to make change to close existing legislative and enforcement gaps is interjurisdictional coordination, aligning enforceable federal, provincial, and municipal laws and objectives. So in absence of massage therapy regulation, how can we work together to close the communication gap in order to enhance public protection in the best interest of safety and well-being for the whole community? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Speaker Bolstad, I think your microphone might just be on if uh, you can switch that off. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your presentations. We'll now have an opportunity to go to questions from my colleagues, so I'll ask them to click on. Just note that we have 20 minutes until our lunch break, um, so just to ask we, we be as efficient as possible with our time that we have, recognizing this is a very important topic. We want to be sure we can uh, get all of our questions answered. Um, I believe Mayor Sohi will be first asked questions. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for, for joining us, and uh, this is really a... Uh, uh, appreciative that community-driven initiative working with EPS and uh, and other stakeholders. So maybe I'll come to uh, Speaker Bolstead. What are you looking for? All right, and, and thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, so it be, quickly became apparent to us that we needed another tool or tools to try to address this uh, problem. Yeah. Personally, I went to the police and I showed my pictures and I said, these are awful. I mean, and, and they agreed, obviously. But the response was that we have no ability to do anything about them. Mm -hmm. These are not prohibited weapons. These are not knives that have, you know, buttons on them where you can use them as switchblades and that kind of stuff. But they're, they're every bit as dangerous. So it, it became apparent that we needed to develop something that would give the police the ability to go in and, and remove these from these stores. So that's why we're here today. We, we decided, oh, okay, city business license. That sounds like a, a good opportunity. We looked to see uh, what the city is doing with respect to firearms. You have a special category that businesses need to apply for to sell firearms. Okay. And, um, and so, and to do that, the Cabela's of the world or whoever wants to sell firearms has to present a proposal and get it approved by the city police as to how they do this. You can't just have your gun laying on the counter. It's got to be locked away and, and, and various things. In terms so, of, so you want us to explore want business licensing? want to explore licensing. a repli replica of that. Yeah. You know, we need to, and what we're suggesting here, as you can see in, in that one slide that I had, um, was that you develop a category of restricted knives. Okay. Got which, it. which are all these types of knives that we're describing that you'd have to apply to get the ability, any store would have to apply for the ability to sell a restricted knife. And then we've gone on to describe well, what could be a restricted knife. And this is where we obviously have to get input from the police as to what they think would work. But we've listed various things, knives with finger indentations or holes in the handle to assist with gripping it, knife with blades that have been sharpened on two or more sides, knives that fold back into the, the handle armed with a mechanism that allows you to open it really quickly, knives with curved blades, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. You know that um, that would be a restricted knife, and so we'll finish up then with the the motion that we were hoping that you would make today. And again, it's on a slide here if you can find it somewhere. But yeah, we have that. I think uh, and Councillor Salvador has been working with the with the community to. Uh, put, All right. But so I will be moving that motion on behalf of Councillor Salvador. All right. You know, just just let me yeah. comment on it in that we recognize that some more work needs to be done to develop a proper bylaw that describes these mm -hmm. so that we can get so that the police have a tool yes the police can go in with armed with something that they can then um, ensure that the owner has to remove these and then and, um, and get them out of here it's the longer we have them there the more people get hurt and badly yeah, got I'll it. just just leave them. There. Thank you, and I just want to come to EPS. Uh, you know, from my perspective, you know, 
we should have zero tolerance for lethal weapons on our streets in public places. Uh, so how do you see any changes being made to uh, business, li business licenses, the tools that city has, give, your, give you the ability to get these type of lethal knives off the street? Thank you, Mayor. I think uh, one thing that we see right now is uh, through the criminal code, we have a definition for what a prohibited uh, knife is, a prohibited mm -hmm. weapon. Uh, and that gives us uh, a certain power, obviously, to seize or arrest or charge. Uh, what's been described by Mr. Bolstad and others are weapons that don't meet that definition or standard. Mm -hmm. So there is a gap uh, that's quite evident in what uh, what we can do as, as police as far as uh, a charge or seizure uh, when, when we see them or when they're brought to our attention in the stores at this time. So uh, a bylaw put, uh, amendment uh, potentially is described outlining what a restricted knife may be or, or similar, okay. uh, whether it's restricting the possession of it or the sale of it or the uh, 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 yeah, distribution might be uh, the answer, okay. uh, or at least another tool uh, to be used. Okay. Um, almost out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Tang? Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I imagine a lot of um, feedback like what you're going to share is potentially part of the conversations if we move forward on, on, the, on the motion that the community had proposed. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interest in this, so I really appreciate you all coming forward. I guess I'll start with Christy. Um, can you walk me a little bit through some of the commu community conversations that you all have been having? It's obviously very well organized. Um, you've been having some focus groups. Can you just share, like, how many, how many people? I don't have all those stats with me, Councillor, but uh, we do have a working relationship as discussed with the police uh, right from the top all the way down. We do have a community conversation called Coffee with the Cops every month. Okay, I and see. We've increased those because there's such need right now with the safety and perception of safety in the community. So we are doing that uh, bi-monthly, twice a month. And uh, the last meeting that we had regarding knives and blades, we had about 45 people out. So um, that just shows the strong concern and uh, like I said there is mums at the high schools or the mums at junior high schools that are meeting yeah. as well so this um, is um, so this is a coffee with cops dedicated to discussions about these knives there has yeah there's okay. been focus on the knives as well as within the schools yeah. so you mentioned uh, Mill Woods I'm interested mm -hmm. to know kind of who are who's participating and right so we have individual residents that okay. have concerns about some of the convenience stores at Mill Woods that's great. Um, thank you. And they do come out to coffee at the cops, interesting yeah. enough. <laughs> and I'm, I'm also wondering, um, you mentioned that signatory uh, in 2020. What are some of the follow-up actions that came out of that? Um, I was going to... Yeah, I, I guess, sorry, just to, for the, my, my, I guess where I'm coming from is you said this is a 20-year problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has been some effort, sounds like, but nothing at this level of regulatory, or I, you know, you tell me, regulatory bylaw-wise. Why now? Because there's so much. Okay. So anything happening after that signatory? We have not seen um, anything from council. Um, I was hoping that that signatory would actually, it says it would be actionable and result driven um, in finding ways to get violence off the streets. And so of course, I don't know out of that, what came out of that, because I know that okay. was you know several years ago, but it again is a commitment from the city, city council, right, to yeah. violence on the streets. So we're, we're hoping we can find some actionables. Um, Right, and, and I guess also anything came after, for example, any community efforts? Well, like I, we have gone door to door, okay. um, whether it was net team, right? And they went door to door. Um, on this issue? On this issue, okay. yeah. And uh, it was met with some reluctance. Some people were like, no, we don't want to, you know, it could, could we buy back all of your knives? And then you'd sign a contract saying you would not do it. Well, some said, absolutely not. This is where I make my bread and butter. Um, some said, okay, here you go. And then there was nothing to enforce it many months later, so they're carrying them again. Okay. So lots of initiatives have happened, but they're, mm. again, it's trust-driven. 
and uh, there is such broken trust with these owners mm -hmm. um, because they continue to carry yeah. these weapons. Yeah. And now there's so many more convenience stores. So I think mm -hmm. from 10 years ago, it's probably doubled. I haven't done the exact math, but there's a lot more just on the 27 blocks that we're walking. Yeah, and I think it's that, um, you know, people say this is our bread and butter and therefore we won't change, hence pushing out business owners like yourself, Nunu, that in a very kind of male dominated business world, um, anyways, I just want to appreciate your story, and I, I think that was quite impactful. So thank you for sharing. I don't even have any question for you specifically, but just want to just want to acknowledge that. Um, and I guess Christy, <laughs> um, I know. So just on a sort of, uh, I have a number. I guess a number of questions um, on the. So you were speaking specifically to the third piece of this, the part three, of this uh, report. Um, and I guess first, um, I was curious, what is the transitional council? Is this different from like the Massage Therapist Association of Alberta? Yeah. And who so are your members and yeah. are you, anyways, who do you represent? Yeah, so the, the <clears throat> as uh, president of the transi transitional council, I facilitate all the meetings with the massage associations in Alberta and I speak on behalf of the massage profession in Alberta, specifically to regulation. So we're working towards regulation under the Health Professions Act. So, I mean, we've been getting some correspondence with the Massage Therapist Association of Alberta, but that's a separate organization, and you are in the yeah. transition space. So the yeah, Transitional uh, Council oh. um, is, uh, was created to uh, be the representative specifically for regulation only. Oh, so I don't okay. represent all massage associations, all of their issues. I represent, let's uh, basically public safety and regulation as okay, a profession. Thank you, I'm out of time. Thanks very much, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I just, I guess my first question is to EPS. Um, maybe I'll go to uh, Kelly. Um, like we had a really great presentation and I think EPS worked in collaboration with city administration to bring forward a report on the pepper spray and sort of got that work moving. I'm just wondering why this wasn't flagged at that time by EPS. Like if they're both mutually high concern, you know, why is this the first time hearing about this from, as a concern from EPS? Um, I can't answer for when the you could just that. speak a bit closer to your I can't microphone. Can answer for when the exact the exact dates or time frame that the OC report came out. I wasn't directly involved with that, um, but you know, I guess to it was it was the end of last that. year. Pardon me. It was like last like Q three or four of yes. twenty twenty three. Yeah, I wasn't directly involved with that, so I can't answer that a hundred percent. I can tell you that, um, you know, as we've indicated the stats over 2023, the violence has absolutely increased as yeah. well as the incidents involving um, knife violence. And I think that we can pretty well say that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, and, I, and I don't disagree. And I, I don't wanna, it's just more like, I'm, it's more of a, for me, I'm just a process question because I don't wanna lose some of the important work that is also in this omnibus, you know, we're. We're, we're making great strides in anti-racism with changing a, a exotic to erotic, and I feel like it can be overshadowed. So I just was wondering why it wasn't the same process similar to the OC spray where that came as its own mm -hmm. standalone item or in combination with OC spray. Because yes, I would imagine that work is parallel each other. Would it not? Um, no, not necessarily. Okay. This is, I mean, the complaints in particular, I mean, we always have to be um, reactive and very much responsive to the community. This is, this is the absolute concern that has been brought forward are the, the knife incidents and the youth. So we're dealing with, I mean, you know, and the biggest concern with this is we're dealing with youth, oftentimes troubled youth um, who don't have the, you know, the guardianship, the um, proper oversight from from relatives or family members so not realizing or having any comprehension of the consequences of using such lethal force we're also dealing with people who oftentimes are suffering from substance use disorders yeah mental health I, issues. I think we don't need to debate the I'm just trying to think about the yeah. focus on the business bylaw piece right now our business is allowed to sell these knives to underage people like is that yes. an immediate like 
I get that we, what I've seen as the potential motion, but like that seems like an easy, and I'll ask administration that, but like wouldn't it be easy to say that these knives can't be sold to, to youth like immediately? Uh, would you well, say? Well, you know what, if we're talking about an all out ban on, on these types of weapons, because as, um, yeah, Brent and said, I know that would be not in the term. criminal code under prohibited, they're not prohibited yeah, weapons. Okay. I realize the proposal is to look to have a classification of restricted knives. Yeah. Um, so we can't get into federal bans and legislation and regulations. Because I was going to ask my next question is at a city level, absolutely, you can look to implementing or developing a bylaw that would um, force the restriction of even displaying such knives okay. in a minor or major business, not being allowed to sell to a minor 18 years or under 18, okay. and also um, absolutely making it um, mandatory to produce identification. Okay. Upon on purchasing of such items. Yeah. And, it, and do you know of any municipalities that have put into play these business license requirements or would Edmonton sort of be the first in, in taking this step? Uh, you know what, I, I don't have the Okay, no, just was yet. curious if there was ones we mm -hmm. could look to mm -hmm. already. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And just to, can I just add to that? I realize that we're talking about specific areas. We're talking about 118 Avenue, we're talking about 112, we're talking about 107 Avenue. It's, it's a citywide problem. It is a citywide problem because, yeah. of course, we've been focusing many of our efforts and resources with various teams, BEATS, Patrol, mm -hmm. Frontline, HSOC, you name it downtown and so what that is now doing we're getting a, we're seeing a lot of this violence and weapons complaints that are being displaced to various other areas within the city so i'm talking about stony plain i'm talking about white avenue mm -hmm. yeah great thank you. thank you very much um, um oh did you have more oh, it's fine Uh, thank you so much. So I'll, I'll maybe just pick up on a, on a thread there. So right now it's not a criminal offense to sell those weapons to minors. Is that correct? I'm seeing nodding. Okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. Um, you know, maybe picking up on the pepper spray conversation, I know that uh, there has been a, an addition of that in the, in the draft public spaces bylaw. And I think the draft public spaces bylaw also speaks to utility or, sorry, I had it up just a second ago. Um, utility or hunting knives uh, being prohibited in public spaces. Uh, do you feel that that, that, so recognize we need to have a conversation about the business license bylaw. Do you feel that that's adequate in the public spaces bylaw in terms of managing that? I'm, I'm seeing blank stares. Um, but we, so we've added a restriction in the, in the draft public spaces bylaw that uh, defines weapons, uh, hunting or utility knives, and then there's a restriction from visibly possessing. With the pepper spray, uh, there's um, a further restriction around, um, you know, if it's pepper spray that's been tampered with in any way. So those are prohibited now under our public spaces bylaw. Do you feel, uh, maybe, maybe the bigger question I could ask is, have you been in conversation with the team working on the public spaces bylaw about knives specifically in that bylaw? Perhaps not. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's good to know. And I, I think we can maybe have our administration follow up with you on that. Um, and then just very briefly, you know, great, great news uh, that was announced yesterday in terms of the downtown business that, that you were able to um, address. So just for clarity, were those sort of criminal, criminally prohibited items that they were selling? Uh, yes, they were. Okay. Uh, so the the uh, the ones specifically that were captured under the criminal code were the prohibited the butterfly style gotcha. knives. Uh, okay. The other items that were seized at that time, I don't want to comment too much. Of course. Because it's now before the courts. Sure. Sorry. I um, appreciate that that guardrail there. And, and just wondering if there's, you know, recognizing that was a, you know, a, a really successful initiative. Can you help me understand how, how a bylaw, like a business license bylaw provision would have expedited? Is it, is it strictly around when, when something isn't federally prohibited? Is that the nuance that we need to, to get to in the bylaw? I would suggest that's accurate. Uh, okay. That in itself would cover some of that gap that I uh, spoke to earlier. Okay. Uh, we've got, it's not just the store that obviously we dealt with last week, but there are numerous stores in, in Central McDougal, in Chinatown, in Macaulay, 
on 118 Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, other neighborhoods that uh, see a niche uh, where they can sell these types of items, okay. uh, the ones that aren't restricted or, or prohibited okay. under the criminal code. Uh, and I guess they, yeah, they take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping that the, the message that comes across from last week is that uh, uh, we are aware of the prohibited weapons that, that are being sold, that uh, we're trying to do our due diligence uh, from a policing perspective now mm -hmm. in, in uh, holding the other stores accountable for, for what's being sold or what's being distributed from their, their location. Great, thank you so much uh, for that and, and to all of our speakers for being here today. So we are at time, um, but I would look to my committee, well, I, I will actually move that we extend orders to 1215, just so we can uh, f finish questions of our speakers. Um, just wanted to ask colleagues too, if they did have questions to please sign up now, just so we can confirm that will be adequate time. So we have a moment, but it looks like we just have two more rounds of questions. Uh, so, okay. 15, so that will work. Uh, I'll move that we extend to 12.15 to complete questions. Oh, okay. We will be efficient. Um, please vote on extending. Oh, and I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried, excellent. Uh, Councillor Jan, or Salvador, sorry, I've lost the list. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the delegation of speakers who came out today and uh, also appreciate it takes some courage to come out and speak to this topic, so thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna try to be efficient with my time here. Uh, to to um, the members we have from EPS, uh, really appreciate the statistics that you were able to share. You know, clearly there is a rise in, in weapons on our streets, community seeing it, officers are seeing it. Um, one of the questions I had, you know, recognizing that the knives we're talking about are, as was mentioned, not prohibited, but clearly still problematic. Um, what type of, I guess, investigative work has been underway on EPS's side to really support um, some of the changes that we might be able to make through business licensing? Gosh. <laughs> um, a lot of what we do uh, is in response to uh, what's raised by the community, uh, our community partners, the, uh, the community leagues and the stakeholders. Uh, that's where the uh, investigation that culminated last week uh, had its roots. Um, I guess the- And, may and maybe just to, to ask in a slightly different way, um, recognizing that you know, you've been hearing this directly from community, um, have you have you connected with city administration around like a business license bylaw review? Or I'm kind of going back to the the bear spray conversation as well. I think there's a huge opportunity for some really good collaborative work here. Um, I'm just trying to see where we're at in that process. Like, ha has that reach out happened? Maybe that's what can also come out of out of today's conversation. I'm not aware whether there has been conversation on that at this point. Uh, to echo what Kelly had mentioned earlier, uh, none of us at the table here. We're part of the uh, the bear spray uh, proposal uh, that was uh, brought to council uh, previously, uh, so I don't know where where we would be at uh, if anything has been done as far as the knife issue at this point. Okay, okay, that's really that's that's great context, and I think you know having your expertise around that table for these conversations will be critical. Um, I was also just curious, you know, youth came up a lot during this conversation. Uh, EPS, do you have some stats on, um, I guess, the number of youth who are involved in uh, incidents involving these types of weapons? Or even what you're hearing from beat teams? Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't have any of those stats available to us today. Um, I mean, we could certainly provide those to you. Um, we do also have an, an entire branch of teams, our young people's support branch that is completely dedicated to um, youth that, you know, right from the, the entire spectrum, those youth that are just dabbling into or just kind of entering that, that criminal world um, right through to our, what we refer to as our Y50 uh, team that, um, you know, do their, do their due diligence to manage and offer supports um, to our most violent, uh, most prolific 
young offenders as well and doing everything we can. Again, there's that balance of enforcing, uh, um, balance of enforcement and support to, on those teams as well. So we have an entire branch dedicated to that. So um, that would be um, the best place, first place to go to with regards to stats on youth related crime. Okay, okay, that's helpful. And um, the next question I have might seem like there's an obvious answer, but I, I want to ask it anyways. Um, given the rise of weapons that we're seeing on our streets, can you speak to the relationship between the sale of knives at convenience stores and the, I guess, easy access um, within our communities and the data that you've shared today? Well, <laughs> I, I think you hit it, that it, it probably can be an obvious correlation, but uh, the fact that we don't have knives with serial numbers or things like that, we, we wouldn't necessarily be able to attribute that a sale of a specific knife from one location or store uh, was used or presented in an offence uh, later on. Uh, that the, I guess the prevalence or the convenience or the ease of being able to obtain knives, uh, I think is a fair, uh, a fair correlation between why we're seeing them on the street now and yeah uh, yeah absolutely uh well thanks for that answer and maybe just to uh speaker estrada um i appreciated the letter that was sent in from the alberta uh, bia and i noted in that letter uh, i think it was was it 95 percent of surveyed businesses actually supported action on this item is that correct yeah 95 of them uh, they're very very engaged and we're very committed to work with administration to make sure these uh changes don't unequitable affect our members. Excellent. I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Jans. Thank you. In the interest of time, I just want to be really quick and thank all the speakers for coming. I think this is really important work and uh, I think you're being very creative about a potential solution here. Just wanted to ask the police though, just to just uh, if they had, um, um, I just want to be crystal clear, like I'm, I'm hearing support from the police and the police commission today for uh, action here. Um, would they be supportive of this specific uh, proposal brought forward by the community members? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think I'd mentioned previously, um, we're more than willing to be an active participant in uh, working together with our community members, with the commission, with the council on, um, you know, developing or creating um, a response, a bylaw response to this and looking at a framework together. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I heard many, many, many positive comments today about needing action here. One, one other area. So sometimes we hear, well, people can just buy them online. People can just buy them on Amazon or whatever, um, or different online stores and have them shipped. Um, what, what, how would, how would, how would the, the police res respond to that about concerns about online shopping? Yeah, actually, I would say that some of these purchases are impulse purchases by members on in these certain demographic areas. Um, to buy on Amazon, it would take some organization. I say some of these uh, once they know where these knives are purchased, they tend to they would tend to go there a little more often than just simply ordering online. So it's a matter of convenience, hence convenience store, I guess. Right, and and so to paraphrase, I guess like. If you wanted to buy on Amazon, you probably need a credit card. You probably need to be over 18. You probably need a parent. You probably need, there'd be a whole bunch of layers. But in this case, this could be um, crime of, crime of. I don't think we use the expression crime of passion, but like impulse crime or something uh, that, that would that would take place. Is that is that more uh, a fair comment? I guess they're buying knives instead of chocolate bars at the till. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, well, this is, this is really helpful, full support, and I yield my time. Thank you, Councillor Jans. I'm not seeing anyone else on the list. So that uh, concludes our conversation with speakers. Thank you again all so much for being here. Uh, we will be on recess for lunch until 1.30 p.m. You are all very much welcome to come back if you'd like to continue listening to the conversation, uh, but no obligation to do so. We really appreciate you being here and uh, we will now be on recess until 1.30 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, thank, thank you and welcome back uh, to the April 9th Urban Planning Committee meeting. I'll just do a quick roll call of uh, my committee colleagues, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Uh, Mayor Sohi. I'm here. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, hello. Um, we are also joined in chambers by Councillor Salvador. Hello. Um, and online we have Councillors Rice, Principe, and that is it at this moment. Uh, we'll go now to questions of administration. Uh, we're on item 7.4. I see Councillor Salvador on the board, so happy to go to you first. Or did Mayor Sohi select if you would like to? Sure. I, you want me to move the... Uh Sure. The motion, right? Yeah, so no requirement that, to, but so, happy to get that on But that way, at least committee members know that we have something to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, consider, right? So I will... Sorry, sorry just, just to be clear, though, we're not going to lose the actual moving of the bylaw? Yeah, so, like, I, I worry if we put that... I, I assume that was a subsequent to actually moving well, get the business from, license omnibus bylaw. Yeah, thank you. We'll just turn to clerk it's in terms of the best process moving forward, recognizing that there may be an amending motion for the bylaw as well, depending on questions that we have. I would say best practice would be to get the bylaw recommendation on the floor first, and we can deal with subsequent afterwards. Okay, recognizing that we do not need to have a motion on the floor for committee, I'll just suggest that we don't put anything on the floor at this time, because I just have some clarifying questions around the bylaw itself. So over to questions, but but recognizing that there are motions coming to to address the committee concerns. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, to, to you. Yeah, so maybe I'll start with uh, what we heard from the uh, from the speakers, right? Uh, what tools are available uh, for administration and city council to uh, get a better handle on? Uh, the sales at local stores of uh, uh, these sharp-edged knives and like what 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 can we do to uh, limit the availability of knives? So as we heard, there are certain knives that are already um, considered to be prohibited or illegal, and we would not be able to enter into that space because the criminal code already covers that area. Where we would be looking at through. This motion. So those that are prohibited and illegal are not being sold at these stores, right? If they are being sold, it would be in the police's purview to deal with that under the criminal code. We okay. wouldn't deal with it through the business license bylaw because yeah. they're illegal. Yeah. Yeah. So where we are being asked to look at are those knives that are not considered to be illegal. And it's my understanding that the motion that is on the floor um, or that will be on the floor, I guess, um, is one where we would explore options, including potentially putting some regulations around the sale of the knives, who they are sold to, that kind of thing. We do need to explore this because it's a new item for us, and it is looking at um, putting regulations on a legal product. And so we do have to do some work to make sure that whatever we bring forward would be considered legal and within our purview and jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But we do prohibit uh, sales of certain things in certain areas, or for example, I know if, it, if it's applicable or not, say alcohol, right? We control through zone, re, some regulation. Uh, right, so uh, we put some land use considerations around the sale of alcohol through yeah. the actual use class, okay. but we don't prohibit the sale of alcohol. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, but we prohibit the location, right? We put boundaries on oh, no, exactly. where it could be located. Okay, okay. So, from administration perspective, uh, there are tools available, right? And, or, or there's murky area, like what, what do you, what do you, what, tell me what your thoughts are. As Ms. Peters said here, there, there is opportunities within the business license bylaw. However, we haven't explored that. Uh, so we would need time to look at it to ensure that whatever the amendments coming forth are in line with what we can do is what's allowed within the business license, license bylaw as well as ensuring uh, that the, the broad net, like it's gonna be, as my understanding through the questions and the comments of uh, 
committee of the public uh, look at a citywide uh, change. Um, so that also includes how, how do we regulate the different types of stores. Uh, yeah. So the business license bylaw is a permissive bylaw. It doesn't look at regulating uh, certain types of, uh, of who can sell uh, certain types of uh, product if it's legal. Uh, so there's some nuance there that needs mm -hmm. to be looked at. Yeah. But you can, like, you can work with community, you can work with EPS, right, uh, and uh, have those conversations. Say if a uh, motion that Councillor Salvador has crafted in partnership with the, with the community once that is put on the table, uh, and if it's de after debate passed, then you're fine with undertaking that work, right? Yeah, we had work with EPS and the community stakeholders. Okay, got it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Tang? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll just have one question around, um, since there's no motion yet, but presumably if, if that were to come, do you foresee sort of taking a similar approach as with the OC report, um, where you know it felt like administration and EPS worked actually fairly clo closely on that? There are some slight nuances and okay. differences between the two, but there will be some similarities as well. So bear spray is already a regulated product through Canada, so we have some opportunities there that we may not have with knives. Gotcha. Again, the work that we will undertake will help yeah, um, of course. analyze that. Um, and then I think Councillor Stevenson pointed out the, the public place bylaw. Um, that's also you know coming back uh, later on this year. Um, do you see that alignment opportunity? It, like, is it there? So within that uh, bylaw right now, um, or proposed, uh, there is regulation in there that prohibits the, the use or the possession of uh, firearms and knives or weapons in public spaces. Uh, so there is alignment there already. Okay. So that will be part of whatever the next steps might be, be part of those considerations. Correct. Um, okay, I want to focus on the, the the report we did get and um, some of the concerns raised from stakeholders on the part three, we've gotten some correspondence, obviously hearing from um, Ms. Kasur with the Transitional Council. We got a letter from MTAA. I guess I'm, I'm like, there were both external stakeholders engaged in this process. They were named in the What We Heard document. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering where the feedback's coming from. Have you heard it already? What did you... Have you found ways to address it during the course of the conversation? Um, what are the gaps still remaining? So we did engage with both uh, mm -hmm. uh, groups and there are some areas where we have not fully aligned and I think that's what you're hearing today. We did do some extensive engagement and um, ultimately there are different ways and approaches that we can take from both sides to achieve the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and this is the best way that administration put forward for the city and for the business license bylaw. Um, so there are some areas where there are gaps and that's what you were hearing today where we may not have met their expectations with our bylaw. Okay, because my understanding is that the, with, the ch with the changes or with this what's proposed in the report, it will facilitate It'll make it easier for the necessary information sharing. Yes, so the bylaw amendment brings forward the ability for us to do information sharing and brings us in line with FOIP. There is a request out there for us to do some more information sharing, so there's a request for us to provide information back, and that's the area where um, I think fundamentally there's a difference in approach, so um, the city does feel that um, practitioners can hold two different types of licenses and some of the so what we're hearing from the association is that they they don't support that for their own purposes mm. and for their own regulatory body and so they were looking to get that information back from us and we are not looking at that as an opportunity w why So there, there is an asymmetric information flow there just in terms of ensuring the protection and privacy uh, of okay. those permit holders. Uh, so it would, we would look to see if the associations wanted to uh, create rules or bylaws uh, that only allow one type of license to be hold. That's within their purview of their own organization and they should be the ones to uphold it and uh, figure out how uh, mm. to go about collecting that information from their members. 
And there are some claims that this bylaw will con contravene like federal pieces. I'm assuming as part of the, you know, the work itself, you've kind of looked at, you know, in a similar vein as um, other aspects of the business license, you'll be looking at other levels of government and what regulations are in place. Uh, Christina from Law is on line. We'll oh, let her great. take that one. Thanks so much, Councillor. Um, so yes, the none of the changes in the federal level are new. They're all from 2014 and they have been extensively researched from our office's perspective. Um, so no, uh, we are very comfortable from a legal perspective with how our structure is. Um, and just going back a little bit to the data sharing on the other side of things, we did an extensive uh, look into this with our FOIP office as well to confirm whether this was possible or not. And we determined that it wasn't. Uh, so we're being very cautious in this area, not only understanding that yes, the massage industry has their own concerns, of course, um, but we also have caution on the harm reduction side of this as well so it's a very kind of careful line we have to walk okay thank Thanks you very much councillor cartmel thank you i uh, i just want to tease this out a bit more so um, let's take chiropractors uh, if i have a, a chiropractor practice do i need a business license no because they are part of a regulated profession that is correct. They are provincially regulated, and in their provincial regulation, they are exempt from okay. business licensing. Right, like I am for my engineering company, because I'm a regulated company, so I'm exempt. Yes. But there is no such body yet for massage therapists. Exactly. So because they're not regulated, they're not exempt. Yes, at this time, um, they're not regulated provincially. So because of that, the city has essentially had to step in and regulate them municipally. With a license process, which is imperfect. Yeah. So they're building towards becoming a regulated profession. Yes. Um, and so when they do so, then they would be exempt from the business license process and they would be equivalent to other professions, psychiatrists. Exactly. Yeah. We would react based on what the province put out for their legislation, we would react to it and make whatever changes we needed to. And so I don't know if chiropractors or engineers or any other regulated authority, regulated profession has within their membership requirements that you can't be a membership of another thing, but if they wanted to, they could do that when they achieve that status. Correct. Is that fair? I would we, say so. Do we know how far along the journey they are to becoming a regulated profession? Do we have a sense of that? It sounded like they were kind of unifying the associations and they're making steps, but. I don't think we have a timeline. We know that they're working on it yeah. and um, we are we would be there to work with them as and when they become regulated, but we don't have a timeline. And part of that is how quickly the province would respond to that too. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Those were really helpful questions. Um, and I think the response to some of the, to Councillor Tang's questions helped as well. So, you know, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that we can't always meet all stakeholders' um, expectations uh, with, with these types of changes. I think where I'm struggling is we're sort of getting some feedback. Um, I don't know that I feel confident that we've had sort of that full breakdown of what the concerns are and what the city's response is. So just wondering in terms of timelines, um, do you think there could be advantages just in terms of clarity, ensuring that council has confidence in the decisions we're making that, that industry has been um, connected with if we were to potentially hold back on making these amendments to the business license bylaw at this time related specifically to, to part 10 um, in, in massage and then just have a few of those conversations with a report coming back with some clarity around those issues. We can always go back and re-engage. Um, I don't know if we will um, gain further alignment. We have done a lot of engagement but they, we, we can go back and we can look at these um, issues further. We would likely recommend bringing it back with the omnibus report in 2025 just reflecting on some of the other motions that we were anticipating and priority work. Um, but um, I don't know um, how, whether we'll reach alignment, but, uh, but at that point we might be able to better um, demonstrate the work that was done if that's what council or committee is seeking. 
and you know, I, I would look to my colleagues for their input as well. I have a motion that I could put on the floor. I, you know, I feel torn to be honest. Um, what what would you say the level of risk is in not making any of the amendments for the rest of the year? Because I, I presume when you've had business licenses for massage therapists for quite some time, um, so is there a risk in maintaining status quo until that omnibus in 2025? So specifically with the massage uh, work, um, the risk is relative, like I will say the risk is relatively low. What this does provide us is the ability to automatically suspend somebody's license if they were found to have undertaken a, an egregious action, so maybe um, an assault or harassment or there are certain parameters that we have defined and shared with the committee, with the associations. And so we would be able to automatically suspend with these amendments. Without the amendment, we cannot automatically suspend. Um, we would have to go through a business license bylaw review if it was requested through um, the police. Okay, and that, that currently happens? It is, a, the business license bylaw review process exists, yes. And what's the timeline for that review process? It usually takes a couple of months to do a review. Okay. Upon request, yeah. Okay, and and again, I think I heard you say that the the risk of continuing as is uh, is is low, recognizing it's not zero though. Okay. Well, I I will venture to put a motion on the floor, if for no other reason, just to to generate responses from my colleagues in terms of their thoughts on this. Um, so I'll move that bylaw 20765 be amended by deleting section 10 that Urban Planning Committee recommend to City Council that bylaw 20765 as amended receive the appropriate readings and then I'll have a su further subsequent um, following that but, but again just putting it on the floor to generate discussion and look forward to my colleagues input on this. Uh, Councillor Salvador you were on the board. I'll wait until we're through Always this, this. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking for colleagues' thoughts, if anyone would like to weigh in. So this would be, just to introduce it briefly, this would be to move forward with all of the other amendments in the bylaw as proposed, um, removing those sections related to the massage industry uh, until such a time as we can just have a bit more information, a bit more back and forth to make sure that we are um, working collabor collaboratively with that uh, industry. You know, I'll note that a reservation I have, um, you know, as, as noted, it's a low risk, but there is a risk uh, with administration highlighted. I think as well, just to, to Councillor Cartmel's point, if this all becomes moot, do we need to get it perfect? Um, so maybe, uh, I guess I can't really ask questions. I'll try to be mindful of my time. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. I mean, I just to speak to it, I'm not interested in entertaining this. I just want to do three readings of the bylaw. I feel like I have sufficient information to make my decision today. Okay, great. Then you know what? I'm going to withdraw that motion. Um, and happy if one of my colleagues wants to move the, uh, the recommendation. Happy to move the recommendation to that council, uh, this goes to council for three readings. Great, so um, let's let's vote on this and then that will allow us to get back to some of the it other actions. Oh. There we go. Um, anyone to speak? I, I, actually, I would. You get to close. Yeah, but no one else to speak? Okay, please, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to take a couple minutes to thank, uh, you know, I know we'll be debating a subsequent on some of what a majority of speakers talked about today. So I just want to really focus on the omnibus uh, bylaw and I want to thank administration for, this is a great example to me of really iterative work and listening to and responding to the needs of the public. Uh, I think about, you know, our work on anti-racism and, and, and how Sometimes we forget how even just the language or the words we choose to use can have a real impact and, and perpetuate stigmas and, and racism. So I really just, I know it's just a small change in terms of exotic to erotic, 
but I really think it's an, an important example of those little things that can have a really big impact. Um, yeah, as I read this report, um, I just saw a lot of a lot of really listening and learning from business, what roadblocks they were having. So I just wanted to just take a moment to really thank you and, and your team, Kim, for for really continuing that iterative process that we always talk about on council so we can continually improve and do better and be responsive to changing and dynamic needs of Edmontonians. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried, thank you. Uh, we'll continue on with our speakers list uh, from previously, so I'll go first to Councillor, oh, are you Councillor Salvador? Okay. You want a motion on the floor? No. Okay. Well, let me go, I gotta go. Sorry, I'm just, there you go. All right, I will move this, that administration provide a report in consultation with Edmonton Police Services and community stakeholders with regulatory options and analysis to address the retail sale of knives to be due, due date, due date uh, Q3 2024. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Would you like to take a few moments to introduce that? Yes, I'm moving this on behalf of Consul Salvador, who has been working with the, uh, the community in, uh, uh, in uh, Albert Avenue, uh, hearing to their concerns and uh, understanding their needs and then uh, uh, figuring out how we can move forward uh, on uh, exploring options uh, that might be available to the city uh, through the, whether it's business licensing or other regulatory options that will allow us to have a discussion on uh, how we can control the sale of uh, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, the knives uh, in, in, in retail stores, right? So very, very, very simple. So, yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll go next to Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I just want to ask a number of questions just to make sure we have a shared understanding of the intent behind this motion. Uh, so to administration. Uh, first, just on timing. So we heard loud and, clear, loud and clear from community members that there's some urgency associated with this work. Uh, so I guess, is this the fastest possible timeline for being able to bring this work back? Uh, to be honest, I think we actually, it's probably too fast. Um, there was a change uh, that didn't make it through. It, Q4 is our preference, understanding the need and the urgency around it. It's just because it is a, it's an untested area um, and it is going to be, there's some complex and nuance to, to how we bring it forward. Okay, okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, obviously not a member of committee, so can let mm -hmm. others speak to that, but I, I would just urge that um, given what we've heard today, I'd like to move as fast as we possibly can on this item. Um, you know, the other thing that was made clear is that community has put a lot of time and effort into uh, drafting a proposal for uh, consideration. Uh, Speaker Bolstad in particular spoke to that. I know that's been shared with council. Uh, has that been shared with administration as well? Have you seen the proposal that's been put forward? No, um, not our team, but that doesn't mean that other um, areas of administration haven't, but we were listening and we'll definitely ask for it. Okay, and as part of this work, reading the motion as it is as it is written, uh, does it allow for those types of conversations to happen directly with community and for that proposal to be considered as part of this work? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, and then, you know, a lot of discussion about the business license bylaw in particular as, as one of the tools that could help address this. Uh, in my mind, it's sort of the most obvious option that I would jump to, but um, I guess it could be other tools um, and potentially other bylaws that could be applicable. Because in my mind, I'm less picky about where it is housed as long as it's effective. Correct, and what we'll be doing is exploring those options and seeing where it best sits. We would potentially ask, I don't know if I'm allowed to, that this go to CPSC instead of UPC because it may not come through um, the business license bylaw. We may be looking at other options as well. And okay. that just gives us a little bit more flexibility. That doesn't mean that it won't be business license bylaw, but there might be that flexibility. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, but so there, 
because one of the things I was contemplating was including a line around uh, at the end of the sentence here, including but not limited to the business licensing bylaw, but I'm hearing that that, that will be part of this. Yes, you, you, okay. that would be friendly in my mind, but yes. Yeah, it, I might throw that out there to committee just to ensure that that is a part of this conversation, but uh, is not limiting the conversation in any way. Um, and just in terms of of actionable steps. So once this report lands back in front of, sounds like CPSC, uh, will there be actionable steps embedded in that report? So if if there was a desire at that time to, you know, act on these right away, uh, is that going to be an option? And I recognize it's a little early, but is that that's my intent, I guess. Um, are you hearing that as well? Yeah, I think in, in terms of trying to move it as quick as possible, um, if, if for instance there's amendments to the business license bylaw, uh, we'll have that attached to the report Great. with our analysis of whether it's a good idea or not, um, or if there's other options that are better. Okay. And that you can directly then move forward with those amendments. Perfect. So it's not that we would get a report and then have to ask for another report. It would be get a report, there's the actions that we can take. Yep. Wonderful. Um, I think that... That is the clarity I was seeking in terms of the motion itself. I did just wanna zoom back out for one second. Um, yeah, so some of the speakers mentioned, uh, I think they were drawing a comparison to a special category for firearms where businesses had to apply to carry those particular items. Um, something similar for knives, like is that, in the cards here or to be determined when you do that analysis? That was just something that, um, that I picked up on. I'm wondering if Christina wants to speak to the comparison to firearms. Thank you. Um, so I guess one of the difficulties that we're gonna have in this area in particular in regulation is defining our scope. Um, so do we define that scope based on the definition of these items or do we find, define the scope based on where or who is selling them? Mm -hmm. And the, the major difficulty with knives in particular is that knives are not only sold as weapons, but knives are also sold as regular household items, essentially. Um, and we don't have a really clear definition given to us by the federal government like we are with firearms. Uh, so it really, really changes how we do this analysis here to make sure that, yes, our scope is proper and that it does actually attack the problem itself and the data that we have, but it's not overreaching at the same time where it essentially gathers everyone who sells like potential kitchen knives at Hudson's Bay. Great. And defining the scope will be part of this work. Absolutely. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Rutherford. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I will, first of all, just heed my colleagues' uh, 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 suggestions that she's thrown out and I will, if it's considered friendly, amend the motion to add including but not limited to business license bylaw. Would and you also like to move the... Yeah, I'll change the date to it. Oh, and then no, the not, not, I don't support changing the date, but uh, Community and Public Services Committee? Just sure. sort of interrupt councillors, but one committee cannot direct the work of another committee. So this would have to, today, return to Urban Planning Committee, but a gender review committee can reroute it at okay. the appropriate time. Okay, so I'll just leave it as is. But can, uh, can, so I'll just make that one change to the wording at this point, and then I have a question about the timeline before I go to the due date conversation anyway. So is that is that considered friendly? Okay, um, so I guess my question, because I hear the urgency too, and I think that uh, it's important to address. And then even EPS, when they were here, they were talking about a few things like even how knives are displayed and those kind of things. Like, is there, I guess, understanding there's nuance and complexity. Is there, can this be parsed into two pieces? One of like quick wins and ones that need a little bit more exploration and time. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I, I do, and I actually asked the team that earlier, and one of the challenges, again, is that this is, again, we're looking at regulating an, a non-prohibited item, and so we kind of do have to explore it all. We yeah. also understand the urgency of it, so if through this work we find that there's some short wins that we can bring forward, but that there might be further work to bring about, we will do it that way. Okay. Um, but yes, I already asked the team that just to see, but we still... We still or have even some like just ID required, like we can't even do ID required under 18. Again, I'm going to turn to Christina. <laughs> like I, I just, I mean, I, should, like should a kid be buying a, like a, 
a, a chef's knife anyway? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, and I guess maybe that's a question for counsel is if, if you're comfortable with essentially saying anyone under the age of 18 is not allowed to buy a knife, I can define a knife. Yeah. That's that's a straightforward definition. I can't define necessarily a knife that's specifically used as a weapon without a lot of legal analysis and data. Um, mm -hmm. So really, it does depend on what council wants to do. And I think we're willing to bring forward a bunch of different options and okay. see which direction you'd like to go. Okay, I see. I, and I can see how already when you say that under 18, a knife, because then I'm like, oh, well, it's like a Swiss Army knife, or like for scouting or whatever. Like, it's just... It's so nuanced, right? That's what I'm grappling with. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think as long as the intention is there, like I really hear the concern from community and I want to make sure that if there are options, at least that council can grapple with that are, are quicker and we do need to have a bigger discussion about should we be banning on youth and what does that look like? Should we be, you know, not displaying them in certain ways at businesses? If those can come back quicker, like, cause I know we talked about like, you know, this, that you wanted at, at Q4, actually, quarter four, but I'm just trying to think about, like, I wish we'd had this conversation, like, a few years ago, actually, and that this work was already well underway. Um, so, just confirming again that that will be the intention of administration, that administration could and would bring forward stuff if they find some quick opportunities. We will. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, just a uh, few questions. Uh, they're related, but they're also not specifically on this. But I just want to understand our, uh, the federal enabling legislation. I think federal government passed a legislation a couple of years ago giving municipalities the authority to uh, regulate handguns, right? Am I right or wrong? That may have been the province. Typically, the federal government doesn't have any power to direct municipalities on what they are and are not able to do, given the way that the powers are structured in the mm. in the charter. Or maybe they left because I, I I remember that discussion vaguely. I wasn't part of the government then. But when there was a big discussion, maybe I'll, I'll follow offline on that because I just need to understand the context of why the legislation is applicable. I know it's not, may not be applicable to knives because knives are not a prohibited mm -hmm. uh, item, right? Okay, maybe it's not. Uh, okay, I just had questions on uh, timing. I think timing, timing is of essence. Uh, so if you can bring it forward, whatever you can. Uh, then further work on the, the rest. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Just, I just had a really quick question around, um, you know, what I'm really taking from this conversation is that any move we make in this space is, is going to have different uh, legal risks. And, and I think that that is the primary thing that we as council will have to be, be weighing moving forward. So I just wanted to confirm as well that as part of this report coming back, that we will have those options laid out. And I think I heard that earlier, that we'll have those options laid out and some very clear sort of risk ranking, risk um, analysis that, that will allow us to inform our decision making. Um, I think what I'm sort of driving at there is that first we have sort of that fulsome analysis and also that administration doesn't make any assumptions around our risk tolerance about what we may be willing to consider. Um, Yes, we can explore some of that as well. I think just to add, there's also the level of regulation that you want to apply to businesses um, as we take this forward and whether that becomes a barrier for their operation as well that we're going to have to weigh in. So, Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think if that can be qualified as, as much as possible with very clear, clear um, expectations around that. Uh, that just gives us the information that we need to make those decisions because I think, again, it's a, it's a lot of gray area, but the more, more detail we can have, I think the better decision we can make. Excellent. I'm not seeing any further questions. Um, I'll just give it a moment in case anyone did wish to speak.
or sorry, to ask further questions. If not, we'll go to speaking. Councillor Salvador, was that a speaking or a question? Just one quick Please. question. Please, yep, yep um, no rush. Yeah, I was just curious. It was, I think, briefly mentioned, but does administration know any of the context around uh, previous programs that were in place? I think there was a buyback program at some point um, and some of the other, I guess I'll call them more education-based or, or encouragement-based steps that have been taken in community around this issue? Buyback for firearms or? Uh, for, for knives in particular. Um, not the business licensing team, but other teams from an administration may have some of that context, but we do not. Okay, okay. was well, just curious. Um, I'll speak to this when appropriate. Thank you, Councillor Tang. I guess just very quickly, thank um, everybody who came out to speak and for all the community advocacy for, um, you know, Councillor Salvador's uh, leadership on this one. Um, I think it's a really good example of um, this is an emerging issue, although it's been emerging for 20 years now. Uh, it's a bit of a shame that I think it's gotten to this point for, for something really concrete to happen um, because I'm thinking about you know, the business owner's story that given the current situation, there is a danger of closing down in six months. And I, I look at this timeline, I'm like, gosh, I can't, I feel like we need to act even faster than this um, just so we have something in place because even with the report coming back, there will still be a number of steps that needs to follow. Um, but hopefully this gives you a bit of that reassurance. Um, uh, but I think it's a really great example of, you know, there is a need in the community. I think it's really timely. Lots of different stakeholders have kind of coordinated and collaborated on this um, and transpired into something, uh, while not directly related to the report being discussed today, um, I think is a great opportunity. So just want to thank all who were involved uh, in making this happen. Thank you. I will speak briefly as well, just to say again, really appreciate the community advocates for bringing this forward and for all of the partners that have participated so far, including Edmonton Police Service uh, and our administration. You know, we don't always have all the, the right tools or all the tools that we need at a municipal level. Uh, and for me, that just means we need to be very, we need to maximize every tool that we have. Um, you know, recognizing that the business license bylaw might not be the perfect tool, it still is a tool. So I very much look forward to a report coming back about how we can use that and, and other municipal um, uh, tools that we have to help address this issue in the community. Um, I really appreciate Councillor Salvador's leadership on this and, uh, and the Mayor as well for bringing it forward. And I will go next to Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'll spend spend a little bit of time speaking to this one. Uh, and first wanna start by thanking all the stakeholders who have been driving this conversation, uh, including community members, uh, the Business Association, as well as EPS for their support. Uh, we would not be discussing this here today if it wasn't for you. And I really appreciate your commitment to community safety and well-being. Um, over the last few months, I have been hearing growing concern about the sale of knives at convenience stores. Uh, and what's happening here is very alarming. I mean, as we heard today, you, you walk in and right next to the chocolate bars is a wall of knives uh, that are designed for harm. Uh, we're hearing loud and clear from folks who are on the ground living and working in these communities that this is a major issue. Uh, we also heard from EPS today that they're supportive of action. And we've heard a willingness from administration to look at the best possible tools within our toolbox to address this, uh, including amendments to the business license bylaw. I, I do feel a sense of, of deep frustration um, by what I see as reckless behavior from business owners. You know, it saddens me that uh, this is another pattern of a uh, small number of bad business owners exploiting core areas while harming community safety. Um, enforcement isn't always the answer, but in this case, I think it is. And we have tried encouragement, we've tried education, but these are unscrupulous business owners who are more brazen than ever. So I think it's time to start looking at regulation. Uh, so very pleased to see that this motion was put forward today. Um, I'm also reflecting on some of the stories that were shared around the impact that this is having on youth in particular. The sale of these weapons to minors, children, that's, that's, that's heartbreaking. And we talk a lot about community safety and well-being around this table. And one of the key pillars of our community safety and well-being strategy is crime prevention. Ensuring that these weapons don't end up in the hands of kids is a critical preventative step that we should be taking to protect safety, security, and, and their future, and the future of our communities. Um, 
I think this council in particular has been taking a number of critically important actions to address community safety and to take care of core communities alongside community leaders who have been working in this space for years and championing change for years. Uh, much of the work we've done related to things like uh, OC spray problem properties and now looking at uh, restricting the sale of knives are examples, I think, of council saying, yes, we hear you, we see you, and we are with you to community. Um, I, I also think about some of the positive changes we've seen in a lot of these core communities, uh, and, and we can't let that slip backwards. We can't let go of that progress. We have to remain vigilant, and we have to stand with community when they're asking for help. Uh, and as was mentioned, even if we don't have the perfect tools, we still need to be doing something. Uh, when issues like this one are brought to our attention, we have a responsibility to act, uh, and that's what I think we're doing here today. Uh, so I really appreciate that administration is also going to be looking at opportunities to bring back some, some quick wins uh, if those opportunities do present themselves throughout this work. Uh, and, and I just want to end by saying, you know, this is an issue that is happening across the city. It's not specific to core communities. Um, and it's also not specific to residents directly next to some of these businesses. It has uh, broader implications. And there's also broad consensus among local businesses in the uh, local community about this trend across the city. Uh, so really looking forward to getting this report back. Uh, pleased that it can come back in an expedited manner as well, which again speaks to the urgency of this manner and looking forward to some tangible actions coming forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Mayor Sohi to close. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you to Councillor Salvador for uh, bringing forward this motion and working with my office uh, on it. I am uh, so appreciative of, uh, of every member of the community who came in uh, today to uh, raise this, uh, this issue to us. Uh, I think this is a great example of uh, where community took the leadership and brought forward an idea working with the EPS for council to, uh, to consider. And I look forward to uh, seeing what levers that are available to, to the city to regulate the sale of knives and, uh, and implications of uh, these, uh, these decisions. Uh, you know, this council has taken uh, safety and well-being very, very seriously. Uh, whether it is significant increases to the police funding uh, and we we are seeing the results of those investments as well more police officers being hired and more are on the way to be uh, to be hired uh, or investing in uh, safety on public transit uh, significant investments in partnership with bent arrow creating uh, uh, joint teams of social workers and uh, and, and peace officers or uh, hiring more peace officers, whether investments we're making in uh, in the Healthy Streets Operation Center in, in Chinatown that covers actually a broader area beyond uh, Chinatown and I heard very good feedback from the and the Chinatown Business Association today in the in the after, at the in, at the afternoon event about the impact of that whether we're investing in housing and other social interventions and preventions uh, or problem properties, as Councillor Salvador highlighted, another very good investment making our community safe. So the point I want to make is that we, as a council, I want to make sure that Edmontonians understand that we, as a council, are doing what we can in our capacity, and we will continue to explore what we think we can do, what might be in our capacity to improve safety and well-being of our uh, of residents. I think we want to, that's why exploring this is very, very important. We, do, we don't want to leave anything off the table. We want to have everything on the table to be discussed and uh, and debated and see if how we can use those, those tools. Because the reasons, obviously, the reasons that are driving safety concerns in our city are not caused by any policy of this council or any council. They're caused by lack of investments or lack of policy initiatives from other orders of government, right? Whether it's controlling gangs, whether it's, uh, you know, social deterioration of the infrastructure, social infrastructure or other, other reasons. I think so we need to make sure that Edmontonians understand that we are utilizing all the tools that are in our toolkit. Uh, so look forward to the conversation. On the, uh, on the Peace in Our City initiative, 
uh, I just wanted you to know that uh, my office has been working with REACH uh, on, uh, on advancing some of that work as well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mayor Soki. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We're just experiencing some technical difficulties. One moment. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. Uh, so that concludes this item. Thank you again uh, to our speakers. Thank you and uh, administration. So we're moving now to item 6.2. Uh, so I selected uh, 7.2, right? I don't know if we'll get through the agenda today or not, but if you're, I'm okay if that needs to go to next committee. We can move forward 7.2. We can bring 7.2 forward. I, or you I, can, like yeah. it's not an urgent matter, right? So there are. Yeah, yeah, do, okay. okay. Uh, but thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, we will, okay. We are on 6-2. <laughs> so we will turn first to administration for a presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, I'm Carrie Houghton McDonald, the branch manager for Edmonton Transit Service. And I'm here today with Sarah Feldman, who's stepping in as Director, Transit Service Development for the next few weeks to discuss our bus network service plan update report. Uh, Craig McEwen is also here as Acting Deputy City Manager for City Operations. This report responds to a motion you made during the fall supplementary budget adjustment uh, process. And that motion said that administration provide a report and analysis on the recommended route and service adjustments for the additional transit service hours delivery, including a transit equity lens. Next slide, please. So to provide context for the discussion today, we wanted to revisit the discussion we had last August about our service levels related to our service standards. So when we completed our review last year, we learned that to close the gaps to meet our service standards, 260,000 annual service hours, which is 5,000 a week, were needed for the bus network. We have a detailed plan for where we need to add service. So this includes the following types of needs. New routes, better frequencies, new peak service, new off-peak service, and transitioning some communities from on-demand transit service to conventional bus service. In the fall supplementary budget adjustment process, and we're really grateful for this, Council funded some of the service hour gap. Next slide. So we're really grateful, uh, 70,000 annual hours uh, were added to the network um, and that started in February of this year and that represents 27% of our total gap. The additional 50,000 hours that uh, will be added in 2025 represents another 19%. So that means we're addressing almost half, so about 46% of the gap through these recent budget decisions. Having said that, it doesn't uh, include service needs associated with ongoing population growth and our review was a point in time assessment. So that means we still have some service gaps and some needs that are unmet. Next slide please. So we also appreciate the opportunity to talk about equity in transit again. So we're one of the first transit properties in Canada to incorporate it uh, into our work across multiple different functional areas. So this quote from Veronica O. Davis in her book, Inclusive Transportation, outlines an important consideration for improving equity and inclusion through transportation decisions. She reminds us that equity requires that we make hard decisions to prioritize resources to help those who need it the most. She sums it up later in the book by saying those who have the least need the most support. Transit systems designed to be inclusive for all of us and not rely on a one-size-fits-all approach are an important tool for advancing equity in our communities. It provides additional and more affordable options for people to access everything from jobs and food to healthcare, as well as housing. It also reduces social isolation and can improve individual financial outcomes. 
Improving transit for equity deserving groups is restorative work, can be an act of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and it really benefits everyone. Next slide, please. So we've applied equity intentionally in three specific areas, transit fairing, accessibility, as well as service planning. This work is ongoing, so we continue to learn from our community, we learn from you, and we contemplate changes, and are prioritizing equity impacts as well as equity outcomes. Some of the employees who work in transit are also from equity deserving groups, reflecting the communities we serve. Our work with you to incorporate equity into service planning specifically includes introducing our on-demand transit service layer, including communities who didn't meet the thresholds for conventional service and making that service permanent. Ridership demand continues to grow for this service. In January and February, as an example, uh, it grew 23 and 24% respectively compared to those same months last year. Improvements we've made to the network, such as adding more off-peak service in areas with a higher proportion of equity-deserving groups is another example. We continue to see growing ridership demand, particularly in off-peak and on weekends, and we're gonna share more details about this year's plan later in the presentation. And lastly, we're incorporating data from the Social Vulnerability Index based on a recommendation that you as council shared with us to better understand service gaps, and we're developing a proof of concept to incorporate more qualitative information to inform our service plans. Next slide, please. So we're now gonna go through some of the details of how we're implementing the additional service hours uh, this year in 2024 and highlight equity related components. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Carrie. We produce an annual service plan in the first quarter of each year. And this plan outlines our plan changes for the year, summarizes last year's performance and reports on performance measurement trends. We make our service changes five times a year and more detailed outlines for each service change are communicated in advance of these uh, service changes with council and with transit riders through various means. When we make service related decisions, there are five key factors. Can you just hang on just a second? Can you just, if I could do the next slide, sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, there are five key factors that come into play. Uh, we have equity in terms of service, uh, in terms of equity inputs, impacts, as well as outcomes to improve equity our transit service standards, the availability of fleet as well as workers to deliver the service, feedback from transit riders and the budget to support service hour delivery for things like fuel, maintenance and operators time. Next slide please. So more specifically on transit service standard, the transit service standards improve transparency and accountability for service decisions by communicating how specific measures are used when we decide on service changes and how much service is provided when. So I'm going to outline just two examples to illustrate to you the types of data that our planners analyze when we prepare these service changes. So this standard you're seeing here relates to productivity, which is our boardings per hour minimum standard for our routes. The types of routes we offer are outlined on the left and the minimum standard for boardings per hour is outlined on the right. Next slide, please. The next type of standard is about crowding and it's used as an indicator of when we need to consider adding more service on a route. So this standard is our, mass, our maximum passenger load. It measures the average number of people on the bus at that time and in that direction. So on our crosstown routes, for example, um, have been very busy and we've had some crowding issues on those crosstown routes. And crowding can be addressed by adding more frequency or by changing the bus type. So for example, putting a higher capacity articulated bus on that route. Next slide. So I'll now go over some of the highlights from this year's plan and how we've invested the additional 70,000 hours. So throughout this year's, through this year's plan, we are adding more off-peak service and we're growing the service span on some routes to provide more options. Equity deserving groups rely on transit throughout the day and on weekends, not just during peak hours. We are helping families, youth and children who need transit to get to school by improving routes that serve these groups. Uh, we are improving service to address overloads. So an overloaded bus route means that some riders are not able to access the service because the bus is full and cannot pick up additional riders. Service that's overloaded will also run late and not meet our on-time performance targets. And that can disproportionately negatively impact equity deserving groups who rely on transit to get to school, work, childcare and healthcare appointments. We're also increasing service levels to support growing communities. We are introducing a new fixed route in the Edgemont Stillwater area. This frees up resources for, from that on-demand service that we can reallocate to new areas. 
Some neighborhoods or destinations may have a higher proportion of equity deserving groups but have limited or no transit surface service, such as the Rundle Park ACT Center, which provides a significant, significant amount of recreational program for persons with disabilities. So we are planning an on-demand service for Rundle Park ACT Aquatic Center, uh, and this service will help connect users to programming and destinations within the park. Timelines for this are still being confirmed um, as we are waiting for some minor infrastructure improvements required to accommodate two new bus stops, but we are planning to roll that out this year. On-demand transit will also be introduced to Enoch Cree Nation with the proposed bus stops at the River Cree Resort and Casino, the Enoch 108 building, and along Winterburn Road with a connection to Lewis Farms Transit Center. This new service will enhance regional service it supports our city's commitment to reconciliation and aligns with our mem memorandum of understanding between Enoch Cree Nation and the City of Edmonton. One of the outcomes of which is to advance economic, social, and cultural prosperity and development for both parties. Next slide, please. To further improve the rider experience, we are redeploying the articulated 60-foot buses that were used on the Valley Line precursor service, and we're redeploying them to busy corridors like 118th Avenue, White Avenue, and the Route 500X. We're also adding more off-peak service to better serve White Avenue, Nate, and the University of Alberta, and West Edmonton Mall. This helps youth and shift workers, for example. At Meadows Transit Centre, these routes have grown a lot, and we're responding by adding more service on those routes to better serve the diverse ridership in that area. And we're also increasing frequencies on several peak routes throughout the network. This supports students and workers traveling to and from work and school. Next slide. When we rolled out the new bus network in 2021, we added more weekend service, and we're seeing, now seeing these results. Ridership on the weekend grew, and we're adding more options again. We're improving connections to major destinations and transfer points, like West Edmonton Mall, Millwoods, Meadows, and Century Park. The annual service plan also talks about several routes with low ridership, and these are routes that do not meet our productivity thresholds outlined in the transit service standards. Equity is a really important consideration when we review these routes. For routes that serve areas with high social vulnerability, we have limited or no alternative service options. Uh, we will be prioritizing them to retain these routes above routes that serve areas with lower social vulnerability. So that is an example of how equity will be incorporated in our service standards. In the past and across many transit agencies, if a route is not meeting productivity standards, it's immediately considered for a service reduction or to be eliminated. Recognizing transit as an essential service and the impact that has means we're looking deeper to assess community impacts and alternatives. It's a different approach and one that we're proud of our team for taking. So now uh, a bit of detail, speak to, speak to specific changes in, in each quadrant. So in the Northwest on Route 902, where during peak times, uh, service will be improved to accommodate more riders and provide more travel options on our busiest routes. Service will also be improved on Saturday and Sunday. On routes 52, 902, 904, and 916, these routes will have more frequent buses during the peak hours. In the northeast, on routes 107 and 117, these routes are now rerouted to pass through the newly constructed Clairview Station Road, which will shorten the route. On routes 116 and 123, improved service on Saturdays, including extended service hours. And then on routes 119 and 123, we're expanding service on Sundays with extending the operating hours. In the southwest, on Route 926, this is a new bus route. It will provide service from the Lewis Farms to the Stillwater Edgemont area. It will replace on-demand transit service in Uplands, Stillwater, and East Edgemont neighborhoods. And then on Routes 902 and 913, both of these routes will have additional service on Sunday, which expands their service hours. Route 913 will also see additional midday service during the weekday. In the southeast, on Route 73, uh, with the Valley Line now operating every five minutes during the peak uh, weekdays, uh, the temporary Route 73 AB has been cancelled, and the articulated buses on that route will move to Routes 8 and Route 500X to support the increasing number of riders and crowding we've had on those routes. Uh, on Route 500X, we'll also be making an improvement to midday service, and on Routes 509 and 523, both routes will have improved service during the peaks. And then finally, on our frequent and crosstown routes, on Route 4, we'll have additional midday service on weekdays to help with off-peak travel, particularly in busy areas such as White Avenue. Route 55, midday trips will be ex extended to the Meadows with some scheduled changes between West Edmonton Mall and Southgate. 
And on Route 56, we're increasing the frequency of midday trips and all midday trips will now extend from Millwoods to Meadows Transit Center. And so riders will see improved frequency on Saturdays as well. Next slide. So overall, these service improvements improve reliability, create more convenient service, and, and provide more options for people. This can benefit youth, shift workers, frequent transit riders who depend on transit as their primary mode, as well as improve the participation of other equity serving groups by providing more options that we give flexibility, we increase their access across the city, and we reduce wait times. Ridership has been and continues to increase. We are up 27% year over year in 2023. For this year, in January, we saw 5% higher ridership compared to January 2023. In February, we saw 20% higher ridership compared to February 2023. And in March, we saw it increase by 7% compared to March of 2023. Most of our service hours are delivered by conventional bus service across all corners of the city. And when we improve service, we see the results. Through higher ridership, we reduce our community greenhouse gas emissions, we improve social connections, and facilitate greater mobility across the region. Transit is also closely connected to housing and improving affordability for Edmontonians. I'll pass it back to Carrie to close. Thank you, Sarah. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, we want to thank our riders and let them know we appreciate the feedback that they've shared about our service. We can't fix everything all at once, but these additional service hours and the projects we have planned for this year take us another step in the right direction. I also want to thank the employees that I work with, as well as our union partners like ATU, CSU, and IBEW. They're helping us build a transit network to support a growing city. I appreciate every single conversation I have with them and the work that we're doing together. So thank you, and we look forward to answering your questions in the discussion today. Thank you very much. I'll look to my colleagues to sign up for questions to administration. I think it was selected by Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I don't have too much. I actually selected this item um, per a conversation that happened yesterday at Community and Public Services around downtown cleaning and then subsequently the question of do we have that cleaning for transit. So uh, we had talked about maybe needing that to be discussed at Spring Soba as well, but my understanding, and so Carrie, if you could just correct me, is that there is funding for the enhanced transit service cleaning until the end of 2025 that's correct uh, because again I think it like it, it links to this because if we're investing in this these enhancements to the service hours and all of the frequency and we don't have the core base cleanliness taken care of that's what I'm agreed it's a very important lever for ridership we hear that over and over okay sure. so we have it but council will have to make a determination likely in the fall supplemental budget adjustment for 2020 five and onward for if we wanted to keep that enhanced service level of cleaning. So we have funding until d essentially December 31st of 2025. So prior okay. to that at some point, if council wanted to continue that enhanced level, it would require till uh, 2025. Funding. We're funded until December 31st, 2025. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that yeah. was dealt with in the fall supplementary budget process last fall. Okay, perfect. Well, then there's a lot that we dealt with at that fall. <laughs> just, <laughs> so, okay, I'm just gonna, I, so I, I I have other questions on equity and those things, that, but we can talk about those offline. I'm just recognizing our schedule. So with that in mind, I'm also happy just to move receipt of information. Um, we can still keep talking, but I don't have any other motions. I would. Sure, that's great, thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much for um, this report. Um, I I can't, my e-script isn't working. Um, I wanted to, first I just wanna clarify something. In one of the attachments oh, with the, um, I think weekday peak hour graph, is it peak hour or off peak? Uh, we're reporting both of those. There's several uh, charts that are provided. Yeah, I thought for, so 5, 526, um, in my ward, I understood that to be a weekend route. So I was wondering why it's on this one. Can you just say which page you're referring to, Councillor? This is one of the attachments. Um, transit productivity. Oh, sorry, not, yeah. 
on the last page, attachment three, because um, I know, no, I get that the, this is kind of the, uh, just to get a sense of usage, um, but I want to clarify, 526 is a weekend. I yeah. understand, yes, sorry, <clears throat> uh, that helps me understand, thank you. So uh, that lists all of the what we consider community bus routes, routes that are classified um, in that category, and if it doesn't operate in that period, then it will show no boardings. Okay. You can see that on some of the other charts where there's zero boardings, it means that route just doesn't operate in that time period. So in that example, 526, if it's only if it's weekend only, okay. it's going to show that zero boardings in the weekday. Because I think it's a little bit misleading to say it's not productive. Because I've seen actually quite packed on weekends. Is there's quite a bit. Anyways, I'm I'm interested yep. to know if it, it is productive or, right. Yeah, great point. We can follow up with a week with the ridership of that route on the weekends. Yeah, sure. and 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 I think just on this, you know, um, you know if. Pro, like some of these are not necessarily meeting that threshold. Um, if they're consistently not meeting, you know, how long do we keep supporting the area? Do you then make a decision to switch to on demand or other um, alternatives? So that was covered uh, a bit in the presentation. So I'll let Sarah describe next steps on that piece. Thank you. Yeah, there's just a few uh, routes we've identified and we talk about them in the annual service plan that are, are, are very low in their productivity and we want to have some follow-up conversations um, with the uh, counselors for those wards to talk about what some of the impacts would be. Okay. We're considering, for example, converting some of those from fixed route to on-demand, which would then also um, free up the ability to grow on-demand in other areas. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, so that's why I was concerned about the slide. That one, yes. <laughs> um, and I was, um, I was curious because, you know, I think we've had lots of conversations about equity and, you know, we have various categories. I think the one group that, you know, I hear often about but not are not necessarily, I think, always included in some of these is our, our, our seniors and specifically racialized seniors, immigrant seniors who they don't drive, like, they're living in the suburbs, sometimes can be quite trapped or socially isolated because they can't really get to places. They're here to often take care of their grandkids and um, need to find, need to go to places during the day to, to stay active. Um, and I almost exclusively hear from them at this point with their transit needs. Um, so I just wanna know like, are, but that's also not a group that necessarily engage with our typical methods who many of them don't speak English and wondering how are you reaching those demographics? Uh, I'll start and then Sarah can jump in. Um, absolutely inclusive of um, those communities and appreciate um, kind of the interest in transit and, and their needs are just as important as the others. So err on the side of inclusion for sure. Um, in the past we've had some creative outreach where uh, we'll try and find community allies and then work with allies. And we have a person uh, dedicated to travel training support as well who does a lot of outreach with seniors communities. Um, so I think there's more opportunities we can um, pursue to ensure that they're being heard and that we understand uh, the needs that they've identified. But. Yeah, that was great. And to add, I think on the service planning level as well, the, the equity analysis with the network um, does look at seniors as one of those groups in the social vulnerability index. Yes. And I think when we get more granular, more looking at a specific neighborhood or route, that's a great opportunity if we're in your area with many seniors to also look at what are some of the organizations that work with them, um, particularly multicultural or other organizations that they may be yeah, part of. I, yeah, I mean, I. I'm always very interested into working with your team on how to reach some of these communities. I will say I've, I've, we've tried quite, quite, we worked really hard in the last, um, I will say year. Some of these still haven't really come to fruition and I just wanna make sure that they're included in any conversation we have about equity and transit use. So, so just wanna we, flag that. And maybe we can work with your office and talk you. about some tangible next steps. I have a one more question, but I'll come back. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you. I uh, it'll be nice if you can include my office in that too because we hear from those uh, seniors a lot on bus service need but also park benches. <laughs> I'm pretty I sure in the park. I have not forgotten about bus right? shelters. <laughs> bus shelters <laughs> as well as uh, washrooms around uh, 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 walking corridors, multi-use trails and all that. Right. So we hear a lot. I hear a lot uh, on those, uh, those needs. Uh, but I want to... Uh, ask a question related to cleansiness on uh, buses and uh, an LRT. I heard, I might be wrong, 
and I hear from the union uh, that uh, we have group of employees that are considered temporary, but they basically work full time, right? Yes. Uh, so and and uh, is there opportunity to look into that that will give you this no tra transition in the workforce and then give you consistent workforce, right? And uh, stability of the workforce and how that could impact actually the services standards. For sure. So we brought it up before during the budget processes. It just hasn't gotten traction to get funding. Um, so these are ongoing recurring temporary staff that should be converted to permanent, should have happened a long time ago. Uh, the budget is about 640000 to make that change. Uh, we deeply value the work that they're doing. It's on the LRT cleaning side where yeah. that exists. Uh, we've been very transparent in working with ATU to try and navigate it, but ultimately it'll come down to needing to get the funding to make them permanent. Okay, um, so do, so they work 10 months? Like how hard is the structure? Uh, so the structure is they are 11 month temporary and it's been a recurring temporary. It's so, um, so, so 11 month temporary, so we have nothing for one month or less people for one month? Essentially there's a break and then there's uh, okay. hiring activity. So it's this continuous cycle. Uh, the need is long standing. It's been work that's always been done. Even more important now given uh, obviously the issues that we're working through. Okay, got it. Good, got it. Okay, well I'll, I'll follow off. off, off offline on that's the only question I have thank you okay I you know I oh, just one so can you pick, are you, again I want one one confirm what Councilor Rutherford was asking the enhanced cleaning money I know we I remember we gave additional money but I wasn't sure I thought that was only till December 2024 no you covered 2025 as well good okay but well, that's great I think that's <laughs> another thing that we are hearing from the union to uh, uh, to, uh, on that. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I, I will actually pick up from where what the mayor's questions as well. Um, and I think I've heard some different numbers uh, closer to sort of the quarter million mark in terms of the cost of making those positions permanent. No. No. Unfortunately, it's six hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars, and we had submitted it previously in budget cycle, so I could always send you the link. Uh, to that former service package if it's helpful. Yeah, that would be helpful. And then I think we can we can maybe uh, think of a strategy moving forward, um, but that would be helpful follow up. Thank you. Um, shifting back, you know, just want to say congratulations. There is so much in this report to be incredibly proud of. And I think the innovative approach that you're taking uh, to that those equity considerations is very exciting. And again, showing real leadership uh, across the country um, with, with transit. So thank you for that. I you know, particularly want to note, I suppose I should do this in my speaking, but the on-demand to Enoch, incredibly exciting. Um, and the CNIB partnership also really stood out to me. Um, yeah, just, just great work. A few sort of scattershot questions. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about the work around reallocation? I think you, you answered a bit earlier, and I just want to make sure I fully understand. So there are some routes that have been identified for potential reallocation, but there were some underperforming routes that weren't discussed in the report. So are those the ones you're referring to that we'll have some further conversation around? Yeah, so we've booked meetings already. There's three councillors. You're one of them who have a route uh, that hasn't met expectations. So we want to talk about next steps and exploring solutions. And as Sarah referenced, it might be that there's a lower performing conventional bus route today. They could be better served by an on-demand transit solution, a neighborhood ready to kind of transition to conventional from on-demand. We just look at doing a swap of service types, uh, but we want to engage with you and just understand the needs a bit uh, deeper and, and see if that makes sense. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's such an important part of maximizing our, our services. So appreciate that ongoing analysis and the chance for conversation. What, um, can you give me a very high level uh, response? Some, something that occurred to me just in terms of the efficiency and, and also the equity piece. Do we use AI for some of the data scheduling? Like how manual of a process is it at this point in terms of scheduling all the, the DATS routes? So DATS is a different, DATS isn't captured in this report because it's not conventional, conventional. service. Okay. Uh, it's specialized service. Um, we have a lot of technology support that help us with our trip scheduling, okay. as well as the dispatching. I'm happy we could provide you with a briefing or a memo 
uh, talking about how that works, if it's helpful. Sure. Uh, I mean, no, I don't. I don't think at this point that's necessary. We can uh, maybe just touch on it at a higher level. Um, you know, having having highlighted, you know, the many successes that I see in this report, I was actually quite surprised to see the overall satisfaction uh, dip between 2022 and 2023, sort of a nine percent drop. Just wondering if you have insights on what what drove that. Just Again, not to, to point to the one piece of bad news, but just so we can understand what we need to do to, to further strengthen people's experience. Yeah, I think a lot of it, it won't be a surprise to any of you, is safety and security related. Uh, we can provide more details um, because there's great recommendations about opportunities that we can leverage and things we can focus on. Cleanliness is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some good lessons uh, to come. And I just wanna say, Perceptions around transit safety are lagging. So any high profile incidents in the past, it tends to carry forward quite a bit. Um, so it does take time um, uh, to see improvements on those those aspects. Okay, but you your teams do have that nuance in terms of what what the areas of, um, for, of opportunity are for improvement? Yes, we do. And we know the key drivers of satisfaction, I have it in front of me, comfort on board, uh, sense of safety and security, uh, cleanliness, and uh, also looking at uh, reliability, so reaching destinations on time and the ability, so ease, the ability to find your trip information. Okay. Those are all key drivers for satisfaction for this group. Great, that first one, comfort, is that, uh, can you help me understand how that's different from safety or cleanliness? Is it? Yeah, I think comfort is, is a broader measure and so it can sometimes represent different pieces and it does require some digging in. So it can be things like um, a newer vehicle may have more amenities or mm. maybe feel less bumpy, but can also include cleanliness, safety. So it's a bit um, more all encompassing and that's why it's important we also ask about safety and security, cleanliness, right. those other pieces separately. Okay, okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate the response on that. I will go next to Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you uh, very much, and thank you for this service plan and uh, reports. There are lots of good information there, and uh, thank you for the work on that. Uh, I do have a few follow-up questions on the presentation slides, but before going that, I want to say uh, I'm so uh, I had same similar question as my colleague Councillor Tan, and also Mayor. So he mentioned I'm so happy and they are uh, brought this needs and from racialized the seniors um, main communities in our city and specifically and for those uh, racialized seniors they don't speak English and then public transit is their only way for move them around in the city because they do not use they do not use active uh, transportation as well they cannot drive so they lead is definitely there uh, so I had I had many uh, organizations seniors organization from those racialized community actually reach out to me so I'm more than happy to be part of this work and to support uh, the seniors and then also to share uh, the information what I heard and from those seniors. I want to say that first. So the, uh, the question I have uh, is on the slide two and three and then in the presentation talk about uh, the service hours gap. So the first number is to 160,000 bus service hours gap. So I want to confirm my understanding is correct. That gap is compared to the 2015 service levels. So that is a total hours gap, right? That's correct. And then and among that, and 70,000 annual service hours. So that is annual service hours is the gap or is the hours we provide it? Is it 70,000 uh, is the hours we provide it? Yes, 70,000 oh. is the first bucket of service hours that were funded by council. Um, and they went in, most of them went into service in February. Okay, so that means we still have the big gap left there. And then with that total number, 260,000 uh, service hours. Correct, there's still a gap. Yeah. 
Uh, and then to fill that gap, and then back to slide two, and there uh, one item is called the transition from on-demand to conventional, that is uh, 1,600 hours. So I'm a little bit confused for this one because we increase the budget on the on-demanding services, but how this reflects that including services on uh, budget on, on demanding to to get transfer hours from on demand into conventional buses because we have more on demanding buses right now. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. So these um, that those hours are areas that we assessed that have on demand service now that should be transitioned to have a conventional bus service, and so we would need the buses and the hours to give them a regular fixed route. Um, and that would free up some on-demand hours to to use to support newer growing neighborhoods that are are just needing on-demand. Okay, so that is looks like that means, and for some newer development communities, we will transfer the on-demand services to the conven conventional services. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. And then. Um, is there any other uh, approach plan? I try to look at it in the report and how we fill out that 260 hours business, well, that business bus services hour gap. How we do that? And then is there any specific plan there or we just talk about the high level plan here? Yeah, Councillor. So this, um, we first presented this last August uh, to committee the 260,000 hours, and then subsequently, we're very grateful uh, in the fall budget adjustment that the 70,000 hours were funded for this year, and then 50,000 uh, starting in April of 2025. Uh, the remaining gap we have um, will depend on budget and, and uh, capacity. Um, we do have the um, some room remaining at the Kennendale garage where we could add some service. And then after that, it will be the new Southeast Transit garage that will really be a big opportunity for us to, to address the gap. Okay, so may I uh, uh, contact you offline and in terms of the on demand services transition hours? And because I would like to know which newer neighborhood and uh, will be get this type of transition. Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you very much. That's my question. Lead her back to you, Chair Stevenson. Thanks, Councillor Rice. Councillor Jans? Thank you. I wanted to ask, just tying this back to the recent report we had on transit service hours, um, to the report we had on transit priority measures. So I'm worried that for many of our transit service hours, our buses are quite literally stuck in traffic and just wanted to get a preliminary sense if possible. If we have additional hours, where would, where would they go? In addition, like, sorry, by service hour, if we do priority service improvements and we generate, say, an extra hundred hours that buses aren't stuck in traffic. Yeah. Um, so any efficiencies we would gain would get reinvested into uh, the network and the list that we had on slide two of the types of changes we would make. The, the planners have a really detailed list of where they need to put service. So they're working through that list. So they would see how much has been made available and then they would prioritize reinvesting it into the network. Because there's basically two two ways we can either add dollars to add buses or we can just help the buses that are on the road go as quickly and efficiently as possible yeah i'm not sure it's the same order of magnitude i'll just caution like i don't know uh the extent to which those efficiencies would equal the same as what you could get by adding one net new bus but that's some of the analysis we would do and then we would bring it back to council as part of this annual service planning cycle uh, we would have that conversation with you Right. So in, I guess maybe maybe it's a, a two to one or three to one or some other ratio that you would you would find out that, you know, if we um, are able to to do enough, then we could generate what a, a um, say, take a neighborhood that currently has on demand and bring it back to conventional or something like that. Uh, so those neighborhoods are definitely on the list. And again, I think the team would go back to that list of changes they need to make to the network um, in those different categories. And we'd make recommendations about uh, depending how much um, we found in terms of those service hours, how they could improve the network uh, and improve service for Edmontonians, we would bring that back. Yeah, I, I have found it does seem like all the buses around the university are standing room only. Um, I, I've seen huge improvements though with having the articulated number eights. Um, is that is that shared by administration? 
It is for sure. And we know again, like there's a lot of needs that still aren't being met. And uh, you know, we're trying to balance the priorities and make sure we address equity. Um, but ultimately, we need more buses. <laughs> like we're we're definitely um, still underserving, I think, in some areas. And yeah. I might ask Councillor Jens that the articulated bus is also a really small portion of overall fleet, so we do what we can, um, but there's limitations to where we, we we maximize them as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Do we do we um, you know we talked a lot about the growth to the city, how we've grown a hundred thousand new Edmontonians uh, over the past two years. Do we have a sense of um, any major changes or demographic disruptions to transit ridership? Are we seeing a lot more of uh, one particular demographic or another that's coming back to the bus? I think we're going to um, have a better sense of that uh, later in the year. We do monthly research uh, studies, and that helps us gain a bit more of an understanding. We know in general uh, there's a higher proportion of newcomers as well as immigrants as part of that population growth, um, and we're just monitoring closely to see if that's also translated to changes in our ridership demographics. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, this is this is excellent, and um, I just uh, I note the. The ride transit report for tomorrow's council or exec meeting isn't available. Um, are there ride transit implications to this report today about um, the service plan? So the ride transit report is an information report that administration initiated to update you on uh, its usage from a rider perspective and then also our Government of Alberta grant status. Um, we don't have all of the information, so we are requesting a reschedule uh, to later in May. We've also added uh, an update in the SOBA report as well uh, for information. So is it related in the sense of how riders uh, choose their fairing options? It's related, um, but they're two separate reports. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, this is, this is excellent news. Great to see the information. And, um, yeah, thank you. I'll yield my time. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I apologize, I have to step away for a few minutes, so hopefully I'm not repeating things, but um, just wanted to hone in on the service hour uh, gap. And I think I raised this previously, just a constant concern is, is how rapidly we're growing. Um, and considering the mass transit plan is, is targeted out to 1.25 million, um, I guess what, what do we have in the way of a roadmap or like a, yeah, I'll just use the term roadmap for us to close that gap in the face of continual growth. Um, recognizing, you know, space constraints and capacity at our garages is a, a primary barrier right now. Um, but, you know, transit investments happen on pretty large time scales. So how do we, how do we, how do we think ahead here? So that is something Sarah and I were talking about this week and how we update our analysis. We'd like to undertake that work. Um, we think it's important to do a, a more detailed assessment of, I think all of us are a little surprised about just how much we've grown, how quickly. Uh, so what does that mean for this analysis as an example? So this brought us to 2022, um, but we know we need to look forward. And we also have the Permanent Public Transit Fund, uh, and there'll be some related opportunities there um, as we submit our application. So I think it's important work to undertake, and it's something we'd like to do this year for sure. Okay. and. Um I guess just on that last point is, would you need direction on that or is that work underway? I think direction would be helpful just to ensure that we understand the full comprehensive kind of overview of what council's interested in as part of that analysis. Okay. Um, but I look to committee for uh, your feedback on that. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in that body of work um, and think it's really critical for, for future proofing and planning. So uh, we'll leave that with committee. Um, yeah, a question, I think Councillor Rice was getting at it a little bit uh, around sort of that, that balance of uh, conventional versus versus swapping to on-demand. I guess, what does the options analysis look like when a route might not be meeting that threshold for conventional, but there's still an identified need from an equity perspective? Um, Sarah can describe the detailed process. I'll just say we do have meetings booked with those of you, and you are one of them, who has a route. <laughs> so we do want to have that conversation with you, but I'll, I'll let Sarah describe it a bit more. Yeah, I think as we talked about in the presentation, we don't want to leave a community without service, and that's very important to us. And we are very, um, 
it is a good news in the sense that we have all the neighborhoods that have sufficient road network and a kind of sufficient minimum population have some sort of service now. Uh, but looking at those options, we really want to look at um, what are the needs of the community, what are some of the sensitivities of the particular population, and we can look at what's the current, um, who's being served by the service and what an alternative might be with the on-demand being brought in. Okay, yeah. great, that's helpful, and, and look forward to those um, individual conversations as well. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, there's so many good things in here as well. Like ex excellent, uh, excellent read. And I will highlight one in the form of a question, because it is a question. Um, so on demand, being able to serve the ACT Center uh, at, and, uh, and Family Center in Rundle Park, really great news story. Um, they've been needing that for a while. I'm just curious about a timeline on that and when we can communicate that out to residents. Yeah, I think we will um, confirm the precise timeline when we know. Um, on demand, we don't have to necessarily wait for the start of a sign-up. Um, so we just need those bus, two bus stops to be constructed during this construction, summer construction period. And once they're done, we'll, um, we'll roll that out and we'll update your office. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang? Um, yeah, great. Thank you. I just had a, I was really interested in the U of A partnership uh, study on amenities. And I uh, thank you, like, didn't know about that. I'm really glad to hear about that study. And I guess I was wondering, um, with this review, what do you anticipate could be the information that this could generate that will be beneficial? Like, you know, in re there's been questions raised about bus benches, shelters, and we send that a lot to you. How do you think it will facilitate more equitable distribution of those? pieces yeah I think it's going to inform um, the type of amenities we provide at bus stops uh, specific feedback from equity deserving groups and what their needs are we can then take that to inform any future contracts we set up for those amenities so as an example uh, there's a parallel kind of stream of work where I want to look at the actual physical design of a shelter from a climate perspective I don't think we have the right design uh, to help us with climate adaptation so curious if Depending on the feedback, is there any type of momentum we could pursue for that component? But truly, it's understanding what do people want? What do they have for their needs? How can we best meet those needs? Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have more bus shelters than other cities in Canada, and way more than Calgary, which... Like, can you, can you give a sense of... Yeah, we have over 5,000 deployed. Wow. Um, so it's an interesting dilemma. Um, fully appreciate and understand that they're really important for some users. So that's what we're trying to navigate, is how do we make sure we address those needs in an equitable way. How, and how many does Calgary have? Oh. I don't know off the top okay. of my head, but it's quite quite a bit less. Yeah, yeah. it makes me wonder if this is another one of those sandbox situations. Um, we definitely have an enhanced higher level of service for yeah. bus shelters than any other city in Canada as far as, as we know. Great. Um, and then I think you mentioned the permanent transit fund, and this may be an intergov question, but it's still slated for 2026, right? So right now they're saying 2026-27 uh, budget years when that fund will take effect. And then no movement on potential, you know, pushing that up a little bit? So Because I, I know there's a lot of advocacy efforts around that. Exactly. So CUTA is definitely pushing for that. So the Canadian Urban Transit Association. Okay. Um, we are going to bring you a more detailed update in the next InterGov report. Great. Okay. We'll give you a detailed briefing on what we've heard and what we've learned yeah. uh, on that fund. Because I think we, this week we, we heard some announcement around tying that to transit-oriented development. Yeah. And I, I was curious if that would, like how that would impact this conversation and our own future transit trajectories. For sure. Uh, there's three streams of funding just very quickly. So the sure. Metro Region Agreement stream is the biggest where we work with our regional partners. So we're learning more about what they're requiring for the integrated regional plan component of that. And that definitely has very, very specific criteria that we'll go over with you. Um, there is a renewal stream that's smaller that will direct directly allocate some funding. So that could help us, but it's not a huge amount. Um, and then there's a smaller fund for very targeted applications. So that Metro Region Agreement stream is the big one. Uh, and that's the one where we're learning more details about what they expect, including what you just referenced for housing. Okay, that's great. Um, I feel like in in this in this report, I guess it just occurred to me, um, you haven't really talked about 
kind of like the regional movement of the buses. Um, is that kind of out of scope of this service plan or is that gonna be a future, you think it would be a future conversation, you know, with onboarding of ARC and all that? So regional collaboration continues. Um, the regional collaboration framework that everybody agreed to, each respective municipality retains their assets and workforce, uh, et cetera. So we're looking at ways to collaborate and provide um, just options for riders to seamlessly kind of move throughout the region uh, without consolidating all of the resources. So those conversations are very active. We're also actively working together for this permanent public transit fund. Right. Um, and there's right. some great opportunities, I think, that will come from that. I think what peaked for me was like, do any of those conversations, is it affecting any service, you know, replanning um, on some of the routes, especially yeah. if they're kind of on the outskirts? Um, but if that's not part of like this current discussion, we are yeah. happy to hear it offline. We actively talk to them about it. So a lot of the regional service is about the regions connecting into the Edmonton network. And we're looking at the transit centers that are chosen for that connection as an example. Okay. Um, and we've certainly, we can share an update with all of you in terms of what we've been implementing. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I just want to pull on that thread uh, that Councillor Salvador raised in terms of some of that future planning and, um, you know, I think more than anything, setting ourselves up for advocacy with other orders of government and also for our own next four-year budget cycle. Um, so I'm thinking about a potential, maybe just a notice of motion at this point. Just wanted to get a sense of um, capacity of your area. I think, as you say, there's been a lot of growth. We've thrown a lot of um, initiatives your way and funding your way to, to expand our service. So wanted to understand the workload implications on your team for doing some of that further planning and exploratory work. Uh, I'll start and Sarah can jump in. Um, I think if I understand what we're talking about, it's something we could take on and it will support the work that we're doing on the permanent public transit fund submission. Mm. So they're complementary, and I think if it can help our collective advocacy efforts, we're all gonna win from that, and it's something that we would definitely prioritize uh, as pretty important. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you wish to I was I was just going to say that we will need to do this for the Permanent Transit Fund, so it's um, we'll be finding a way to make resources and get the work done. Okay, great, so it's just a way to, to ensure that we're, we're well positioned for that funding coming up and then, and then for our own advocacy. Okay, well, I again, as I say, I'll make that as a notice of motion at the end of the meeting. Um, and I'm not seeing anything further on this item. Did anyone wish to, I'll just give a moment if anyone had further questions, but if not, uh, please sign up if anyone would like to speak to this. Uh, well, I, I will speak very briefly before turning to Councillor Rutherford to close. I just want to say thank you again. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, just how pleased I am to see the on-demand to Enoch uh, Cree Nation. I think that is outstanding from, uh, you know, supporting regional prosperity and also our, our work towards reconciliation um, and, and really upholding um, the agreement that we've made through our, our uh, MOU. Um, the partnership with CNIB, I think, is another excellent example of making transit more accessible for all Edmontonians. And this may seem small, but, but just the flexibility and approach um, that the team took uh, related to qualification for the Ride Transit program and sort of accepting different documentation, so a social, letter, uh, a social worker report or letter, um, those are the types of things that I want to be seeing on council in terms of how we turn our processes to serve Edmontonians, not that our processes need to be served in and of themselves. So really delighted to see those changes, really support and encourage the team that, that is doing that work and, and hope we continue to see more initiatives like that. Thank you again for all the work. It's very exciting and look forward to what's to come. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, not too much to add, just I know that uh, originally when this, this motion for this report came forward, it was really saying, hey, uh, can you show your long work? Because there's so much work that goes into transit planning, and I don't think the general public gets to see that, nor do we as councillors get to see that, right? And all the thought, the different criteria, how you weigh those different things, and it, it definitely gave me more of an appreciation 
for the, the scope and the scale of the work that you're doing five times a year. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Uh, so just thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, again, I think we're leading the way. Like, I think it's really important to highlight where we are leading the way. And I know in terms of that equity approach, you often, from what I understood from being on the Canadian Urban Transit Association, you know, it's really about numbers, numbers, numbers. Are there riders? Then more routes. Are there less riders? Then less routes. And adding that equity lens is so integral to making sure that we are, as Councillor Stevenson said, serving Edmontonians. Because sometimes the lack of ridership is because of other factors or the timings aren't working or whatever it is. And so I'm really excited that we're treading into that space, even if it is imperfectly perfect, uh, it's okay. Uh, that's what a lot of this work is. And so thank you for, for being brave and stepping into that space and to taking those things into consideration. And I know Edmontonians uh, and, and myself appreciate it greatly. So thank you. Thank you very much. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried, thank you. We're now on to item 6.3. I think we'll have time for a presentation from administration and, um, uh, and maybe a few questions before our break. So happy to turn it over to you when you're ready. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Natalie Lazurko. I'm the Acting Branch Manager of Infrastructure Planning and Design. I'm joined here today by um, Matthew Ivany, who's the Acting Director of Transportation Planning and Design, and Craig Walbum, our fearless leader. <laughs> so I only have some opening remarks today to, to share. We're here to share uh, an, information, an information report in response to a motion seeking options to enhance lighting on the existing active transportation network. Lighting contributes to a user's sense of safety, comfort, and security. However, lighting standards differ based on the context of the location. For example, roads and open spaces have different standards. In natural areas, lighting is commonly avoided to minimize impacts on the natural environment. Work is underway to implement Breathe, including an update to the city standards and guidelines for park development, replacing the previous urban parks ma management plan. This work is scheduled for completion in 2025 and will include additional guidance for lighting across open spaces, including parks, utility corridors, and stormwater management facilities. Revised standards for park development, including lighting expectations, will inform future development and renewal work and could inform a future capital budget request. The current approach to lighting includes op opportunistic upgrades and expansion of lighting on roadways and parks throughout city-led renewal and growth programs and profiles. Administration continues to explore opportunities to enhance the lighting on active transportation network um, opp opportunistically through the $100 million active transportation implementation and through asset renewal. Should an accelerated approach be desired, other options could be considered, including preparing a new capital profile dedicated to enhancing lighting as part of the current or future budget cycles. This approach would need to be accompanied by a dedicated service package for additional operations and maintenance costs associated with additional lighting inventory. Reallocating a portion of the $100 million approved, for f approved funding within the capital profile CM20 O330 Active Transportation Implementation Acceleration Approach 3 um, towards new lighting on, on active transportation routes is another option as well. 
thank you for your time and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. I believe this is selected by, oh yeah, Councillor Rutherford, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this report. I found it uh, very interesting and it, it stems from a, an original inquiry or question I asked during the capital budget, the four-year budget, around how much of our current active mode shared use pass was absent of lighting. And as I've continued this conversation, I still feel really passionate about lighting. But another issue that's emerged is around sort of, which isn't really necessarily in this report, but around safe, safe bicycle parking and locker storage. Um, so I wanna focus on both of those things in the context of a potential uh, motion. Um, just with the lighting, one of the things that I really grapple with is with the 100 million we're spending on the bike plan, I know that there's a, a lot of expanse out, but what I've really heard, for, at least from the residents that I represent, is that they don't use a lot of the shared use paths that exist as soon as it's dark. They don't feel safe. Um, so I worry that if we're, we are actively expanding the network and considering those shared use paths within the connector of those, name, those networks, are, are we actually gonna see the mode shift we want? So I guess just your thoughts on that. Because um, it sounds like you, I, I'm here in the report, there's benefit to lighting and we also need to build the safe protected infrastructure. Like it's a both and, it's not an either or. Uh, absolutely, it, it, it is a both and, and situation here. Um, in order to foster the mode shift that we'd like to see as a city, we need to expand our network as well as enhance the existing network that we have today because there are barriers along our existing network that people do face and lighting is one of them as we had mentioned in the report. Um, some demographic groups do have um, challenges with, with um, uh, moving to a, to a, a mode such as, such as cycling um, when there is in a, inadequate lighting. Yeah, and I guess within the analysis of the report, I know it didn't delve deep into where, but like I guess I'm just trying to understand in our bike network expansion and where it intersects with current shared use paths. So like I'm trying to get a sense of, because I'm a visual person, there's no map in this report. We're expanding out our bike network and you're saying, okay, this is the bike network, but this portion of one of those paths is a, a non-lit shared use path that goes, let's say down, uh, I'm thinking about in Roslyn where it's literally down an industrial old trail, rail track with fences on either side of, of the back of people's houses. Like it is not user friendly that way. Are we, well, how many of those are taken into account in this report? Or how have we thought about that in the, in the bike plan implementation? So in, in terms of the, if we're, if we're talking about the $100 million that's been approved for expansion of the network, it's, that type of enhancement is not part of yeah, the, the current plan. Um, there are, uh, as we had noted in this report, there's about 86 kilometers of active transportation infrastructure yeah. in the city that could use um, lighting enhancements. And we're currently tackling that through, through other programs where we can. Um, but currently under the, the under the funding it's not being so with addressed. option with the option for 20 million um, would you have any contemplation of where the, that lighting infrastructure would go uh, of the of the 80 86 kilometers of of uh, of trail or active transportation infrastructure that's uh, in need of, of some form of lighting. I don't have a prioritization of it at this point in time. That work hasn't, yeah. hasn't been done as part of the response to this motion. Mm -hmm. um, not to, to say that that can't be done. So yeah. I, I, can't, I can't answer that today yeah. in terms of where exactly it would be absolutely needed in, to, in terms of connecting sure. to the network. Sure, and I, and I do, um, I guess wanna flip over, uh, and you can call me out of order if you want to, Chair, but I do think that what in the bike plan is contemplated regarding safe bike storage? Because my ultimate goal is mode shift, right? And, and, and so I'm just worried about, like I'm reading this report from 2021 that talks about um, you know, perceptions of safety um, within infra cycling infrastructure preferences, and it speaks specifically about how often storage isn't considered 
uh, and isn't heated, and it's a huge factor. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll wait. I'll come back for you to answer that. I will put receipt for information on the floor so that we are watching our time and nobody's freaking out. Uh, so I will put receipt for information in case folks are signed up uh, for uh, anticipating an alternative motion. Thank you. Sir Rutherford, we'll go next to Councillor Hartmel. I was kind of looking forward to that alternative motion. Um, do we, I'll maybe ask it just in a, in a bit different way. Have we, do we have any data that we can pull from? Uh, survey data, what have you, feedback that tells us what would generate uh, the most mode shift? Uh, is it enhancements like light, lighting and lockers or is it lighting? Do we, have we tested that? that? That's a good question. I don't know if we have that data as part of the, the bike plan or the bike implementation uh, plan kind of behind the scenes. I suspect there may be data. However, um, from my understanding, it's a combination of all of these different factors from uh, in, enhancing the network in a protected fashion um, adding adding things such as lighting that provide that safety and security for folks, enhancing wayfinding um, and signage to go with that, the end of trip facilities including bike bike lockups and bike lockers and so on. All of those combined do help to contribute to the the, the user experience that does contribute to the mode shift that we'd like to see. And of course, continuity of the network as well is a big one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, this this runs the anecdotal light, and I admit that. Uh, what I heard the most when we were talking about improvements in southwest Edmonton was getting over the white mud. And now with Twilliger Drive, we're going to have that link. Like, talk about a missing link that unlocks 100,000 people. It's terrific. But now the conversation has already shifted to, well, that's great, but there's not lockup facility at the few shopping centers we have. So if I'm just riding my bike or if I'm going to work and back, then that's great. But... Uh, I can't come out of the southwest and get to, you know, South Campus Station and leave my bike someplace. There's no place to lock up at our own transit center, uh, to, you know, to shift modes and go uh, go the rest of the way. Or conversely, traverse the neighborhood and get to one of those shopping centers and leave my bike behind. Like if I'm going to have a, a bike like Councillor Jan's, you know, a, a fancy-dancy electric bike, I don't want to make sure that it's going to be there when I get out of the store. So I don't like it, and I, I get, maybe that's not our responsibility. We don't pay for the parking in front of the Safeway, but do we, is there, is there something we can pull from that says we're going to get a lot more mode shift and a lot more users of the network generally if we add some of these enhancements? So I have uh, Christopher Wintle online, who's also going to be able to speak to some of the infrastructure that we're adding with the bike plan. Um, we don't have a lot of that direct information in terms of, of where exactly this type of infrastructure is needed, but we are in the process of planning it for the network expansion that we're doing. So things like bike lockups and things like uh, additional parking and wayfinding and uh, so on are all, and, and including lighting on the expanded yeah. network, those are all components that we're adding with the funding that's been approved by council. So though the existing network may have gaps, may have substandard components to it, we are looking at making sure that the expansion is well-rounded. So is there other budgets uh, or other budget lines or other, other places in our capital plan where we're making those enhancements outside of the, the $100 million bike lane fund? Uh, we are doing some of that improvement under our renewal program. So where we okay. are doing renewal, that type of enhancement is baked right into that process. So we're leveraging those funding sources as well. Um, I believe there was some previous funding also um, approved for some components of this as well that is, is just kind of carrying forward for things such as wayfinding. Okay, so I'm just, I'm really wondering if there's a way to determine a, a, a proportionality of investment into enhancements versus actual links versus lighting versus... Uh, that aligns somehow with, a, with a, a ranked priority of people that will use the system if it had these things. I get the discontinuity. Um, if you just can't get there from here, that's kind of step one for sure. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I don't know if, that, if a motion drives some of that research or if there's something we don't pull from. That's kind of my question. I think all of the program areas are, are important, right? So it's a combination of, of all of these different improvements, such as 
uh, providing the connection to the end of trip and everything that's going to help make uh, the, the difference in our team. I know, and Natalie, you can chime in on this. Our our sort of driving force behind everything has been on completing the network as per the original motion. Um, so we haven't looked in as much detail at, you know, some of these other aspects um, and, and their contributions. I should add, though, that the the uh, as part of the funding, we are looking at end of trip facilities. That is something that's included as part of the build out. So there's a number of initiatives I know that we're specifically working on with some of our partners here at the city, and that includes like trialing some end of trip at city rec centers, uh, looking at improvements to the city's process for for adding bike parking. Uh, uh, bike racks across the city. Uh, there's some BIA work that's ongoing, looking at piloting different types of parking at uh, different types of festivals, city led festivals, and, and, and a number of items like that, which we kind of provided a bit of an overview on uh, kind of later last year when, when we met. Okay, I, I, I would like to check that, but I had been told there was no end of line facilities in this bundle. So. Thank okay, you. I'll, um, I'll follow up on that thread when it comes to me, which, oh, uh, Councillor Tang. And we are, oh. okay, I will just ask a quick question then before our break uh, to follow up from Councillor Cartmel. So just wanna be absolutely clear within the envelope for the active transportation network, there is some provision for end of trip facilities? Absolutely, yes. Great, okay, thank you so much. Uh, we'll leave it there for now and look forward to continuing the conversation.
Welcome back to the April 9th Urban Planning Committee meeting. I'll do a quick roll call of committee members. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Cartmill. Hello. Uh, we are also joined by colleagues online. Uh, we have, apologies, I'm just having trouble connecting. Hmm. Uh, Councillor Principe? Hello. Councillor Knack? Good afternoon. Councillor Wright? Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans? Hello. Thank you. And Councillor Jans, you're, oh, Councillor Tang, you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I, yeah, I had a similar line of question, and I think I, I'm glad we got that confirmation before the break that bike storage, secure bike storage end of line is included in the active transportation plan. Um, we, I've, I've, I think I've had some correspondence with administration on this particular topic because it came from constituents. And... Um, I understand there is, so with transit center, for example, because the report talks about schools, but transit center is a point of uh, potential sites, that there is a pilot going on, and once the pilot ends, ETS will assess how to expand. And when that, let's suppose the expansion happens, are you gonna be able to come, are you gonna come back to council for that check-in, or, or, or for new funding, or that would just be captured in the current allocated funding? Uh, that's a that's a good question. What we can allocate within the current funding, we would allocate within the current funding without trying or without impacting the the expansion plans that we've got. Um, Shweekar is uh, online. I'm not sure if Shweekar can speak to the the pilot itself and and the plans for the next steps with that. I'm hoping she's still online. Well, well anyways, I'm just flagging. You know, I think there's a. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of interest, for example, with Valley Line, Millwood's town center, <laughs> transit centers, secure bike storage. It, if, it would be, if it would be helpful, we can come back with a memo on some of our plans for these end of trip facilities and the, mm -hmm. and the, the bike parking and lockup components to this with further information so we could provide a, a memo back on that. Yeah, I would, I would, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, and just back to the 86 kilometer, um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but did you, I know that, I know we, we, we don't have a map, obviously, but can you just kind of highlight what kinds of neighborhoods these are? Are they mostly mature? I'm going to ask Chris Wintle online to, to respond to that piece. He did a lot of the analysis. Okay. Uh, thanks, Natalie. So really we're seeing upgrades um, across a number of areas of the city, kind of to the northeast and northwest are where the bulk of the upgrades are, just given that that was, is an area where we saw that there's currently less infrastructure in place. Um, and a, there's a mix of kind of those district connector or bicycle arterials included and, and a number of neighborhood routes that the, the work or the funding would fill in as well. Okay, and, and then do you know what percentage is through say park spaces? like share use path or you have a sense? Uh, so, I mean, the, the work is generally on road right of way. Okay. Uh, there's a number of different kinds of facility types that, that are currently being advanced. Um, I would say that the shared pathway is one of the larger types of facilities that we're seeing, maybe, you know, a quarter, a little bit more, and then the other ones are, you know, adaptable on street and, and those kinds of facilities with some shared roadway or a local street bikeway and, 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 and so forth that are planned. Right. And I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if there is, you know, opportunity to enhance some of the amenities on like that quarter, 25% um, within more par like shared use path, park space, that would could potentially be through renewal as your report said. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Oh. Shrikar is online now, um, although I think I got my answer, so I'm good. That's, yeah, no, go ahead. 
Uh, on that note, uh, so so streetcar is online, but the pilot itself is being being led by ETS right. at Century Park. So um, they've noted that the new bike storage facility is a 2023 pilot project and expected to to last about a year. Um, and based on the outcome of the pilot, the city will consider expanding the bike storage facilities at Century Park and other transit centers. Oh, so that so there's a decision you will expand. Okay, um, are you going to expand it to Millwoods Town Center? <laughs> I'm not sure we have that answer at this point, okay. but again, we'll come back with a memo with further information. That would be great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I will go um, next to Councillor Jans. Thank you. I was wondering if administration could share. I like. I completely agree that we need better lighting in a number of places in our city, not just for cyclists, but for pedestrians and folks walking with strollers or wheeling or or taking mobility devices um especially you know when we when we do get quite dark quite early in the winter um some you know a few, there's been a few times uh you need to turn on your headlight you need to get a light for your bike uh i was wondering why though uh, in the option so option one you know a new profile option two take it from the active transportation profile option three you know, continue renewal. Why Why wasn't there an option for take it from another capital profile? Like one of the frustrations I have is that we're spending during the same period, $1.8 billion on road infrastructure, 1.8 billion, that's 1800 millions of dollars. And yet it seems we're constraining in a climate emergency, the area that we really do want to grow according to city plan, according to our mode shift goals. Like I, I don't, disagree with the recommendations of the report. I'm just wondering why we weren't more creative or or at least even given the option to look at another funding source. Uh, Council, I think when we put the report together, we looked at the most likely sources that were related to this topic for enhanced lighting from what we currently have uh, related to active modes. But it is Council's full discretion to ask us to go back and explore deeper or to suggest others as well. We just thought that that made the most sense in relation to what the report was. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering though why like an option of taking, you know, 20 million out of the Yellowhead project or out of Twilliger Drive or out of some other roadway pocket or some other like I'm, or, or a rec center or something else. Like I'm just wondering why um, in, in general when we're doing transportation tra planning, why it's so constrained. I guess the best answer I can give to that is each projects unto themselves try to define the scope within those with the elements of each of those projects. So it would take a rethink of each of those projects and what the compromises would be. So we can explore anything, but you have to look at it from that context as well is my suggested answer to it. Just to add to that as well, some of those other projects that were specified do have other requirements associated with them, including grant funding from other orders of government. And so we, we do uh, leverage those other opportunities to make sure that we're getting farther with the bucks that we're, we're providing as a city. So there isn't a lot of, of funding currently allocated towards transportation projects in the city beyond Yellowhead Trail to Williger Drive. Um, things such as, as uh, arterial renewal program, which we would typically use to augment things such as active transportation is very um, uh, limited in its funds available to date. And we're, we're only doing a couple of projects related to that at this point in time. So it doesn't provide an opportunity to, to leverage the funding that would be needed to do this work. Yeah, I guess I'll express my gratitude to the mover for for the the, the report then. And uh, I'm thinking about where this is useful is thinking about the next four year capital plan where uh, we do need to, like I think this flags. There's a couple deficiencies here, and I, and I'll acknowledge even even with the bike plan, we're only halfway. We're not even completing the bike plan. We're only we're only putting a deposit, so to speak. And um, uh, when you look ahead at the next four year capital plan. This is an area we need to see action. So I'm curious, what would administration recommend in terms of like, is it possible to front load things into the next four year capital plan? Like would, if, if administration is recognizing that some of these pieces are uh, important to our city plan goals, would they bring them forward as, as sort of recommended funded? 
That's a tricky one to answer. I think we need to be guided by council priority and we all know where we're at financially with constraints. So we can bring anything forward for options, but we'd need direction and guidance of priority of council too. If yeah, like one of my colleagues recently highlighted that, you know, they did roadway improvement to a chunk of 53rd Ave. Um, I don't recall voting on that. Apparently it was tucked into an envelope somewhere. I mean, there's probably merits of the project. I don't dispute it, but I'm just wondering administration makes recommendations all the time on things that they believe are important. What does it take for us to build in more of these now um, into future gener in, into future generations of work? So I think it's really unfair to ask us to fix, you know, a hundred years of lighting deficiencies in a, in a, you know, a four year capital plan. The, the type of work that you're you're speaking to, Councillor Jans, is related to some of our renewal programs. So these are things that we do on a re regular basis, leveraging the opportunities that we have in front of us. So the 53rd Avenue uh, project, for example, was a renewal project under the Arterial Renewal Program. And we did have the opportunity to, to change it and enhan enhance it as it was a re reconstruction project. So we are getting to these types of locations and enhancements as we can with the dollars that are available to us. However, those dollars are limited. And so there continues to be a gap. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this isn't an either or, this is a both and. We need to do all of this. It's just how fast and how far we get with the dollars um, that are available to us is, is really the question here. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I guess, yeah, my concern is is more around sort of future proofing um, because you said uh, the majority of this work is on road right of way, correct? Like existing? Uh, are, uh, in terms of the, the this work, are you referring to the active transportation expansion or the, the lighting that's currently um, missing? The, the lighting that's currently missing. Okay, it's a, it's a combination of road right of way and in open spaces as well, utility right of ways and so on. So on so on the road right of way, like isn't there lighting required for the roadway at time of construction? Uh, yes, there is, and perhaps Shrikar can speak to some of the limitations of that lighting on along existing roadways um, as it relates to active transportation. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm also wondering is, is why we can't change it to include the bike net, network too, but I'll, I'll let you continue. Sorry. Yes, Councillor. No, there are requirements. The requirements for the bike lane, depending on the type of infrastructure, though, would be a little bit different. So if we're looking at a, um, let's say, um, a bi-directional bike lane, so on one side, we'd make sure, we need to make sure that the lighting is either strong enough or frequent enough or on the one side of where the infrastructure is. So. The sufficient the lighting that would be sufficient for regular road right of way traffic or vehicle traffic, sorry, might not be the same lighting requirements for a bike lane. So as far as the network network is being expanded or there's reconstruction or renewal that's happening, these are being reviewed and, and added on um, as required or as needed. And is there any requirement for um, like when the developers are, are putting in these um, active transportation routes throughout their developments, is there any requirement for them? currently to provide that lighting? Yeah, it's part of the it's part of the work that they are doing is that it, they do look at that and we provide their input in, in order to ensure that the lighting is sufficient for the, the active transportation lanes or the shared use path or multi-use paths. Okay, but it's a requirement or, or a suggested recommendation? Um, I believe it's a requirement, but I can confirm. Okay, that would be that would be great. So that yeah, we aren't put into the same position and having to, um, you know, fill in the gaps um, come future years. Um, I think that was. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really, really appreciate the opportunity for this touch point. Um, and I, I guess I I want to use my questions just to. Uh, ensure that I have kind of a clear clear understanding that's rooted in the bike plan and the bike plan implementation guide um, as the prioritization of our investments. So when I look at the bike plan, there are two very clear buckets. There is physical infrastructure to develop our network and there's program areas to support that network. Is that correct, first of all? Yes, that's right. Okay, and then within those program areas, that's where we see the list of things like all the things we've been talking about, the end of trip facilities, um, integration with transit, wayfinding, lighting, maintenance, education, et cetera. Um, so I guess I'm, 
Um, I'm a, I'm a little confused because in, in the implementation guide, I do see a very clear ranking in terms of the prioritization of those program areas. Like it, it talks about bike share and micro mobility being a high relative ranking, maintenance high, lighting medium high, encouragement medium, like end of trip facilities medium. How is, how is that informing um, this discussion? Chris, if, um, if possible, can you speak to some of the prioritization exercise um, work that you did at the front end of planning the, the bike plan, the implementation? Thanks, Natalie. So I think our work on this particular program has really been focused on that expansion of the network, uh, with that being the primary kind of direction. And so our work has been focused on prioritizing like the different new connections um, that would be advanced as, as part of this funding and sort of in alignment with the original direction. Some of these program areas uh, specifically are included as well, like we're including lighting as part of the routes. Uh, wayfinding signage is included on all of the new routes, uh, end of trip facilities, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, you know, among other things. Okay. Okay. And I guess that that does make sense then, because I'm I'm reading a little bit further on, and it talks about um, each of those program areas can be further reviewed and highlight opportunities to sort of leverage leverage investments as they do roll out. That, that's right, and it's all being done done together. So as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to make sure that this network is complete as we build it out. So rather than, than the existing situation on the existing network with components that are missing that we're trying to fill in through, through other programs, um, the, the new infrastructure that we're building out is meant to be complete. Right, right. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then just coming back to kind of a, a core question for me, uh, when it comes to driving ridership and, and that mode shift that we we're all talking about, um, all of these things are important, but we still have to prioritize within the priorities. What is the top priority when it comes to driving ridership? In, in, in terms of this funding pocket that we're talking about, the $100 million that's been uh, um, allocated to date, the, the big driver here is network expansion. So we're really building, building the, the infrastructure so that people have something to ride on safely and giving them that, that all ages and abilities experience. Okay, okay. Um, and, but... and pardon me, just one other thing, making sure that it's, it's broad and connected. So we're right. really building that, that arterial network of the, the bike plan at this point in time and we'll start to fill in the gaps as we go. Gotcha, yeah, that's a great way to describe it. Um, okay, that, that's helpful, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I just have, just again, I know you've probably said this, because I, I think one of the things that I did not understand, and I don't think Edmontonians understand, to be fair, uh, is that the end of trip facilities, the wayfinding, the lighting. So I get that there's a gap still in existing infrastructure, but in anything new, what I'm hearing from you today is those are being contemplated. That's right. Yeah, I think that's a message we need to get out to Edmontonians better. Absolutely. Um, okay, no, that actually helps. It's a very, uh, I'm, I'm happy to just start speaking to it with my remaining time if that's. Uh, just your closing, so I'll just see if anyone oh, yes, wants yes, to speak. Oh yes, yes, good call. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah, not seeing any other questions. So uh, anyone wishing to speak is welcome to, to click on. Not seeing anyone, so happy for you to close, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I really wanna thank administration for this report. I know um, you know, some of my council colleagues asked questions about why are these the only options and should we be taking from others? I think we've already debated the budget. We've already allocated to composite profiles or, or profiles uh, overall. And for me, this was just about still recognizing that there is a gap and, and, and ultimately my goal, goal is mold shift. Um, not everybody's going to choose to bike, but there are people that would choose to bike right now that are not biking because they don't want their bike stolen, uh, leaving it outside while they're going to eat at a restaurant. Uh, or like my, I can speak for myself as a woman who lived in Inglewood, I wouldn't take that one path, shared use path through Otayman and, and our area at night um, with bad sight lines by myself, right? So it, I think there is... Uh, real value in making sure 
that in the next iteration of this discussion. So I think we, we, we're hearing 100 million for things beyond just protected bike lanes, but that lighting and that, and we need to do a better job of, of, of articulating that. But in the next iteration of this, I think we do really need to talk about is expansion better or is making sure those gaps are filled so that the network that is concentrated is actually fully functioning. And I think it's a tension that I'm feeling and I hear my Council Salvador say, you know, definitely expansion is key, but I think if there's still connect connectivity pieces within that that are preventing people from making that choice to, to, to choose to bike, um, we, need to, we need to fill that out before we continually expand outward. Um, and as we've talked about with other growth things, it's easier to, to it's, it's way more cost effective to uh, have operating dollars for existing infrastructure versus new infrastructure. So I think as we talk about the next iteration of this, uh, the next council talks about it, it really is prudent to, to pull up this information. Um, yeah, so thank you for this. It's been very informative and I, I really appreciate all the work you're doing um, around it. And, and please do know too that like uh, there is latitude, I, at least I'm gonna speak for myself. Like if there needs to be further conversations of, you know, you do this pilot and you realize that it has been a smashing success and you wanna allocate more and maybe deprioritize one of those lines. That's a low priority one uh, for more of those bike um, lockers or whatever. I would, I would be open to that conversation still. I leave that in your capable hands, but do you know that that's a conversation I'd be open to if that analysis is done and, and that would actually be more ben beneficial within that envelope. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Thank you. That concludes item 6.3. I am um, going to put a motion on the floor uh, to postpone item 7.2 to our next uh, meeting. So I'm going to move that the April 9th, 2024 Integrated Infrastructure Services Report IIS 01927 be postponed to the May 2nd, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting. Um, this is just to, to ensure a more fulsome conversation. And uh, if colleagues have questions, they're, they're welcome to ask. But if not, I will just move to vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried, thank you. So we'll now be on our last item, uh, 7.1, Zoning Bylaw 2024-25 Work Plan. Um, so I'm hearing from my colleagues that we may not need a presentation um, if, if administration is comfortable with that. Sorry, we do want a presentation. We just have a short opening remarks uh, instead of a presentation. Thank you, over to you. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Jitinder Tivana, Acting Director of Planning Coordination Section. Uh, with me today are Trevor Illingworth and Christian Lee, Senior Planners with the Zoning Bylaw Team. Uh, with the adoption of Zoning Bylaw 2001, administration is moving into its next phase of work in supporting the implementation of the new Zoning Bylaw. Uh, responding to previous council motions and collaborating with the administration on other projects. There are 16 projects identified for 24 and 2025. These include addressing council motions from October 23, 2023, two omnibus text amendments to address any grammatical, interpretation, or unintended errors in the zoning bylaw, and in 2025, a review on how zoning bylaw 2001 is working after years worth of development permits and rezoning applications. We'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Councillor Rutherford. 
Yeah, thank you. Just a, a few quick questions. As I was reading the 2024-2025 uh, work plan, I, I guess one thing that struck me, for example, is number three. This talks about the zoning bylaw text amendment for minimum tree requirements. It's coming back June 10th, and I remember that discussion at the time of the passing of the bylaw and that it would be a quick turnaround item because it actually was what the bylaw originally said. And then we had reduced the number of trees and we said, no, put the trees back to what it was before. So I guess I'm just wondering if it's a simple text amendment, why, why that timeline? Uh, I think the timeline that was given by council was Q2 24, so uh, as part of the motion, so we, we do fall within that quarter. I, I know, but I do remember the conversation that, uh, about, or can some of these be done really quickly, as council members had said, because then that was part of the discussion in, in passing the bylaws. And, and I remember this distinctly as a, as a conversation in, in, in light of this one specifically, because otherwise, we had talked about, can we just do the amendment in that meeting? And it was like, no, no, do it as a subsequent. We'll bring it back for like right away early in the new year. And I just, I'm just not understanding. Like we probably spent more time making this plan for this item than adding one tree to the text amendment. Like I just like, I'm just trying to get a sense of that. So through the, the conversation at the public hearing in October, uh, as you know, there was a number of motions made yeah. throughout uh, and there was timelines attached to each one of those motions. Uh, but before the, before the yep. passing of the bylaw, before the subsequence, there was debate about whether this should be a motion to amend the bylaw and the administration advised no, but committed at that time that if it was done as a subsequent, it would come back quickly. So yes, the subsequent might have said Q2, but I think it was with the understanding that these, and like, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking about even, you know, omnibus text amendments for zoning is coming on April 22nd. Like, why is that not included in there? And B, we already had uh, a text amendment to the zoning bylaw around um, the names of certain business areas, like in Mistatum, at the last public hearing. So I guess I'm just wondering why some of these quick wins and things that were council directed are, n are not coming as part of that first omnibus on April 22nd. So the omnibus is really just around uh, errors and corrections uh, to ZB 2001. Uh, we didn't want to introduce uh, any items that would need additional debate to it. Um, so that's and what you've seen to date in terms of updates through the public hearing process. Uh, I think there's been one was really those critical errors that needed to be fixed uh, to ensure the proper uh, administration of it or, or errors that were made so that we could, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the errors were that made uh, so that we could fix them uh, to satisfy some partners uh, in terms of where they're going in, in terms of school boards and school building. So if you look at the timing of it, uh, the first real comeback to council from uh, zoning by law 2001 from October is the April uh, omnibus agenda and the next after that is the trees uh, report. Uh, so it, it is not exactly in terms of what I understand what you're thinking in terms of quick, uh, but in terms of how we've outlaid the implementation and then bringing forth the motions back, it is one of, it is the, one of the first ones back. Yeah, okay. Um, and can you tell me more about this counts administration driven number 16? Yeah, so that the you're, you're speaking of the uh, cannabis retail sales and liquor store separation mm -hmm. distance report. Um, this actually goes back a ways, this item, um, to the previous council even. We um, were asked to report back on, our ca on the cannabis separation distances. And we did through an earlier zoning bylaw renewal report. It was one of the attachments to uh, a report in 2021 that we provided. And we did a little bit of analysis and breakdown uh, and included in that uh, a commitment to revisit this item after zoning bylaw renewal. We understood that it's in, it was still at that time relatively early days in our um, 
in, in the legalization of, of cannabis and and we didn't feel like we had, you know, enough time had passed of living with those separation distances to understand, you know, if we had data that might support uh, a different uh, decision. And so um, this is this is us sort of following through on that commitment. And um, as far as liquor stores go, um, there's enough similarity between these two business types and the ways that they're regulated that if you're dealing with one, uh, it's advisable, I think, that you look at both. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang? Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I appreciate that you really lay out what you're gonna be doing um, for the next year in terms of the monitoring work. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about um, how do you plan to, co to communicate this publicly about the monitoring work? So there is a work plan uh, in terms of identifying the specific things that we are going to monitor. Um, a number of them will include motions that were driven from the October 23rd public hearing when this was originally approved. In terms of communicating, uh, we, we want to give, we're hoping to give the zoning bylaw a chance so we have a full year's worth of data okay. and we would revert back to some of the things. So in terms of communicating, we'll, re we'll report back formally uh, in Q2 of 2025 with a full year's worth of data as well as potential recommendations in terms of right. tweaks and fixes. Like I get that's communicating back to us. I'm talking about the public. You know, this was a highly contentious bylaw discussion, lots of interest from the public. Uh, um, and so I guess, you know, um, I guess I think people will be interested to know how, how it's going. So beyond kind of council deliberation, which can t tend to be pretty like technical sometimes, um, have you thought about kind of that long-term piece? You've done a great job, I think, in a lot of your communication tools, like the podcast, et cetera. Um, have you contemplated this portion? We, we continue to have an external communications uh, plan for the balance of this year as continuing implementation of this, of this new bylaw. Um, we are working with our uh, communications team as well as our, our engagement team on how to continue to communicate not only the changes, but as um, both both the good and unintended consequence uh, news stories and just managing those as we can. So we are working with community leagues as well. Um, we have, again, okay. our first omnibus that is going out. Uh, there are some lessons learned as our team reverts back to maintenance mode versus rehauling our entire bylaw. Mm -hmm. And part of that is exploring how we continue to engage with community leagues um, and the expectations between a brand new, a brand new bylaw versus uh, monitoring and, and amending, amending in the future. So we are, we are in active communication with them. That's, that's great to hear, thank you. Um, I guess uh, Councilor Rutherford already asked the cannabis one. I, I, I was curious about the child care services one. Um, and in Q2 of next year, you included an analysis of, on that. Um, I guess what areas might we see an expansion of the child care services and what would the analysis be based on? I, I think it's still uh, early, Councillor, okay. to, to speak to that. I mean, it is an item that was, um, you know, made as a motion, uh, as a subsequent motion to the new zoning bylaw and um, that will be rolled into our one-year review. So I think what we want to look at is, you know, what are the, you know, some of the main things that we're looking at through really any topic uh, in the zoning bylaw are there variances that are being um, uh, permitted for that, that type of use? Um, are there uh, subdivision and development appeal board decisions that can help to inform, um, as well as you know what what are we seeing in terms of uh, permitting data? Are we seeing an increase due to the changes that we already made, um, or not? Um, so I think those are a few factors that we'd be looking at. Just anecdotally, we can confirm that our approvals team have received applications that previously would not have been hmm. possible to approve from those locations, but they're now being able to be approved. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess on a, on a similar trend, um, I know this is about the plan for the monitoring and tracking, but it's been one quarter. Any, I guess, any early trends that you're noting that you could share? Only anecdotally, we can, Ana we can confirm, so. for example, uh, we are seeing more uh, multi-unit housing in the form of row houses mm -hmm. uh, in internal lots, which previously either was not possible at all or was extremely difficult to get, to get through. Interesting. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
Thank you, Councillor Tang. I think you know my questions were really along a similar, um, a similar line, just in terms of some of that uh, monitoring and reporting and telling that story of the impact it's had. I think including the number of units enabled or brought online without rezonings. I'm I'm wondering if there's a way for us to also quantify the staff time um, and costs that are saved as a result of that. So what's the cost of bringing a rezoning forward from a staff time, council time perspective and, and trying to get some of those metrics um, shared? That's something that we can consider including inside of the monitoring report. Uh, anecdotally as well, again, we've, we've already dodged a number of rezonings that, that don't need to come to council anymore. Some applicants have found out at pre-app that they're no longer required and they're pleased with that. So, wow. Yeah. Well, and I, th and I think capturing sort of the cost savings for, for the city of Edmonton and then also Edmontonians in terms of the, the number of applicants not having to, to pay for rezoning fees as well. I think that those numbers could be very helpful in, in telling that full story. Uh, but otherwise, very, very exciting and uh, busy, busy team as always. Thank you. Oh, sure. I can, I'll move. Um, I will move that we receive this report for information. And I'll go to Councillor Wright next. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering with, um, let me see, number 15, um, not coming out till Q2 2025, could there be some, some urgency? I mean, depending on what new federal dollars might become available, do, do we need to provide any more incentives and to, to line up with, with what, those, what those requirements might be for the federal money? So um, again, Councillor, that the the timing on this one was a result of the motion that was uh, the subsequent motion that was made at the time that the new zoning bylaw was uh, passed. Um, to to your specific question, um, I think I think it's likely that we will see an increase, and Christian just spoke to it of of multi dwelling housing as a result of the changes already made. Um, it's something that uh, you know perhaps we could consider if if it if it seems that you know we're seeing as a you know a, as part of our early results that we're not seeing the needle move. But um, yeah, I'm not certain that this uh, that this uh, report is going to be necessary to fulfill our obligations. Um, oh, okay, so we're already in a pretty good position then to accept any federal funds that might be available. Councillor, just to add around, uh, say, the Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, you have a big discussion coming up around district plans, which will look at allowing additional density in housing uh, throughout the nodes and corridors network. Um, so just a reminder that the zoning bylaw isn't the only tool that's being used to uh, incentivize multi-unit housing uh, throughout the city. Uh, that policy context is important as well. Uh, and we expect uh, through that Housing Accelerator Fund uh, a number of projects that are outlined, including rezoning priority areas, uh, which will will add to the to the zoned land uh, to allow multifamily housing uh, in line with the nose and corridor network. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, and then I just had um, um, the amenity contributions. I, I guess um, November twenty twenty four is probably soon enough. Um, and then I'm working as well, I guess, um, in regards to the digital sign amendments. Um, I, I'd like to see the report a little more, maybe a little bit more robust than what I'm, I'm reading here, but I'll continue working with them on it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford. Thank you. I think one, a few of your answers have just sparked another question for me, just in terms of, you know, this uh, work plan in front of us, I, I'm hearing sort of that these were based on the timelines in the motions. Are there any timelines that you would like committee to amend right now? Like, like I know I'm serious, like I, I, like I, it's a, it's a fair question. Cause like, if it's not ideal, but you're bringing it forward because that's what I understand that you're bringing it forward because that's what council directed. But is there a conversation that needs to be had there? So I think uh, just to provide some more fulsome background in terms of well, in the trees, we'll use an example. Uh, that rep that report back to council is also aligned when the larger tree report on public and private property is coming back to urban planning committee. Uh, so there's a timing 
issue that we wanted to coincide the two reports together. So it's a similar conversation. We wanted to bundle them up, et cetera. Uh, so the team has gone through and, and seen what other work, uh, not only they're doing, but also other areas of administration are doing uh, to make it uh, come together as one conversation. So it's, it's not just uh, what council made the motion on. It, it's, it's how we're aligning the work so and bringing it forward. you've already had that flexibility. So what's before yep. us now? even though like some of the responses did say, well, that was based on the timeline and the motion, uh, you have done that where, where, where required, so you don't feel any other amendments to this work plan are needed from a council direction perspective. Correct, uh, okay. and just, just in terms of um, satisfying maybe some curiosity around when those motion dates were made at council, uh, at public hearing, uh, we did our best or tried our best at the time to try to cross-reference cross some of these reports as well, which is why you, s you see that uh, Q2 or the September uh, date for the tree report because we knew that's when that yeah. report was due. Okay, and then just one final question on the, and I think these are projects that may require future zoning bylaw text amendments but they don't have necessarily, like you have the ones that have specific reports that are coming back and then others, like you talk about the climate resilience planning development framework. I know one that I've got my eye keenly on is the digital sign amendments, those kind of things. So I guess, I know there's sort of possible dates, but I, I just, can you, can you break down for me the items that are in the top that are numbered versus the, the items that are below are, like they're, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I understand the question, Kelsey. Yeah. yeah that it's, it's related to the degree of certainty that we have that there will be um, okay. zoning bylaw amendments. Um, and some of them probably more certain than others. Like for instance, um, you know, you mentioned the climate one. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's a certainty that there will be something coming out of that for the zoning bylaw. Um, we just don't know what that is and we don't know um, we were there for unable to put a specific date to it. Um, okay. So, so we're, we're working in collaboration with the teams that are leading um, all of these different reports uh, that are already, you know, already have uh, committee dates attached to them. Okay. And um, those are the dates for the sort of the main report and then the zoning bylaw portion will follow. Okay, but like for example, the digital sign one was already addressed at an urban planning committee on September 27th, 2022, uh, the subsequent work uh, will provide regulatory guidance, which may enforce, so what does that mean? What does that look like in practice? So in, in practice, what that means is there, the urban design unit over in Kent Snyder's branch is currently developing the policy work that would inform the implementation. And then they which share that would, policy? Correct. Okay. And then okay. it would, would and should inform zoning bylaw work. Okay, okay. So it's, it's, it's resources that will be needed but when and to what extent will remain to be seen. De it's kind of showing the dependencies with other work. Correct. Across the organization. Okay, that helps clarify that for me. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much. We have a motion on the floor. Let's give a moment for any further questions. Okay, uh, Councillor Tang to speak. Yeah, I, just very quickly, you know, I. I know this feels like a very administrative report, um, but it kind of occurred to me recently um, when I uh, had invited uh, Mr. Pollack to present on the zoning bylaw renewal to colleagues as part of a climate caucus with elected officials, local elected officials across um, the country. And I think it just occurred to me that, um, you know, the story about this land use policy reform, which has become so much more relevant and topical in the current um, how, I think housing challenges the nation is facing uh, is, is not just a one point in time story that there is such a prolonged process and very, in my opinion, very rigorous uh, monitoring and there's actually so much work that is still happening and um, I think as we continue to monitor this work uh, and report back, um, I, you know, I also think there's an opportunity here to share this story, not only with Edmontonians to demonstrate like what is happening here, but also with um, other municipalities who are watching Edmonton very closely to try to learn from our, our experience. And I think that that whole story is, is very important. Um, so anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with that, the, the level of 
um, report back we're getting. Uh, there will be no shortage of discussion of land use in the in the coming days and weeks and months. Um, and just want to thank administ administration for all your work. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, I'll just close very briefly. Uh, you know, I want to take this opportunity to again congratulate the team on the monumental work that happened with the passing of the zoning bylaw. Uh, we're we're into the second quarter of it being implemented, um, and it's wonderful to hear some of the early success. You know, this ongoing work is, I think, part of that important evergreening, uh, continuous improvement, but but we've climbed the mountain, and, and I don't want to lose sight of that. It's a huge accomplishment, and, and what we're doing now is just further strengthening and expanding that work. I'm very excited for the monitoring. Again, it may sound administrative or, or unimportant, but I actually think it's such an important part of the storytelling we can do about how these changes matter and how they help us achieve uh, a more sustainable future for everyone. So thank you again all so much for the work and uh, I'll ask my colleagues to vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you. So that was our last uh, report. Um, I don't believe we have responses to councillor inquiries, private reports, or motions pending, but I believe we have a few notices of motion. Councillor Cartmel? Thank you. I have one that I have just put in the chat. Please go ahead. Uh, at the April 23rd, 2024 City Council meeting, I will move the following, that administration provide a report on, one, project management costs, including reports from SAP or other similar accounting software, summarizing person hours and dollars spent on project management tasks, including COE employees and all contracted resources, two, project team and organization charts, three, comprehensive project cost estimates completed at the tender stage, and four, milestone, milestone timeline reports, dates on which PDDM checkpoints were achieved for the following projects, Twilliger Rec Center, Meadows Rec Center, Coronation Rec Center, Lewis Farms Rec Center, Ellerslie Fire Station, Windermere Fire Station, Rabbit Hill Road Twinning, Twilliger Drive to 23rd Ave, uh, about 2010 project, uh, Rabbit Hill Road Twinning, 23rd Avenue to Mullen Road, which was in 2018, 2019, and the Ambleside Service Yard. Thank you very much. I also have a notice of motion um, that at the May 2nd UPC meeting, I'll move that administration provide a report outlining a plan to address transit service needs for a population horizon in 2026, including fleet renewal, fleet growth facility plans, and how funding programs from other orders of government can be accessed to help meet these needs. Um, I'm not seeing any others, so with that, we are adjourned. Thank you to everyone, as always.